Winter's Edge, The Crimson Winter Reverse Harem, Book One. Written by Lindsay R. Laux. Narrated by Lori West. Chapter One I heard him cry this morning when he thought I was still asleep. Sobs, more like, from my immovable, crotchety, emotionally unavailable father. Or Baba, as I called him. He'd cried only once before in my lifetime when my mother died. So now I wondered if anyone else had met that same fate. The memory of his tears pressed down on me, slumping my shoulders as I stood outside the eastern edge of our cabin. The blustery cold wind threatened to knock me over, biting into my cheeks and nose and upsetting the balance of my bow and arrow. It was only the second snowfall, still too early for the wilds to hunker down for the coming winter. Soon they'd be scarce, though, making all the lives of those who lived in Margin's Row that much harder. Just a single line of eight cabins, separate from the town called Margin, Margin's Row was the first line of defense for the wilds who wandered out of the Crimson Forest. A blessing for the townsfolk, a curse for us, especially since six of the eight houses in Margin's Row were empty. Some in Margin's Row had moved away. Some had gone into the Crimson Forest and had never come out. Don't you start this again, Hellbreath, Baba hissed from the front of the cabin. The tension seeping from him gathered in a knot inside my chest. Since this morning, he'd barely said a word to me, which was normal, but he seemed agitated. Now his footsteps were clipped as he tried to saddle Hellbreath. From the sound of her hooves crunching over the snow, she wasn't having it. Like me, she had a stubborn streak. I smiled into the wind, then froze at a snap from the forest. I spun to aim, noting Baba's sudden silence. He'd heard it too, no doubt. But why was he so jumpy? I released a slow breath, feeling the steam rise up my face, and listened to the sounds of the forest, which were both familiar and dangerous. After a moment, Baba began arguing with Hellbreath again. I'd offered to saddle her myself, since I was the only one she listened to. Offered to go with him like I sometimes did. Even offered to go myself so he could sort out whatever was troubling him. No, he'd snapped louder than normal. Useless, so useless and broken. I squeezed my eyes closed and focused on the feel of the taut bow strings, how the ash arrow rubbed against my fingers. The crisp smell of winter filled my lungs and I breathed it in deeply, willing it to freeze into my soul to make me not so useless and broken. I'd been doing that for years, and it hadn't worked yet. A squirrel chittered around the same spot I'd heard the snap. Racing myself against the wind, I let the arrow fly toward the sound and missed. It thwacked into a rotten tree trunk instead. The squirrel had taken off, and now the forest held silent, unnaturally so, like it was bracing against something too. Then another sound barreled toward the other side of the house. A carriage, I realized, rickety and loud and coming from the opposite end of Margin's Row. Shit. Baba tromped toward the edge of the house where I still stood with my bow. I got to the Crawfords. Now. Why? But he didn't answer. He was already racing toward Hellbreath. The tension in his movements and his quick breaths strangled the knot he'd put in my chest. The carriage came faster hurtling toward us from where the edge of the forest wasn't quite as thick. Baba? I called. Footsteps sounded as he rounded the corner of the cabin to where I hunted. He grabbed my hand roughly and shoved a wrapped package into it, the worn cloth fibers damp from his sweat and the fresh snow. Take this and go to the Crawfords, he hissed. Don't come out until they're gone. Now go. Till who's gone? but he was already striding away again. I followed, my legs trembling all the way to the soles of my boots. Baba? 
Hey there, he shouted, sounding chipper and friendly when he was anything but, and turned the corner of the cabin. I stopped just behind the wooden cover of the east wall, my bedroom located on the other side. The sharp wind whistled through the cracks at night and kept me awake, making me imagine that an unholy wild had slinked out of the forest and was lurking outside my house, kind of like now. The noise of the carriage didn't lessen. It didn't slow. Ika, Baba gritted out, less than two feet away from me. Go. Who do you see? A loud pop cracked the air like a whip. Warmth sprayed across my face and onto the snow around my boots in a violent splatter. Then a sickening thud sounded. I jumped back and slammed my hand over my mouth. Bile kicked at the back of my throat, and the cutting wind brought tears to my eyes. I swallowed thickly and tried to draw a breath. What had just happened? Papa, I tried to say, but nothing came out. Baba, my dad. Silence as absolute as the panic taking root inside me. I clamped my teeth down on it, anchoring myself to the side of the cottage and listened. The carriage had stopped. The wilds in the crimson forest were quiet too, as if they were watching what would happen next. Wiping at my face, I took a step backward along the side of the house, my heart pinched and barely beating. A part of me wanted to rush forward, though, to see that Baba was all right. But the air felt too tense. I didn't trust it. Seems you have a delivery, Kane Song, a male voice shouted, the accent strange and foreign to my ears. I jumped at the sound of it. I squeezed my bow and the package tight, backing away along the side of the cabin, away from the voice that hijacked my spine and rattled it to its base. How about you give it to me and I'll deliver it for you, the man said. It's the least I can do. A bubbly groan carried on the wind, gruesome and wrong, like the sound of dying. Baba, he was still alive. Where is it? the man demanded. My boots snapping over the fresh fallen snow were much too loud, even with slow, careful steps. The man would hear me if I ran, and I wasn't certain if there were more men than just him. If there were, they could be circling the cabin right now. I had one arrow in the quiver on my back, the other in the forest somewhere. I turned toward the back of the cabin, and guiding my elbow along the side wall, I unbuttoned my wool coat at the bottom enough to stuff the package down the front of my pants. After I rebuttoned it against the bludgeoning wind, I took my last arrow from the quiver and knocked it in my bow. How exactly was I going to do this? Not run up the Crawford's porch steps to their front door. I'd be spotted. I'd likely be noticed anyway since I was leaving a trail of footprints behind me in the snow. A crash came from inside the cabin. Someone was in there, searching. I turned the rear corner, and the ferocious wind snapped at my face and hands, stinging tears from my eyes and forcing me back the way I'd come. While feeling for the first window, my bedrooms, I pressed on. When I felt a pane of glass like ice on my palm, I ducked low. He, they, wanted the package. That had to be right because it was the only thing of value we had. Without Baba's monthly deliveries, we had nothing, except for what the Crimson Forest gave us. Lately, the forest's offerings had thinned, and with winter coming in about two weeks' time, it wouldn't be enough to survive. Here, winters were long and brutal, and without the meager payment for Baba's delivery, we wouldn't be able to go into town to buy food. We'd starve. So would the Crawfords. It was just Jade and Lee who lived there now because their parents hadn't survived two winters ago. Jade was only 15, and Lee, though older, could barely take care of himself. Baba had sworn to their parents that he would help their children while they lay on their deathbeds, the one good thing I'd ever heard him do. But without our help, Jade and Lee wouldn't make it. Our help.
or mine if Baba. I crushed my teeth together. I would have to make the delivery myself. I knew where to go, who to speak to. I'd gone with Baba a couple times. Useless, so useless and broken. No, I could do it. I had to do it. I nodded as I crept along the back of the cottage. I just needed to get to Hellbreath without anyone seeing me. Another crash, which sounded like the pans of deer jerky I'd made, and then a string of curses. I kept low underneath another window, keeping my footsteps as light as possible. I often heard wilds prowling around at night, but that might have been because I knew they were there in the first place. I didn't think the man who'd shot Baba knew I was here. Yet. But I would have to sprint out into the open, between our cabin and the Crawfords, because if Baba were alive, I couldn't just leave him there. I had to tell Jade that Baba was hurt before I took hell breath. My fingers sought the corner of the cabin, and I stood there for a second to gather up all my courage and hold it to my thrumming heart. It was about twenty steps from the back corner of our cabin to the back corner of theirs. At least it had been when I'd counted as a girl. Jade's bedroom window would be along the back wall. If I knocked, she would answer. God damn it! The man shouted from the front of the house. You! Not me. He couldn't see me, I was sure of it. Now. I had to go now. I ran out into the open, counting each step with no cover to block the wind and blowing snow. It battered against me, throwing me off course and blinding me even more than I already literally was. It smothered my sharp hearing so it felt like I existed in a void. If I lost my way, I wouldn't dare shout because then I'd be giving away my location. If I lost my way, I might not make the delivery in time. The package had to be delivered the first of the month. Always. If I lost my way, I might just freeze to death, since there was nothing around for miles. Even Margin, the nearest town, was twenty miles out. Six. Seven. Eight. I sure hoped I was stepping in the right direction. A cry pierced the wind, a horse's cry. What was that man doing to my girl Hellbreath? Searching her for the package? Fury stormed through my veins, forceful enough to stall my steps and almost spin me around to go rescue her. But if he made her cry out like that, what would he do to me? With a sob that hissed through my teeth, I kept going. Ten. Eleven, twelve, I had to be more than halfway there by now. At step eighteen, my boot hit wood. I brought up my hands to feel the side of their cabin. I'd veered too far to the right, but was I visible to the man? I couldn't hear him or Hellbreath. Shit, if he'd killed her. I shook my head to clear that thought away and palmed my way left to the back of the Crawfords. This far away, I doubted the man could hear me, so I went quickly. At the back of the cabin, I turned, and when I touched glass, I rapped on it, hard. After a few seconds, the window lifted, and I immediately felt familiar comfort touch the air around my best friend, my sometimes enemy, my teacher, my eyes, since she was old enough to talk. I Kai heard a gunshot, Jade gasped. Is that blood on your face? Please. My voice warbled so much I didn't even recognize it. There's a man at my house. He shot Baba. What? She grabbed onto my coat and pulled me closer like she wanted me to climb inside to safety. I just thought it was your Baba hunting. Is he okay? Who was it? I shook out of her grip. I have to deliver the package. Silence for several heartbeats. She knew about the packages and that they helped feed her and her brother. What do you need me to do? She asked, her voice going hard with confidence. A slight thing at fifteen. She was much tougher than I was, and I had four years on her. Get your gun. Pretend you're not home. Don't answer the door. Keep an eye out for when that man leaves, and then go help Baba. If he was still alive. But, but... 
Lee's voice sounded from somewhere inside, agitated from the gunshot, most likely. He didn't deal with loud noises or changes of any kind, so he was going to hate this. Are you sure about this? Jade asked. I knew she was talking about me going into the Crimson Forest by myself, and her question came from both doubt and worry. My blindness often wedged us apart, mostly because she thought I needed her help and I resented her for it. But she didn't know the way through the forest to Old Man's Den. Otherwise, I was sure she would have offered to go. Yes, I'm sure, I said. I go where? I love you. You're so pretty, Lee called from somewhere close inside. Startled, I stepped back and ducked to the side so my bloodied appearance wouldn't scare him. I don't want to upset Lee, I said, but I wasn't sure Jade heard me. The wind had picked up with a symphony of howls that sounded eerily similar to the wolves I sometimes heard in the forest. I waved goodbye, hoping that Jade could still see me. My trust in her to do what I'd said solidified with our years of friendship. Despite how much I resented her sometimes, she'd take care of Baba. At the corner of the Crawfords, I stopped to get my bearings. If I headed in a diagonal, I would be at the front of my house where Hellbreath was, where the man might see me if he hadn't already given up. Would he give up? He'd shot a man in cold blood to get his hands on the package. So what would he do if he found it? I stepped out into the void again the wind even angrier than before, yanking on my coat and pushing me sideways. It sucked the air from my lungs and whipped it around in a cold frenzy, so I couldn't draw it back in again. I gasped for breath, feeling like I was drowning in this endless nothingness. Panic seized my muscles and rang alarms in my head, but I counted my way through it, about thirty steps to the front of our cabin. I could do this. I had to do this. Thirty-one, thirty-two. The wind must have blown me way off course. Suddenly, the beams on the front porch caught my midsection. I reeled back and stumbled backward behind the cover of the cabin, listening over my frantic heartbeat. Nothing from Hellbreath or inside. Had the man left? No. No, he hadn't left. Two horses snorted over the howling wind two horses that were surely tied to his carriage. So where was the man? Shivering deeper into my coat, I plotted out my next move and the steps that would get me there. To Hellbreath, because I didn't want that man anywhere near her since he'd made her cry like that. If he'd hurt her, I ground my teeth together. If this didn't work, I would steal his carriage. Time to go. I skirted around the porch and flung myself past the front door, which stood wide open. The smell of spiced jerky and the heat from the fire stirred with the winter air, soothing on good days, but now filled with a foreign presence that scraped icicles down my back. Hellbreath, I said, just a whisper. She answered with a grumble from the direction of her post, the sweetest sound I'd ever heard. I flew toward her and then rubbed my face against her muzzle while running my hands through her sleek coat to check for wounds, to soothe her, to soothe me. Not long, though, and not long enough to whisper to her how much I loved her for being so brave. She was already saddled, so once I unwound her reins from the post and pulled myself up, we were off, hurling straight into the crimson forest. Chapter 2 Thick branches laden with snow tugged at my hair, scraped ice across my cheeks as we raced farther into the forest. Shivering, I tucked my body as close to Hellbreath's back as I could. Go, girl, I flicked the reins and kicked her sides again. Go as fast as you can. The forest grew wild and was untouched by man since most feared to go anywhere near it. So there were no paths except the one Baba and Hellbreath had made themselves every month for the last two years. 
On days when there was sun, the canopy of trees was too thick to feel it, but I knew what direction we headed because of the crush of wind at our backs. Northeast. I could set a compass to it if I had one. A shotgun cracked behind us. I gasped. Hellbreath tensed but kept going. It hadn't been aimed at us. We were too deep in the forest now, and it had sounded too far away. The man. Who had he fired at? Baba? Surely the man had noticed Hellbreath was gone and could easily follow our tracks. I squeezed Hellbreath's reins tighter and urged her onward with another kick. The few trips I'd gone with Baba on Hellbreath, it had taken him roughly an hour to get to Old Man's Den. But he hadn't ridden Hellbreath as hard as I was now. The closer I drew and the farther I got from Margin's Row, the more my shoulders loosened. I could make the delivery, get paid and find a slightly different route through the forest to get home before that man could pick up our trail again. No problem. A prickling sensation rode up my back and lifted the hairs along my scalp. Hellbreath whinnied. Fresh snow cracked to our left. Scrapes sounded over wet rock to our right under too many feet. Dread plummeted into my gut, heavy as stone, crushing any wisps of hope I might have had. We were being watched, hunted by wilds. I could smell them now, their wet fur and the mud clinging to their paws. More feet closing in sounded through the forest, all of them keeping pace with Hellbreath. This had never happened before during my few trips with Baba, but he'd always brought his gun with him just in case. I still had my bow slung over my shoulder and one arrow. One arrow for all of them. They wouldn't attack something as large as Hellbreath, would they? Keep going, girl. I whispered into my horse's ear. You can outrun the wilds. But even as I said it, I sensed them closing in around us like a noose about our necks. A growl sounded from ahead, terrible and dangerous, and echoed all through the forest, cinching the promise of our fate even tighter. Hellbreath skittered to the side and made a terrified whinny. Then she reared up, something she never did when it was just her and me. The reins flapped free from my hands, and I made a mad grab for them. But I was already falling, falling so long that my stomach turned itself inside out with panic. I landed hard and with a loud crack. The breath surged from my lungs, every last bit of it. But nothing I did would draw more air inside. I croaked, attempted to gasp anything I could do to get a breath, and in the back of my mind, pain registered, a violent storm of it in my side, my arm, and the back of my head. But it was the sound of hooves on snow snaking through the forest without me that brought tears to my eyes. She'd left me, terrified and alone, the both of us. Finally, I drew in a pained hiss, the smell of wet fur and mud and dead leaves so thick that it coated my tongue. Something nudged my foot. Something else sniffed the side of my head loudly. The wolves were closing in. It had to be wolves. I lay there, my cheek pressed to the cold snow, my arm flaring pain even brighter with every heartbeat and tried to unscramble myself. I couldn't die here. My arrow, I had one in the quiver attached to my back. My bow was there too, but I likely didn't have enough time to grab both. A terrible sound I'd never made before heaved from my mouth while I forced myself to sit upright. Sharp pain pierced my side, and I knew something had to be broken. I took the arrow from my quiver with my good arm and struck out with it. A wolf yelped as I buried it deep, but another latched onto my leather boot and yanked, sliding me easily across the snow. I cried out, holding fast to the arrow, my only weapon, and kicked wildly. Another yelp when my foot connected, 
a growl on my other side, ferocious and growing louder. Fangs punctured through my coat and the flesh of my bad arm and shook it viciously. I screamed in pain and jabbed with my arrow again. But before I could strike, two more wolves clamped down on both feet and pulled so ferociously that the arrow ripped from my hand. They were going to tear me in half, shred me limb from limb and leave me here to die in the middle of the crimson forest. The scent of my blood brought more wolves, their feet padding across the snow toward me. I had no idea how many, and it didn't matter. The pain was leaking into my consciousness now, creeping in like shadows and turning my vision even soupier than it already was. I'd failed. And I hadn't just failed me, but Jade and Lee. Baba, too, if he was still alive. Useless. I'd tried so hard to prove I wasn't. Teeth snapped together to my right, yet another wolf. A low, vicious growl crawled up its throat, and I sensed those around me immediately take a step back. This was a new wolf, a different one. Snow crunched underneath it as it lunged forward. The sounds of a brutal fight slipped through my fading consciousness, and I realized as I sank under that I could see my body from above a red patch against stark white in clear definition, my tangled dark hair, the tilt to my eyes, even the curve of my blood-spattered lips, while my life seeped into the snow. I could see, and that was how I knew I was dying. Chapter Three I woke slowly wrapped in warmth and with fur tickling my nose with each inhale. Fur, that was new. My head ached and felt foggy, but I sure didn't remember sprouting fur, ever. I felt funny. I must have been dreaming. Best to keep at it. Somewhere a nearby fire crackled, warm for being outside at winter's edge. Unless I wasn't outside. More and more awareness crept in, bringing with it an onslaught of stiff muscles and achy bones. How was I not dead? I blinked open my eyes and gasped. I was staring at myself lying in a bed and covered with a long fur blanket, neither of which I recognized. I almost didn't recognize myself even though I'd seen myself countless times before I'd gone blind. Same long black hair, same face that looked as frightened as I felt. But how was I seeing myself when I was mostly blind? Wait, that had happened in the Crimson Forest, too. I'd peered down at myself from above like the angel of death. Now I was looking at myself from across the room, on the other side of the crackling fire, a shudder ran down to my toes. Was I dead? Because this was not what I expected it to be like. Slowly, carefully, I moved my legs across the bed to test that theory out and see if I could find out where I was. And then why I could see myself. The last thing I remembered was that the wolves were homing in on the pulse at my neck to snuff it out. I should have been dead. Sitting up bolted pain across my ribs, and I stopped and hissed, seeing sweat bead across my forehead from across the room. Two ribs were surely broken, maybe more, and someone had taken great care to wrap up my torso loosely. My arm nestled into my side, held there by a sling. If I were dead, then death had some pretty amazing health care. My head swam, pretty sure I'd been given a painkiller because I felt loopy, like my brain and body weren't quite connected. Surely that was why I still saw myself from across the room. When I was pretty sure I wouldn't pass out, I slipped my legs out from under the fur blanket. I was naked from head to toe, 
able to see the scratches and wolf-shaped bites all over my skin, the bandages covering the gashes that bloomed red in the middle. I saw all of it. It was as though I had a pair of working eyes, but they were unattached, sitting like marbles on the other side of the fire. I shivered. That was a disturbing thought. Way to go terrifying myself with my own head while my current situation hardly put me at ease. Still, I wouldn't find out anything if I stayed put. My feet found purchase on a cold, hard floor, but my legs buckled as soon as I tried to stand. I crumpled to the floor in a heap, feeling every cut and bruise and break scream as I slammed against the floor. It's not, a deep, rough voice called. Something thudded, dragged, stepped on the other side of a door. Then a large figure barreled into the room, the top of his head nearly skimming the wooden beamed ceiling. He carried a long walking stick in his hand. I yelped and scrambled for the blanket to cover myself with it. His eyes, a steely gray, connected with mine, even though he wasn't looking at me, softened just a fraction, and then he turned his head toward me. But my eyes, the tricky, uncooperative ones on the other side of the fire, aimed at me again so I couldn't study him further. They did point out, though, that I was anything but covered. I quickly adjusted the blanket. You're up, he growled. Your definition of up must be different than mine, I muttered from my position on the floor. My voice sounded different, rusty and unused. He grunted, then shouted, Archer, making me yelp once again. I hated loud noises, especially when I didn't see them coming. That was obviously the drugs sparking a little blind humor. That and the disorientation of seeing myself from across the room. Coming, coming, a different deep voice said, and then my other eyes swiveled toward a man in the doorway, his long black hair like liquid night. Just a glimpse, and then my eyes were trained on me again. Oh, well, you made it to the floor at least. That's progress. How? I started to ask how I could see myself, but that would be admitting that I was blind, at least usually. They didn't need to know my weaknesses, or my strengths. I'd asked Jade once, and she'd said my eyes looked normal. She wouldn't lie, so maybe I could pull this off. How did I get here? Grady found you outside the woods. The second man, Archer, said. You were in pretty bad shape, so he brought you here. Grady and Archer. I filed the names away. Can you- Archer started. Do you need help back? No, I don't need help. My voice came out sharp like it always did when someone automatically assumed I was useless. You- Fixed me? Well, fixed is relative. Grady here can make a mean sling, and I can stick fresh bandages on my fingers so they look like long claws. So there's that. You're not fixed, Grady said, his tone clipped. I sure didn't feel it, or look it if my other eyes were anything to go by. If I was hallucinating, I definitely wasn't fixed. What's your name? Grady demanded. Ika Song, I said. How long have I been here? Three days, Archer said. I sagged against the side of the bed, defeated. Three days. I was late with the delivery to old man's den. If it was late, there would be no payment. Those were the rules. No payment meant we'd starve. Since there were still several supplies we didn't yet have for winter. You can leave when you're up to it. But in the meantime, Archer gestured toward my other eyes, crossing over to stand in their periphery. He turned to look at them, 
his long midnight hair falling over dark, mischievous eyes. I think you have a fan. Okay. A fan? I must have hit my head harder than I thought when Hellbreath bucked me off, because nothing was making sense anymore. Have you seen a horse around? Black and goes by the name of Hellbreath? You, you named your horse Hellbreath? Archer moved closer to my other eyes, close enough so I could see the defined cut of his shoulders and neck under a not quite fully buttoned red flannel shirt. My baba did, I said, though I'd insisted he didn't. As always, he hadn't listened. It's what she answers to. Baba, Archer said. Dad, my cheeks burned. I often forgot not everyone had far eastern roots like Jade, Lee, and me. That was a custom my ama, my mom, had drilled into me the roughest. I saw some horse tracks earlier, Grady said, his hard, loud voice so near I almost yelped again. I'll put out some hay, see if she comes to eat. Thank you. Even if I felt up to leaving here, I wouldn't get far without hell breath. Archer scooped my other eyes up into his palm. I reeled back, so wishing I had a clue what was going on. But seeing him up close in detail took my breath away, for a number of reasons. First, how was this possible that I could see him so clearly with eyes that weren't my own? Second, he was beautiful. Smooth, tawny skin, strong jaw. He made kissy faces at my eyes. Equally a bizarre string of words as it was watching it happen. His full lips seemed just inches away from me, even though he was all the way across the room. Who's my big girl? He cooed. Do you want to go see your new lady friend? An answering chirp sounded as my other eyes connected with me again. What was that? Archer brought the thing closer the chirping thing that held my other eyes. What? I desperately wanted to finish that sentence, but again, I didn't want to let on that I was blind. Still, whether these men had bandaged me back together or not, I didn't trust them. Or this thing I could see through. Um, is it? Don't worry, she won't bite, Archer said. Not hard, anyway. Oh, I was worried, all right. He strode past Grady from behind my other eyes and pushed them toward me like he expected me to take them. It, the chirping thing I could see through. My palms grew slick and my tight nerves sucked toward my backbone, away from whatever was coming. But I was so damn curious about why I could see that I reached my arm out tentatively. My fingers stroked fur, soft and familiar, and terrible. I jerked my hand back. Wolf! I hissed and scrambled back onto the bed and against the wall with the blanket, my bones and ripped flesh screaming in pain. She's just a pup, Archer said. I hate wolves, I spat. I'd been attacked by wolves, nearly killed but why was it I could see through a wolf pup's eyes? Archer must have turned the pup so he could hold it close, away from me, and he and Grady shared a look that turned their faces to stone. And yet you entered the crimson forest, which happens to be full of them by yourself, Grady bit out, his brutal tone chasing a shiver across my bare shoulders. What did you expect would happen? Shut it, Grady. Archer said. No one expects to get attacked. I tucked the blanket up under my chin. No, I didn't expect it. I've made the trip to Old Man's Den several times with my Baba and had no trouble, but Hellbreath must have gotten spooked. Several times doing what? Grady demanded. Do you work for Faust? What the fuck, Grady? Archer said. 
making a delivery. A cold awareness slithered into my senses and dropped into the pit of my stomach. Did I come here with a wrapped package? Archer brought his hand up as if to scratch behind my ears. The pup's ears, I meant. Yeah, I think you did, actually. Something fell out of your pants when Grady brought you here. Think it's still by the front door. Go get it, Grady growled. Fuck off, you go get it, Archer told him. Grady limped out of the room with his walking stick, but not before he iced me with a suspicious stare. No eyes required, I could feel it penetrate to the back of my skull. If anything, though, it was me who should feel suspicious of them. Why were they keeping a wolf pup like a pet, whose eyes I could see through? And why were they acting so strangely? Grady, specifically. Archer sighed. Sorry about him. He's just... Grady. That explained nothing. Who's Faust? He took a breath like he was about to answer, but in came Grady with his thud drag step strides. Something slapped hard next to me on the bed, tinged with the smell of blood and sweat, and the overwhelming smell of moonshine. The package was leaking. I roamed my hand over the furry blanket, feeling the wet splashes, and unwrapped the bottle from the soaked cloth. The cork had come loose. But after a little shake, it didn't sound like that much was gone. Silence had fallen, more than a few heartbeats length, thick with an unnerving sense that something was very, very wrong. Uneven footsteps echoed backward away from me, followed by a sharp growl too deep to belong to the pup. Why the fuck were you delivering Wolfsbane? Grady demanded. You do work for Faust don't you? Wolfsbane? No, this is moonshine mixed with aconitum, I insisted. Aconitum is Wolfsbane, Archer muttered. Okay, I said, drawing the word out. My baba makes monthly deliveries of it to a man named Gabriel, not Faust. This month he was held up, so I volunteered to take it. Gabriel is Faust's second in command, Grady ground out, his voice rough and sharp and heavy with accusation. Wolfsbane is the reason we're- Okay, just hold on. Archer turned and raised his hand at Grady, then set my eyes back down on the other side of the room. They flicked back and forth between the men and me, and the pup whimpered. Why does your pup- Baba, make these deliveries. I shrugged because the reason seemed so obvious. For money, so we don't starve. Once I'm able, I'm going to Gabriel to deliver it. The hell you are. Grady started for the bed, but Archer held him back. I am, I fired back. Too many people are depending on me to put food on the table. What's the big deal anyway? Who cares what I deliver to Gabriel? How does that affect you? Archer glanced toward my other eyes. We have a long history with Gabriel and Faust. Fucking really, Archer? Grady hissed. You're going to tell her everything? She doesn't know anything, dipshit. She's still healing. She's not going anywhere. I hated that Archer was right. My little crash landing with the floor had awakened the pain and sharpened its teeth. I wasn't going anywhere, but as soon as I could, I would, and then try to explain why I was late with the delivery. On the few occasions I'd gone with Baba, Gabriel had seemed like an understanding guy. And if Grady tried to stop me from going, I'd put an arrow through his eye. If not his eye, then his balls. I'd call it a calculated miss. I'll leave as soon as I'm able. Sooner if I could manage it. You think we're going to actually let you leave with that shit? Grady asked. You're damn right you will. I snapped and shoved the bottle behind my back. Cut it out, Grady, Archer said. Enough threats. If she doesn't deliver it, someone else will next month like her pa. 
more like the man who'd shot Baba. He'd wanted the package, enough to try and kill for it. But why? It was just moonshine mixed with dried aconitum or wolfsbane. And a few more of Amaz, my mom's herbs. None of these things were rare. Grady stepped closer, his presence looming over me like a threat. We'll have to burn that blanket outside so Sasha doesn't step on it. Burn it? That was going a little overboard. No, all it needs is a good wash. Aconitum is only poisonous if you eat it. Yeah, well, I'm not taking any chances, Grady growled. Agreed. Archer crossed toward my other eyes again and picked up the wolf pup his expression tight with concern, that mischievous glint in his dark eyes gone. I'll take Sasha to another room. I guess I'll get another blanket for the ungrateful Wolfsbane dealer. Grady limped after Archer out of the room. I shook my head. I was hardly a dealer, and I didn't like the implication that I wasn't grateful. I owed them my life, but I wasn't about to fawn all over them every other second to stroke their fragile, manly egos. Was that what they wanted? Because they'd saved the wrong girl. Through the wolf pup's eyes, I spied a hallway and a bedroom opposite mine. Then, like a switch turning off, my vision faded back to what I was used to. Like I was staring down a long tunnel, filled with murky soup and strange shapes bobbing underneath. My other eyes had to have been a hallucination. That was the only explanation. I was glad it was gone because it had been too distracting. When Grady came back, he crossed to the opposite wall, slid something, and then a blast of arctic air flushed into the room. Shivering, I wrapped the blanket tighter around me. His stick clomped along the floor toward me like a third leg, and then he stopped and lifted the blanket. No peeking, I warned him. He grunted. You have nothing I haven't seen before. He tossed another blanket at me, which of course smacked me in the face. Shit, I'm sorry. Yeah, he really sounded like it too, with the hint of a laugh underneath his gruff voice asshole. I scrambled to unfold the new blanket, but before I did, the cold air assaulted my bare skin. Goosebumps pebbled my entire body as well as the prickling awareness of a stare. He was watching me for just a moment before I frantically covered myself up again. I shivered into the warmth of the blanket while I tried to shrivel him in size with the force of my glare. Enjoy the show? He laughed an odd, unexpected sound that made me jump again, especially for someone who usually sounded like they were about to rip out someone's throat. He crossed to the window again, his limp much more pronounced. No clomp of the stick. Was he using it to carry the blanket? He wasn't a wolf, though. Why couldn't he touch the wolfsbane? After a moment, he shut the window, then left the room without a word. I relaxed into the bed only slightly. Remembering the large wolf I may or may not have seen before I passed out in the crimson forest. It had scared the other wolves away, like it had wanted to help me. But why, when I could have been food? Archer had said that Grady had found me in the forest but neither had offered up any more information. Grady didn't strike me as the kind who saved people, but bless his seemingly dead, rotted-out heart anyway for doing so. There was more to that story, and to why he'd refused to touch Wolfsbane. There was also more to my brain, since half of it must have spilled out in the forest. Where the hell had that hallucination come from? about seeing through Sasha's eyes, and through the big wolf in the forest. Both had seemed so vivid, so real. Something that extraordinary didn't just happen, not in the real world and certainly not to me. I slid my hand underneath my pillow to the package, taking strength from the promise it offered. 
I would deliver it and explain to Gabriel why it was late. I had to, just as soon as I was upright. Aconitum was wolf's bane. The bane of wolves. Even if it killed wolves so I could feed my family, that would mean fewer of them in the future, trying to split me apart like a wishbone. Chapter 4 I don't suppose one of you would mind checking in on my family? The note of hope in my voice matched the worry that they'd say no. I'd been here five days, and even though I was sleeping and resting instead of falling out of bed, I was healing much too slowly. The wind howled outside and pressed between the cabin's cracks. Fresh snow battered the window panes harder with every second closer to winter. Jade and Lee likely had enough food to survive for a few weeks, but without Baba's payment to help support them, they would starve. Jade wasn't as good a shot as I was, and Baba, well, I didn't even know if he was alive. Why does your family need checking on? Archer asked from my bedside. Grady was here too. He'd limped in after I'd called for Archer, as I'd thought Archer might be the one to ask because he seemed like he had a heart. Grady, well, I could feel his anger clinging to him like a second skin. Could feel his stare burning through the back of my skull. My Baba was shot, I said, purposely leaving out any mention of the package. I live in Margins Row, the easternmost cabin, and we also look out for the kids next door to us. Make sure they have food and stuff since their parents died. Why can't they take care of themselves? Grady demanded. They're young, younger than I am. Lee has a disability and Jade has to take care of him. I bit my lip, then added, And my baba. She'll be taking care of him, too. Margins row, Archer said and then paced away. On the edge of the crimson forest, a chill edged his voice. An understandable one, since I never wanted to travel into those woods again, either. There's another way, Grady said. I stared hard in the direction of his voice. Was he actually considering going? Yes, but it's many miles out of the- I'll put food on the porch, but I speak to no one. He stomped out, the thud of his walking stick so loud it seemed like he took issue with the floor. I blinked after him, my chin dangling to my lap. What just happened? He's- Going out anyway. I didn't expect him to go. Honestly, me neither. Then why had Grady volunteered? Surely he wasn't planning on walking there through the snow, not with his limp. That would take ages. Maybe he'll find your horse, too, while he's out. Do you have horses? I asked. Silence. Or maybe he was nodding or shaking his head. I decided to redirect, since I couldn't see gestures. A barn? Yeah, well stocked, too. Relieved, I sagged back against my pillow propped against the wall with a sigh. This healing is taking too damn long. Any estimates of when I'll be up and walking? Too early to tell. His footsteps came closer, and then his weight dipped the corner of my bed. You definitely don't want to push yourself, though, since that could make it worse. My eyes burned in frustration. I had too many things to worry about to stay in one place for long. But since I was forced to, I felt trapped inside my bruised and broken body. That's not the answer you were looking for, is it? Not so much. Well, I know something that will make you heal much faster. Two things, actually. What? Number one, my cooking. With Grady gone again, you'll have to suffer through my cooking, I'm afraid. Gone again? Where had he gone before? But more importantly, he cooks? They'd spoiled me with how good the food was here.
rich, savory stew that smelled so good that it roused me from sleep, cooked wild bird with crispy skin, flaky bread smothered in fresh butter. I'd been sleeping so much that I never heard who brought it in, but it was still hot by the time I woke, set on a raised tray by my feet. I'd followed my nose straight to it and dove in face first. He does. Sadly, I'm no Grady in the kitchen, but I'll try to make it so we don't starve. And number two, how good are you at numbers? It took a moment for my brain and stomach to detach themselves from the idea of food, but even then I had no idea what he was talking about. Numbers? The things you count and can add up and stuff? There are games to be had with them. Oh, good. Number games. Despite how unimpressed I was with the very idea, it turned out he was right. Again, please. I begged after he'd demonstrated three times already. Okay, pick a number between one and twenty, but don't tell me. Imagine it in your head. Got it? Got it. He had me add, subtract, multiply, and divide, tell him if the number I was thinking had curves or edges, and he would guess it every time, like magic. Can you teach me? I asked after he'd guessed my number for the sixth time. Sorry, no, a gentleman never reveals his secrets. I could sense his smile, how I bet it matched the warmth in his voice and was just as infectious as the sound of his laugh. Other than Jade and Lee, I'd never known anyone who'd bothered to spend time with me, especially when they didn't have to. You're good with your numbers. Do you go to school? No, I said, flushing slightly with his praise. School's too far away to travel in the winter, so my neighbor taught me while she taught her brother. Jade had taught me everything her mother had taught her. Numbers were easy since I didn't have to see them. I just had to understand them, and Jade was patient enough to make sure of that. At around the same time she started to teach me, I'd had two older siblings living with Baba and me a sister and brother who'd long since moved away, and none of them felt the need to teach me themselves, or have anything to do with me. I don't know how to teach someone like you, my sister Gia used to say. Someone like me. Useless. She'd been too busy touching her hair or polishing her shoes in preparation to go into margin and find a future husband. My brother snarled at me every time I got in his way, which in a two-room cabin was pretty much impossible to avoid. What about you? I asked Archer. Nah, my people don't go to school. We teach each other everything we need to know. Your people? Who are your people? His flannel shirt rustled like he was shrugging, those large shoulders of his flexing. Another non-answer. Want to see a magic trick? Biting back a sigh, I shook my head. Magic tricks would require me acting surprised at certain moments, and I doubted I could pull that off believably. Do you have any more number tricks? How about something even better? A book? Books were always better, and yet another thing I couldn't see. I loved listening to Jade read from them, though. I'll even read it to you so you can rest, he said as if reading my mind. And so we carried on like that for three days. Just Archer and me, and I liked it. If I wasn't still healing and growing sicker with worry for my family, I probably would have enjoyed it more. He read from an adventure book that took place on the sea, his voice carrying the tension of the heart-stopping events perfectly. He told me that Grady had brought my bow inside, and so while he spent time with me playing number games, he whittled me more arrows, the scent of fresh pine mixing with his caramel and wood smoke smell quite nicely. He seemed genuinely interested in me, 
and his warmth and laughter seeped under my skin and blossomed up into a constant smile that made my cheeks hurt. He couldn't cook for shit, though. After a stew he'd served with meat that had tasted seconds past raw, he crossed toward me. This will help wash that trash down, I bet. Sorry about that. It's fine. I didn't feel anything kick in my mouth, so that's promising. Things are looking up then. He chuckled and stopped at the edge of my bed, with what sounded like a teacup rattling crazily against its saucer as he handed it to me. Every night since I'd been there, he'd brought me a cup of opiate tea to help me sleep, but had lessened the dose each night. I'd noticed when I'd woken up in the middle of the night gritting my teeth with the pain, but better that than develop an addiction. I already had my hands up, waiting, but instead of taking the teacup he pressed to my finger as I brushed them along his hand, he was trembling. Archer, are you? Yeah, I... He sucked in a breath. Sometimes I can control that, and other times... He folded his hand away from my seeking one and handed me the teacup. I looked up at him, wishing he'd explain, but he didn't. It didn't feel like something I should press on about, either. The tea's steam curled up to heat my cheeks so I set it aside on the tray at my feet. Do you think Grady will be coming back soon? I wanted to ask him about what he saw near my house, see if everything was okay. Archer cleared his throat, and soon the rickety chair he'd placed next to my bed creaked with his weight. He's gone for long lengths of time, usually, so I don't really know when he'll be back. So you're just here alone? No, I have Sasha. Right, of course, I said. Why do you have a wolf pup? Did something happen to its mom? He was quiet for so long, I wondered if I'd actually asked him a question. She was... She was orphaned. Her and her siblings. And you saved them? The chair scooted back across the rough floor as he stood suddenly and took several steps away. No. So much emotion in that one word, so much loss and heartache, that it made my chest pinch. What was it about him and Grady finding things that needed to be saved, like me and the other wolf pups? Why did they care so much? I understood their fierce love of animals. Hellbreath was my girl, and I would be destroyed if anything happened to her. But to adopt a wild like they had and feel so much sorrow for its siblings? Maybe I was too much of a hunter to understand. But everyone near the Crimson Forest was a hunter. You had to be if you wanted to survive winter. I need to go check on Sasha. He rumbled and then left the room, closing the door behind him. I nodded, even though he was already gone. He or Grady had named Sasha, I guessed. So was she like a pet to them? What would happen when she was grown? They couldn't keep her, a wild like she was. Archer didn't come back for the rest of the evening, and I carved it into my memory not to ask him questions about Sasha ever again. Even though I burned with curiosity, I didn't want to hurt him. I dozed, but a sound outside my window filtered through my consciousness. A light scrape like a tree branch. No trees grew near this room, though, at least that I'd heard before now. The fire crackled, a low, comforting sound that beckoned me back to sleep. And for a long while, that was all I heard. Then it came again, farther along the wall. Trees, at least in my experience, didn't move around like that so the wind could rattle their branches against cabin walls when they hadn't before. I did drink all of my opium tea, though, so who the hell really knew? It came again, persistent, with purpose. Someone was out there. Not a wild, unless they'd developed a working knowledge of rhythm when no one was looking. Was it Grady? Had he come back? 
If that were him, then why the strange noises? Unless he was hurt. Slowly and with great care, I shoved myself into a sitting position. My ribs protested and sang with pain, and my bites bit back, but I hissed my way through it. If it wasn't Grady, then I obviously wasn't going to fling open the front door. If it wasn't Grady, whoever it was may have peered into the bedroom window and saw me lying here asleep. An easy target. I didn't even have a weapon. Not with me, anyway. Archer's arrows he'd carved for me were all the way across the room. I needed to tell him. Listening hard, I opened my mouth and called. Archer? Not loud, but loud enough. Except from the way my voice bounced between four walls, I remembered that he'd shut the door on his way out. Shit. Was it worth getting out of bed for? Even now, as I sat here, feeling slightly loopy from the opium tea and the pain in my body that balanced it out, I wondered if I'd dreamed it. I didn't hear anything now, just the fire. But if Grady was out there and hurt, he could freeze to death. I didn't have to like him to not want that to happen. Sending up a silent prayer that I wouldn't crumble once my feet touched the floor again. I slid my legs out from underneath the blanket. My bare feet slapped the ground lightly and I stood, keeping one hand locked on the mattress for support. There. Maybe. My legs wobbled some, but so far, so good. I slipped my hand free and stood on my own two feet. The first time in eight days. Hell yes. I gave the V for victory sign with my fingers as I held my arms out in front of me and crossed to the door. Jade had taught Lee and me to do that when we did something right. I'd take any victory I could. Even though my arms still hurt, I took off the sling so I could at least equip myself with an arrow. Archer had told me he'd set my newly whittled arrows and bow in the corner of my room. After fumbling around to find one, I opened the door and stepped out, making sure I missed the creaking floorboards right outside. Across the hall, I remembered seeing. No. No. I didn't remember seeing it. I'd imagined seeing a door across the hall. Sure enough, it was there, closed from the feel of it. I swallowed hard shoving away how I'd known it was there. Archer, I said softly. Silence. I'd never explored the cabin before, had no idea how large it was or where Archer might sleep. Should I knock? A sound came from up the hallway and outside, familiar, one that triggered my heart to beat faster. A horse's wicker. Hope squeezed my chest, but I tried to tell myself to cut that shit out. A horse's wicker did not mean hell breath. It could be any horse, or more than one driving a whole carriage with a driver who had no problem shooting someone. Still, I turned toward it, keeping my arms in front of me, my arrow gripped tight in one hand, and the outer edge of my other palm facing out, to slash through the unknown like a spider web. It felt like the hallway went on forever, but finally my hands brushed leather, soft cloth and smooth plastic. A whole wall of it. Book spines, I realized. Dozens and dozens of them. I couldn't help but grin at the feel of them, and my stomach did crazy flips at the idea of Jade or Archer reading them to me at the promise of adventure and drama and facts and feeling in each one. Nearby, just outside, an impatient whinny sounded, followed by the unmistakable nicker that was all hell breath. My breath funneled out of me as my eyes filled with tears. My girl, I whispered. I could hardly believe she'd come back to me. I felt my way to the left along the precious book wall to where my hands slipped to what felt like a heavy wooden door. 
After struggling with the lock, I opened it to a blast of wintry air. Hell breath, I said, and she puffed warm steam across my cheek. A sob choked its way out as I threw my arms around her neck and pressed my tears to her mane, and then froze. We weren't alone. I could feel it in the severe prickling up my scalp, the dig of someone's eyes watching, waiting. Did Hellbreath have a rider? I didn't think so, not from the way she kept nudging me with her nose to tell me to get on her so we could get out of here. I pulled away from her slightly. Is someone there? My voice came out wispier than normal, cut through with the knife of cold air and nerves. No one answered. I wouldn't know if Hellbreath had a rider unless I crept my hands toward her saddle. But I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that. I wasn't sure I wanted to know who was looking at me so closely and why. With a deep breath that stabbed through my ribs, I gently pushed my horse out of the doorway and limped outside. My bare feet met snow. The bitter cold wind seeped through my long flannel in an instant and chattered my teeth together. I'd made much smarter decisions than coming out here like this. But even if I didn't want to know, I had to know. I stuck close to Hellbreath and searched for the horn on her saddle, or a stray leg to a rider who refused to say a word. No leg, though, just something tied to the horn, something that hadn't been there when I'd ridden Hellbreath through the crimson forest. She whinnied then, and a sound followed immediately after, like snow cracking just a few feet away. A footstep? I whipped my head toward it, my breath snagging in my lungs. Grady, is that you? Hellbreath pawed at the ground, likely sensing my nervousness. After several seconds of silence, I ran my hand over the fabric tied to the horn and worked the knot loose. It felt damp, probably from the snow, and the ends of it fluttered against my palm. The smell hit me when I freed it the night air stirring just enough to send a coppery whiff toward me. Blood. A lot of it. My hands shook as I tried to figure out what the piece of cloth was, and then my thumb hit one corner of it, and the monogram stitched there by my mother. K.S. My Baba's initials. I was holding his bloody handkerchief. A bloody warning. A slight breeze sighed through the treetops, and I swore I heard a faint, whistling chuckle. Chapter 5 I shut the door and locked it on Hellbreath, and the surge of guilt crashed into my terror so hard it nearly buckled my knees. I had to leave her out there. I couldn't go outside myself. Not with someone lurking about and delivering bloody warnings when I didn't even know where the barn was. Gritting my teeth against my tears, I turned back in the direction of my room, with my Baba's bloody handkerchief and my arrow. By the time I made it down the hallway, my body was sagging, my broken ribs and bruised, punctured flesh screaming. I needed to lie down but I needed to find Archer more. When I made it to Sasha's door, I leaned against it and tried the doorknob, locked. Archer? I knocked softly. Ika? That was Archer's voice, soft yet tense, coming from the far end of the hallway behind me. I sucked in a relieved breath and then loosed it in a garbled mess of words. Hellbreath. My horse is outside and I think someone brought her here. They're still outside and they brought me a warning. My Baba's bloody handkerchief. I held it out for him to see. I think it's the same guy who shot my Baba and... I started to sag farther, the weight of everything too much for my healing body. Archer was there in an instant, 
his arms wrapping around me and holding me close. I sank into his strength, shivered into his warmth, breathed in his scent that reminded me of wood smoke and caramel. I'll go out and take care of your horse, he said, his breath caressing the top of my head. But first, we need to get you back to bed, okay? I nodded my cheek sliding against his soft flannel shirt. His body felt like fire against mine, almost too hot, and I reluctantly slipped away. Do you have a weapon you can take with you? Yes. He trailed his hand down my back as he opened my bedroom door and guided me through it, his other hand at my elbow. Don't worry about me. That guy out there. He desperately wants my moonshine when he could literally go anywhere to get it. I don't know why he wants mine, but I'm sure he recognized Hellbreath and followed her here or led her here to see if I was here. I dropped my arrow and the handkerchief on the floor and then lay down on the bed, exhausted. I'm so sorry, Archer. I'm so sorry for getting you involved in this whatever. It's not your fault. He tucked the blanket up to my chin and I found his hand and squeezed. Promise me you'll be careful when you go out there? A long pause and I could feel him searching my face, staring intently, and for some reason it made my cheeks flush. I promise. He slid his hand from mine, but I held to his fingertips for as long as I could, for his warmth, for his safety. I hated feeling like a bruised coward. Give me a wild from the crimson forest at far range. Keyword, far, and I could handle that well enough. But a strange man who had no problem shooting my baba and then hunting me? Hell no. After a minute, the front door closed on Archer's footsteps, and then quiet blanketed the cabin. I listened until my ears burned for the slightest sound, for Archer to come back, for the front door to open and it not be Archer. I doubted this man outside, whoever he was, would stop until he had my moonshine. He could sneak past Archer unnoticed while he dealt with Hellbreath. Oh, for fuck's sake, why had my brain gone in that direction? Sure, flash me the worst hypothetical so I could focus on it. Archer could handle himself, could be aware of more than one thing at a time. Besides, when I'd been clinging to him, he sure hadn't felt breakable. I still burned where he'd touched me, still felt a little breathless at the way my body had fit with his. The front door opened and closed. My pulse hammered and my palms grew slick. I tugged the blanket up to my nose, but not enough to cover it, so I could breathe in any change of smells. Nothing yet, just snow and cold. Footsteps down the hallway. I snaked one arm out of the blanket and reached for my arrow on the floor. The footsteps creaked on the loose board and stopped in the bedroom doorway. I closed my eyes to home in on every detail I could sense prepared to spring up and punch and scream if I had to. A sigh, laced with weariness, and peeling layers of wood smoke and caramel off the body it came from, filled the room. Just Archer. I snapped my eyes open. Did you see anything? Is Hellbreath okay? She's fine. Awfully happy about the apple that hadn't gone rotten yet that I found for her. He crossed into the room and took a seat on the creaky chair next to my bed. I saw footprints that looked like they'd trailed after your horse before she made it here, but not the owner of those prints. I firmed my lips and nodded. He wouldn't last too long without a fire tonight. I bet he's gone. I wished I could breathe easier at that, but unease still chased through my veins. But now he knows I'm here, Archer hummed in agreement. If it's the package he's after, there has to be more to it than just moonshine and wolfsbane and my Amaz, mom's herbs, I said. Maybe, 
The chair creaked as Archer scooted closer. Maybe it's not the ingredients themselves that make your package so interesting to him, but what the combination of those ingredients can do. Do you know what it can do, Ika? Not really, I admitted with a sigh. My baba isn't. Damn it, I'd almost said wasn't. Past tense. The most talkative person with me. He mostly just wants me out of the way. Yet you're the one who tried to make the delivery to keep feeding your family when he couldn't. That hardly seems fair. Well, I didn't have much choice. My baba got shot and Jade is only 15 and has to take care of her brother, Lee, who needs a lot of help. Her brother, not yours? I shook my head. Their parents died two years ago, so we take care of them. We meaning your baba and you? Yeah. Why would your baba bother to take care of them if he's the type of person who wants his real daughter out of the way and names his horse Hellbreath? I pushed my lips together, really not wanting to go down the road that led to talking about my baba. What does this have to do with Moonshine and the guy outside? I'm just trying to figure out your baba since he very likely has all the answers. Well, he very likely might be dead. Admitting it churned my stomach, but I might have to face the truth eventually. So might as well start preparing. But you're right, though. The morning he got shot, he was crying, like he knew something was going to happen. Like what? Archer asked softly. It would have to be something big to make him cry. Something like knowing someone was after the valuable package, the money for which would help feed him and his family through the winter? Yeah, something like that, but it's not valuable. It's, it sounds like it's a lot more valuable than you think. Maybe that's the reason your baba wants you out of the way. Pretty sure it was because I was blind. Useless. I'd had that told to me on many occasions. The words screamed and sharpened so they'd drill farther into my skull. You don't look like you believe me, Archer said. You don't know my baba. So tell me about him. I turned my head away from him. Not a fan of going deeper into that conversational topic at all. Does he beat you? It wasn't a question. His voice growing too hard to make it one. Not once. All he does is work in the cellar beneath our house all day. Every day. That was it. The end. Time to redirect. Do you know what the package is? He went quiet for so long that I thought he hadn't heard me. Then, finally, the word twisting with pain. Poison. Poison. I'd always called it the delivery or the package to put distance between it and myself. Deep down, though, I knew from my own limited experience with it. It wasn't just moonshine and wolfsbane and some of Amma's herbs because the combination was powerful. I knew this, and I hated that I did. But I didn't know how he knew, and why he seemed so affected by it. I waited, feeling like I should reach out and touch him, gently coax more out of him. Maybe this was why he drifted away sometimes, lost in memories so vivid that they literally shook him. It had to be, and since I was already involved with the attempted delivery of it, I had a feeling this would be difficult for me to hear, but not as difficult for him to say. We sat in silence for the longest time while he struggled, for words, for trust, for courage. I wished I could just hand those things over. I could feel his gaze roaming over my face searching for any reason not to tell me. Archer, you don't have to- It killed almost my entire family. I expected something devastating, 
but nothing like that. I assumed the package had something to do with livestock, which didn't really make any sense, but that was all I could come up with on my own. It had killed his entire family. My Baba, with Amma's help, had killed his family. The truth whipped across my face sharp enough to bring tears. Would my delivery have done something similar? Killed another family, maybe? Indirectly, he continued. It slowed us down, made us weak. Why? I croaked through the guilt, strangling my tongue. We used to live in the Crimson Forest. I blinked. Aren't we in the Crimson Forest? We're right on the edge in the Slip Joint Forest. But wilds live in the forest, not people. Well, we did. Another group came and decided they wanted us out. Of the Crimson Forest, anyway. They wanted you out when you had been there first? Why? He scraped his shoe across the wooden floorboards. The ruby caves. Rubies? I didn't know there were ruby caves. Not many do, but somehow they found out. Who is they? But as soon as I asked it, I knew. Gabriel. And Faust, he corrected. The ones we sold the moonshine to. Archer kept silent, either giving a nod or nothing at all, but not disagreeing. Do you know where the ruby caves are? I asked. I don't. So they resorted to murder for greed. They wanted the rubies all to themselves. They're far beyond greed. He gave a bitter laugh, a sound so unlike his usual good nature that it splintered down my spine. They're sadistic monsters. One of us did know where the mines were, but now he's gone, missing, but not dead. Or at least Archer wasn't saying he was. Tortured then? I was afraid to ask. And Grady? This had to explain some of his issues too. The surly attitude and maybe even the limp. My mouth soured and an impossible knot tied itself into my gut. If they're already in the forest, then why do they need more moonshine? I asked. Unless there are more people living in the Crimson Forest? No, it's to keep anyone else who might be looking for the ruby caves out. And the guy who wants to steal my moonshine? I winced, feeling like I'd just been punched in the chest. Maybe he wants to be Faust's supplier. He's moving in on my Baba's territory in much the same way those people moved in on yours, in the Crimson Forest. Archer ground his heel into the floor, rolling what sounded like dirt or sand into the wood. That about sums up my thinking as well. I swear I had no idea, I blurted. If I had, I would have confronted my Baba. And he would have laughed bitterly in my face. I know, he said, but you're still going to deliver that package, aren't you? I sank my eyes closed and deflated. That was our only source of money. My Baba, whether he was alive or not, had one skill, and making the moonshine was it. And I, well, I could hunt when there were wilds and I could learn neither of which would help to keep us alive all winter. I didn't know what else to do. It was either my family's lives or another's who happened to stumble into the forest. And if I had to choose, he must have read my answer all over my face because he rose and crossed to the door swiftly, like he couldn't wait to get away from me. That's what I thought. The door shut with too much force and shook out the tears from my eyes. I didn't blame him for being angry with me. But what he didn't know was that I had been poisoned too, by the very thing he didn't want me to deliver, the thing hidden underneath my pillow. 
only instead of a group of murderous Ruby fanatics, it was my own mother. Chapter Six Aika? I stirred at the sound of Archer's voice, sensing that he sat on the edge of my bed from the heat radiating off of his body. Please don't be mad at me. It was all I'd thought about between fitful bursts of sleep, how much he'd lost, due in no small part to me, and the weight was enough to make me feel like I couldn't breathe. He had every right to hate me, for both what my Baba had sold and what I still planned to do with it. But that thought alone made it all so much worse. He was good and kind and didn't deserve to be hurt like this. I'm not mad at you, he sighed as he flipped a lock of my hair over my shoulder, his fingertips lingering on my flannel-covered arm to draw lazy circles. I became aware of each of them, the strength and heat behind the touch, and suddenly I wondered what it would feel like on my bare skin. My body warmed at the thought, and an unexpected tingle ran down my thighs. It's a lot to take in, but I don't blame you, he said. You didn't kill my family. I'm sorry. I really am, for all of it. If there was another way short of robbery to get money, I would do that instead of helping these ruby fanatics murder, just to keep the forest for themselves. Feeling like that wasn't enough of an apology, like it would never be enough. I reached for his hand on my arm and pulled it to my lips. His hand dwarfed mine, his skin rough and hard, and I wrapped his fingers in mine before I pressed a kiss to his knuckles. I appreciate everything you've done for me, Archer. He loosed a breath, a ragged hot burst that fanned my cheek. He was sitting so close that his nearness galloped my heartbeat faster. It's nothing. Not to me it isn't. I threaded my fingers between his. He felt so good that I wanted to keep him here and touch him. I didn't know where this was coming from, if it was him or me or this moment. But he made me feel almost greedy with need when I'd never felt like that before. My skin burned. My chest pushed against his forearm with every shallow, uneven breath. Ika, he slid his hand free from mine to cup my cheek. His thumb trailed just below my bottom lip and pressed down to part my lips. I lay there speechless, stunned, because no one had ever touched me like this or said my name like it was worth saying again and again. He followed the curve of my lower lip and then crept his thumb upward so the tip entered my mouth. Curious, hardly daring to move, I flicked out my tongue to taste him, and the sweet, slightly salty taste of him shocked over my tongue. He made a sound low in his throat that trembled the air between us, I sucked in a breath, all of these sensations brand new, and instantly craved more of them. He grazed his thumb down my chin, over my jaw, and down the column of my neck, like all he wanted to do was touch me too. I craned my neck to give him better access as he brushed over my collarbone and down beneath the blanket, pulling it aside. I'd skipped the first few buttons on the flannel shirt I wore and his finger hooked on the first fastened one. The heat of his touch spread outward. Ika, he tensed then, seeming to catch himself. I came in here to ask you a question. Okay. Nodding, I tried not to pant as I pressed my hands to his, still hooked in my shirt, to keep him there. Ask away. He heaved a short sigh and flexed his hand out from mine to slide his fingers under my shirt. He pressed his palm flat to my slamming heartbeat. 
It didn't matter that I couldn't see him or hardly knew him. We both seemed to know enough. Fuck, Ika, he said, his voice hoarse. That's not a question, I breathed. No, it... A single wolf howl broke him off, a little one coming from across the hallway. Sasha, the energy around Archer, tensed. What is it? I asked. He stood quickly, sliding his hand from underneath my shirt and taking his magic touch with him. Stay here. I gestured to the state of my prone body, but something in his tone made it sound like he wasn't joking. He left the room and silence fell hard, thin and tight like a tripwire. No more sounds from Sasha. And then an explosion of snarls almost right outside my window that sounded a lot like the wolves from my nightmare in the forest. Archer's heat dashed from my body and terror replaced it, wrapping ice around my stomach. What was happening out there? I listened hard for any sound from Archer, but I couldn't hear anything over the fight outside. He had to be getting a gun or another weapon. He should have just taken the bow and arrows still leaning in the corner. I made to stand painfully slow. I was a good shot when I had enough time to aim. I could help drive the wolves off while standing inside the window, even through the tiniest crack. Once I was on my feet, I crossed to my bow, but bending over to retrieve it felt like hot pokers drilling into my side. More ferocious snarls, and then a sharp cry like one of the wolves had been hurt, but I hadn't heard a gunshot. Had Archer heard it? With his bare hands? My healing ribs protested as I dragged myself across the room, past the crackling fire knocking an arrow as I went with more in the quiver slung over my shoulder. The cold outside pressed against the pane of glass, and it chilled my bare toes the closer I drew. I found the latch and groaned, squeezing my eyes shut with the effort, as I pushed the window open, my weakened muscles trembling. The smell of wet fur breezed past my nose, and then I could see again. From the middle of a wolf fight, four different wolves snarling and snapping their jaws and circling each other. And I was one of them. No, I was two of them staring out of their eyes, first one and then the other. How was this happening? This didn't feel like a hallucination with the wind biting at my nose. All three of my noses the one attached to my face and the two surrounded by fur and saliva and blood. I, we, who the fuck knew, stared down the other two. The fur along their backs bristled high and they bared their sharp fangs in lethal grins. My breaths shook as I raised my bow. I tried to steady myself, find my balance, which was hard when my world hurled between one set of eyes to the other while I stood right here. This wasn't possible. But for now, I had to trust it, because I didn't have any other choice. I had to be peering out of these two specific pairs of eyes for a reason, not the other wolves. Right? Or was I just insane? The wolves lunged at each other's throats, a ball of violent fur and spraying blood, round and round in a vicious whirl, and I screwed my eyes shut to block it out. It was too confusing to watch, and even more to be a part of. Still, I felt their hatred and viciousness as if it were mine, because I was caught dead center. I didn't want to be. The one time in the crimson forest was enough. I let my arrow fly. A high-pitched squeal rent the air when it punctured, and the other sounds of battle stopped. With a slow breath, I pried open my eyes again. Just a crack. One wolf had my arrow through its eye and pawed at it desperately. The other backed off a short distance. 
The two wolves I saw through swiveled their heads toward me, catching each other in their periphery. Both of their eyes were blood red, and now they, and me, were looking at me framed in the window inside the cabin. A scream welled up into my throat. I fought with my own injuries and quivering muscles to get the window back down. They couldn't get to me, not with the window in place. There was easier prey in the forest. The window shifted an inch down and halted, shifted and halted, and I watched its slow progress, as if I were really a wolf myself. Then, through their eyes, a shadow moved behind me, slinking out the bedroom door. I whirled, putting the wolves at my back behind the not-quite-closed window, which was a mistake. But someone had been in here with me. Someone bald. Not Archer, not Grady. Now all I saw was the back of my own head. A ferocious growl came behind me outside, followed closely by a squeal and a snap. I spun and through one of the wolf's eyes I stared at a dying wolf its broken neck listing its head to one side. The other wolf I'd caught with my arrow lay in the periphery, dead. My stomach nearly revolted and I backed away, not wanting to see death that up close and personal, not while it happened, not wanting to see any of this, period. A gunshot cracked through the air outside. Was that Archer? What had taken him so long? Or was it the bald man who'd been in here with me? Trembling, I inhaled deeply, trying to catch his scent even though he'd gone. Tangy and rich, like too sweet honey. Ika! Grady crashed through the front door, his walking stick thudding hard on the wooden floor. I made a desperate sound at the back of my throat and stumbled out into the hallway using the end of my bow to guide me when I turned the corner. The wolf's vision vanished from my eyes with my next blink, and I'd never been so happy to be blind again as right then. Who was that man? Grady shouted. I shook my head, not trusting myself to speak as a surge of bile splashed onto my tongue. The man had been in the room with me, and I'd been too focused on the wolves outside my window to even notice. Sasha! Grady passed by me, his unbalanced footsteps echoing loudly down the hallway. That gunshot? I croaked out. It was him getting away, but he didn't shoot me. I was too fast. Grady with his limp was too fast for a bullet? Struggling to make sense of yet one more thing, I followed after him and sucked in a breath just as sharp as my realization. The package. I dove back into my room and toward the bed on the other side. No, no, no. The front door crashed open again and a muttered breath drifted down the hallway, pained and hollow sounding. Sasha's fine if not pissed off, Grady announced from the hall. Shit. Archer! I threw the pillow aside, felt my hands over the top of the thin mattress. Underneath it, under the bed, my body groaning, my mind spinning out of control with panic. Ika, get in here, Grady shouted. Archer is bleeding out. The package was gone. Chapter 7 Put pressure on it while I get the med kit, Grady demanded and rushed out of the living room, his walking stick banging loudly against the floor. I stood over Archer's prone form, the smell of his blood thickening the air, and bent to feel for the wound. My fingertips touched his bare chest, the heat on his skin shocking. What happened? I traced along his skin, searching. His breaths were shallow and quick, and he answered me with a pained, bitten. He took my hand and guided it to the half circle on his side that seeped blood without a word. But I could feel him studying me hard. He knew. 
He had to know I was blind if I couldn't even find a bite wound that felt ugly and vicious underneath my hands. I pressed hard on it, but not too hard, trying to calm my panicked thoughts so I could focus on just one. It was... His side heaved while he tried to get his breathing under control. It was during that wolf fight. The heavy note in his voice. The slight hesitation. He was telling me something important. In the back of my mind, maybe it had already been forming. But I refused to believe it. Because it couldn't be. Still, the pieces snapped together. Faster and faster until a wild from the crimson forest stared back. He and Grady were taking care of a wolf pup. Were strangely protective of her. And I could see through wolves' eyes. Their eyes. As wolves. I shook my head hard. Things like this didn't happen. They weren't supposed to happen. Archer was a man, not a wolf. Ika, he breathed. Why didn't you tell us you were blind? I frowned down at my hands, still pressed to Archer's heated skin. He'd obviously sensed my blindness was an easier topic to talk about, though not by much. It's not something you just announce upon meeting people, I admitted. Why not? He shifted on the couch and groaned. You didn't tell me all your secrets when you first met me either. He blew out a slow breath. That's fair. Grady burst in then from the hallway, limping as swiftly as he could. Soon the smell of antiseptic stung my nose. Had to restock the bandages because someone got carried away and wanted to wrap Ika up like a mummy. Worth it, Archer hissed. She saved our asses today with her arrow. A heavy silence hung in the room while Grady pressed in closer with the antiseptic. The wolves, I began, since no one else would. They weren't from the Crimson Forest, Archer said. Not the ones who kicked us out. They were part of another pack, starving and searching for food. Another wolf pack? Were they people too? Or how about the wolves who'd attacked me? How? Such a simple word when said, but I wasn't sure I was prepared for what was sure to be a complex answer. I take it you know, Grady said, and from the tone of his voice, he didn't sound happy about it. When had he gotten back anyway? I shook my head as he moved my bloodied hands away from Archer. That's about as far from the truth as I could ever be. I don't know anything anymore, Archer yelped. Fuck, Grady, a little warning next time. No time for warnings, Grady muttered, and it sounded like his head was bowed over Archer's wound. Besides, you were distracted by little Miss Sure Shot. You gonna tell us how you got that son of a bitch through the eye without being able to see it? Yeah, I know now too. I heard Archer a little bit ago. Archer panted and hissed while Grady cleaned him up. I saw you, Ika. I saw you walk right past me without a word when you went to open the door to Hellbreath. I was right here on the couch. Oh, for fuck's sake! I pulled sharply away from them both, a roiling heat simmering in my gut. Okay, congratulations, now you both know. Why are you making such a fucking big deal over it? I don't. Relax, woman, will you? Grady snapped. We're surprised is all, just like I'm sure you're surprised that we're wolves. You're men, I corrected. We're wolf shifters, Archer breathed. I backed away a step, shaking my head, because this was the most insane thing I'd heard in my entire life. Men didn't change into wolves that changed back into men. I'd thought I was hallucinating when I saw through wolves' eyes. But this entire situation was just a giant fever dream of fantastical nonsense. A sudden tremor ripped up my spine. 
What if I'd shaken something loose inside my head in the crimson forest? Because that was what it felt like. Like reality was slipping. Are you gonna pass out? Grady demanded. A burst of anger sparked at the implication, and I marched toward him to slide my bloody hands down the back of his coat. I liked it better when you weren't here. He gave a low rumble, half growl, half chuckle. Yeah, me too. Everything you told me, Archer, I said, pointedly ignoring Grady. It was the truth, Archer said. Most of our pack was murdered over our turf in the Crimson Forest. Grady and I are what's left, and Sasha. Our alpha is missing, has been for years. He paused for a moment. I think he's dead. And I think he isn't, Grady yelled, and Archer hissed in pain right after, like Grady had taped him up a little too violently. The tension in the room tightened just as thick and smothering as the silence. Had that been where Grady had gone then? To search for their... I swallowed, barely able to entertain the idea. Alpha? Grady huffed, and I imagined I could feel the edges of teeth in the sound. Our pack was close, real close, and I know I would feel it in my gut if he was dead. So this, this pack that kicked you out, I said, feeling like I was stepping on shaky ground. Would they ever come to finish the job? I doubt it, Archer said. Probably so, Grady said at the same time. Well, I nodded. That clears everything right up. We're not even in the Crimson Forest. Archer said. We're right on the edge, in the slip joint forest. Neutral ground. That's what Faust said anyway. Faust, as in the guy above rank from Gabriel, who we sold the poison to. Had Baba known all this? That he was dealing with wolf shifters the whole time? Slip joint forest, I began. Is that where you found me, Grady? Mm hmm. Slip joint forest bled right into the crimson forest. If I'd made it there, I'd gone a little too far north, but not much. The two forests converged around Old Man's Den, where I still needed to go. Those wolves who just came here, I said. I think it was a distraction to get the poison. It's gone. The bald man took it. You saw him in my bedroom yourselves which was how I'd seen him too. A heavy sigh from Archer. Shit. Grady stood and limped away, and the air around him crackled with tension. What the fuck, Archer? You're upset the poison's gone? It belonged to Ika, asshole. It's how her family gets fed. Well, right now, the biggest deer I could find in the slip-joint forest is probably still feeding your family. Even after a week, Grady said. I even delivered it to their doorstep. You're welcome. I sucked in a breath. You did? Did you see any- I didn't stop to take in the sights, he snapped. I sank my eyes closed with relief. Jade would have found it, probably while it was still fresh, and would have used every part of it she could to keep her and Lee alive. Possibly my Baba, too, if he'd made it. But even a deer wouldn't last long through the winter, despite all our other ready-made foods like deer jerky, dried fruits, and pickled vegetables. Maybe half the winter. So about two and a half to three months, if they spread it thin. We really needed payment from the delivery for one last run into margin, for more supplies. But now the bald guy had it, the very definition of my family's survival. Gone. This bald guy, Grady said. Why does he want your poison? Control, maybe? That was the only thing that made sense to me, at least. 
Archer shifted again on the couch and groaned. So this guy is nudging you out of that business, just like the wolves kicked us out of our home, for control. When he put it like that, it made it sound like we had a lot more in common than I thought. How did that guy know about the package and exactly where you kept it? Grady asked. A shiver chased down my spine. Because he'd been watching, maybe right through the window, and I hadn't ever known. Have you seen that man before? Archer cleared his throat like he was testing to see if I'd admit it or not. The part about seeing specifically. No, I... No. But I had seen him. Really seen him. From outside the window through the wolf's eyes. How could something like that be real? I could feel both Archer and Grady's gazes on me. Waiting since I'd trailed off. Something happened to me in the forest when I was being attacked by the wolves, I said. I could see. It happened again when I woke up here that first time. And again today. I saw the man then. Silence, thick as Archer's blood, scenting the air. I don't follow. You're blind, but you can see? Grady asked. I can see through wolves. The words felt foreign on my tongue, their meaning rattling somewhere at the back of my head where they might never make sense. Sasha and you two. After a weighted pause, Grady said, Huh? That's it? Just huh? I asked. I mean, that's all I got. This is... I've never heard of something like this. Describe it, Archer said. What does it look like when you see through us? It's like I'm right there inside your head, doing what you're doing up close and personal, and seeing all of it in detail. Bloody, horrifying detail. I swallowed thickly. I never want to be in the middle of a wolf battle again. But you can't see through us right now in our human forms, Grady said. No. Try. I don't even know. Try. I sawed my teeth together, cursing his name a dozen different ways for being so goddamn bossy, but did as he said. But it wasn't a matter of concentrating hard. It just happened, all on its own without any help from me. I shrugged. It's not working. You have to be your, your wolf selves, and you have to be nearby. When you moved Sasha across the hall from me, I could no longer see. Grady grunted a disgusted sound. What? I shot at him. That's what you call trying hard? You gave up after four seconds flat. Okay, okay, Archer said. Let's go back to the attack in the woods. How many wolves' eyes could you see through? Just one. The one standing over me. Grady, I assumed. Protective then, unlike the hateful Grady now. Just our pack then? Why? Archer said. What could possibly cause that? Something unlocked in my chest. A feeling tied with a thread I had to follow, if I dared. Moonshine itself has certain side effects in large amounts, even without the wolf's bane. You said your pack was poisoned, and I... Archer sucked in a breath. You were too? I firmed my lips and backed away a few steps, but I had to say it. I had to follow the thread to see if I was right. Ika, he said gently. Who poisoned you? Your baba? A bitter taste flooded my mouth, as real as it had been 14 years ago, and I shook my head violently, trying to smear those memories from my head forever. But I had to say it. I had to find out the truth. My ama, my mom, 
I finally admitted, my voice cut from shards of stone. I'd never told anyone that. Ever. Not even Jade. With the truth out there in the open, I felt horribly naked, and Archer and Grady's gazes dug deep into my flesh like fresh bruises. I wanted to snatch it back, claim it was someone else, not my own mother, but a stranger who wasn't supposed to love me. But I didn't. I'll rise. Grady cleared his throat of some of its roughness. Our eyes didn't used to go red when we shifted, before we were poisoned. Yeah, Archer said. Must have been a side effect. So the fact that we were all poisoned, our shifter pack and a human, it connected us. Offered eyes to the one who can't see. A breath loosened in my chest, one I seemed to have been holding since I'd told them the truth. Neither of them had questioned me further about Ama. No wise, no judgment either, when I'd honestly expected a backlash of it. Maybe I judged her enough for all of us. Moonshine itself causes blindness when drunk too much. I guess with you, I gestured lamely at them. With shifters, it reacts a little differently. It's still curious why you'd be able to see through us, Archer said. I mean, you're wolf shifters. That in itself is curious, don't you think? So maybe it's the same thing. What exactly makes you shift? Magic, Archer offered. Oh, simply put, I'd expected a more complicated answer that had to do with the full moon's gravitational pull on their hair follicles or something. I had no idea. But magic summed it up nicely. Magic. I'd never been associated with it, never thought of my blindness as linked in any way to it. But in a way, I suppose it was, if magic allowed me to see. A sharp sting speared my chest, a hurt that somehow felt good. I couldn't explain it, and I didn't know what it meant exactly. But it made me feel alive. That wasn't quite right. Of course I felt alive. It was more than that. Like I got to experience something very few did. Magic. Not the kind with cards I couldn't see but the real kind, the kind I could see. How do you, I struggled with the words. What kind of magic is it that makes you shift? Grady crossed in front of me and started poking at the fire. It doesn't make us, we make it. Oh, and what about your clothes when you shift? It seemed sort of trivial, but that sure didn't keep me from wondering. We shift back fully clothed, all part of the magic, Archer said, a smile in his tone. It comes from the ruby caves in the Crimson Forest. That's right, Archer. Go on and tell her everything, Grady growled. She's already involved, asshole, so you can go to hell with all your damn secrets. Maybe if we had fewer secrets, we wouldn't be in this fucking mess. Grady's teeth gnashed together so loud I could hear them over the crackling fire. Anyway, Archer continued, his voice low. Those conceived in the ruby caves shift, like us. It's the way it's always been. A female brings all of her harem of mates there when she's in heat, to better her chances of conceiving. Mates? More than one? Yes. The more mates, the better protected the pups will be once they're born, since they're all considered the fathers. Oh, this was some news. Like sharing a female, and then she could have multiple men all to herself. That seemed... perfect? I had too many other questions to stick on that subject for long. And if you're not conceived in the caves? Then there's no creation, no wolf pups to carry on the pack, he said. Pregnancies don't happen outside the ruby caves. 
So now that someone else is controlling the caves... That's right, Archer sighed. Nearly two years ago, when we were pushed out of the Crimson Forest, was the last of any new births or pregnancies for our pack. Like it matters, Grady grumbled. The whole of our pack is almost completely dead. Sasha, I said. Sasha was the last birth. A stillness lowered over the cabin, wrought with melancholy and deep sadness. I opened my mouth to ask why, but Archer blew out a shaky breath, like he did when his hands trembled. It made me wonder about Sasha's mother, if the mother was close to Archer. Was he the father? Had he conceived a baby with a female shifter? For some reason, the thought of him being with someone like that twisted my heart around. It shouldn't, but it did. Maybe Grady was the father, though that seemed less likely since he snapped and hissed like a feral beast. Archer was a lot more loving and heated. They were both fiercely protective and doting of Sasha, which made sense because she was just a baby. Not only that, she was the last baby of their pack. Sasha is a wolf, I said carefully, redirecting a little to hopefully easier topics. Will she shift soon, or has she already? Pups don't shift for the first time until they're around four or five, Archer explained. They keep warmer that way with the extra fur while they're little. I see. A sudden idea occurred to me, and it made my blood pound with anticipation. When I first woke up here, you offered Sasha to me to hold. I sawed my teeth across my lower lip, my cheeks flushing at how badly I'd reacted to that. She was just a baby. Completely harmless, Archer had said. Um, so, can I do that now? No, Grady said simply. The word crushed me far more than I ever thought it would. Not until you wash your hands in the snow. You didn't wipe all of Archer's blood on my coat. There was almost a smile in his rough voice, or at least the suggestion of one down deep. I grinned, not feeling guilty about wiping blood on him in the least, and turned in the direction of the door. There's a bowl of it by the fireplace I haven't used yet, Grady said. I can get, no, I can do it. Well, okay then, I'll go get Sasha. His limping footsteps faded down the hall, and I crossed to the crackling fire. I, uh, Archer said, his voice tense with worry. I'm not going to stick my hand in the fire. I've been alive for nearly 20 years, and see? I waved my hands in the air and then winced at the resulting bolt of pain through my ribs. Damn it. Never do that again, Aika. No burns. No fear, either. I didn't have to see his smile. I could feel it, just as clearly as I felt my own. My toe hit a pot and water sloshed inside. I knelt, hovered my palms over the surface to test for steam, and dipped a finger inside. Warm, but not hot. Are you doing okay with all of this? He asked. Was I? Honestly, I might never know. Are you? I asked. With me, I mean, and my blindness? Yes, and yes he said quietly. I could feel him watching me as I scrubbed my hands beneath the water, and something about his voice, the slight wonderment of it, took me back to the time when I lay in bed with him sitting next to me, touching my heart, feeling it beat for him, skin to skin. A tingle spread low in my belly, and I wondered what it would be like if he touched me right there. A human and a wolf shifter. The wolf shifter still waiting for my answer. I think, 
It's a lot to take in, but I'd like to try. A devious chuckle wound through the limping footsteps from down the hallway. I'll bet. I was about to demand what he was talking about when my vision slid back into place, like with a click of a button from Sasha's eyes drawing closer. Then I knelt with the fire behind me and stared back at her, my mouth slightly open, my long dark hair an absolute nightmare of a mess. And then Archer, lying on the couch, shirtless. The flames danced shadows across his gorgeous, tawny skin, his muscles cut and sculpted with precision. His pants sat low on his hips to allow for the large bandage on his side, and the bones there peeked into a V-shape. His long black hair feathered out around him, and his dark eyes were soft and loving as he stared at Sasha entering the room. Did he look at me like that, too? Sasha blinked away, and I saw myself smile right in front of her, one that lit up my entire face. I quickly stood, dried my hands on myself this time, and held them out, palms up. Do they pass inspection? Good enough. Brady settled the ball of furry magic into my arms, and I wasn't afraid. I held her close feeling her warmth seep through my flannel, and she curved her little body into my chest. I smiled into her fur and inhaled spring leaves, kissed with sunshine. Hi, Sasha, I whispered. She let out an adorable squeak. She buried her nose into my hair and sniffed, and I immediately felt sorry for her. I probably reeked, but she kept sniffing and let my hair curtain over her eyes as she nestled in. I planted a kiss on the top of her head and held her close while thinking about my next course of action. Because I couldn't stay here, I had to get back home. But first, I'm going to help you, you and your guardians, I told Sasha. Grady grunted. This is some news. How? Archer asked. I took a deep breath, aware of the risks, all 6,000 of them. You can help me make more poison. Chapter 8 The tension strangled the air from the room. Sasha popped her head up and blinked at her two guardians, and they both stared at me hard. Help you make poison, the rough edges in Grady's voice, the fiery blaze in his steel eyes made me back up a step, clutching Sasha tighter. That's going to help us? Yes, I said firmly. My family still needs food for the winter. That hasn't changed, but the way we were going to earn money for it has. The original poison is gone, but with your help, I can make more or at least something that smells like moonshine. I'll add some mountain chicory since it looks like wolfsbane, or any type of purple flower to make it look exact. You're talking about tricking Faust with a knockoff of what your pa usually gives him? Grady's voice grew louder until it was practically a roar. Sasha flinched and curled deeper into me, tucking her head into my armpit so I could no longer see but I stood my ground. Yes. And if it doesn't work, Archer said softly. It has to work, and I won't know unless I try. I can't just do nothing. That money, it's our last hope. The guy who took the poison, Grady snapped. What if he made the delivery and already collected on it? What then? I don't know what he did with it which is why making more is worth a shot. Grady took a step closer. Once again, you said you would help us. This sounds an awful lot like we help you, and we've done more than enough of that. Grady, Archer hissed. I was getting to that, I gritted out. 
Gabriel, and therefore Faust, is in Old Man's Den, and I'm guessing that neither of you is allowed there if his pack kicked you out of the Crimson Forest, right? That's right, Archer said. I can, though. I've done it before. You said your Alpha is missing, and you've been looking for the past two years. What if he's there, the very place you can't go to? So what, like a prisoner? Archer asked. Grady limped away and then stopped, and I didn't have to see him to know the gears in his mind were churning. Say he is there. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to find him? I'll tell you how. You favor your right foot when you walk and scuff the foot of your left along the floor because you hurt your heel or your ankle badly and didn't rest enough to heal it. The bottom of your left boot is so worn that it's lost its traction and slips along the floor easily, which tells me that your injury was some time ago. And you, Archer? I turn toward him. You smell of crisp wood smoke and caramel, which could mean a lot of things, like maybe you melt the candy over a fire outside, or to get away from Grady, he said with a touch of what might have been awe. He's a viper, and I won't share. I pour the caramel over apples, but not the ones I give to Hellbreath. My heart warmed that he was taking such good care of my girl, and because I was right. You want to know how I know all that? By listening, by smelling, by being aware. I may not be able to see, but I'm not useless. I'm not stupid. Nobody ever said you were stupid, Ika, Archer said. And that is impressive. Grady cleared his throat. You guessed all this. I didn't guess. You knew all this just from your other senses. They're sharp, and I sharpen them more every day. I've gotten so used to not seeing that I've started not to miss it until... Well, until I could again, through you all. I smiled at Archer and adjusted Sasha, since he was the only one I really wanted to look at through her. He smiled back, warm and heartbreakingly beautiful. Say you go into old man's den, Grady started. What if Thomas isn't in there and you can't help us? Thomas? Thomas, their alpha? I filed that away. Then I help you widen the search until we find him. Grady scoffed. I'm not sure what good you can do in places I can go. I'm a wolf, remember? My senses are damn good, too. Plus, it's going to be winter soon. If Thomas isn't in Old Man's Den, then we cross that bridge when we come to it, Archer said. I knew he was just playing along since he thought Thomas was dead, which meant that he just wanted to help help me. He cared enough to want to. Even after finding out it was because of Baba and me that he had not much more pack than was in this cabin now. That meant a lot. Look, I know you guys don't owe me anything after saving me, I said. You saved me too, Archer pointed to his bandage with a raised brow. This could have been a lot worse. And I know my family's role in making the poison directly affected you, I continued. You didn't know how, though, Grady muttered, glancing over his wide shoulder. I nodded, grateful that he actually believed me. So, let me help you. Going into Old Man's Den is a start, Archer groaned. I don't know, Ika. Faust is a firecracker with an even shorter fuse than Grady. If he finds out you tricked him by giving him fake poison, Grady turned and faced us, his jaw set. Then we go with her, right to the edge of town. We won't be able to go in, though, Archer said with a sigh. So if there's trouble, shout, and we'll probably die before we reach you. I won't shout. I would never if it meant he could die. Grady, too, because it had sure sounded like he'd agreed to the plan before Archer. 
I suspected he would do almost anything to find their missing Alpha. So, do we have a deal? Grady looked to Archer, who stared up at the ceiling for answers for a long moment. Yeah, Archer finally said, his tone colored by dark worry. We have a deal. One day later, Archer and I sat on the couch while I directed Grady on how to mix the poison concoction. Since Archer was still recovering from his bite wound, he couldn't do much else other than entertain Sasha. He had a ball that he'd thrown at her and she'd chase it and trip over it with her clumsy, short legs. I wished I could have watched her from a distance and not right up close through her eyes, because all the bouncing she did during her mad dashes triggered a constant spin in my stomach. So I sat back with my eyes closed, twirled my wet hair over my shoulder from a long, hot bath, and listened. Archer's loving voice as he praised Sasha. Grady's patience with the pup when she got twisted up in his legs as he moved from the table to the pot over the fire. The three of them were a family, easy with each other and close, like I supposed a wolf pack would really be. Maybe even closer than Jade, Lee, and me. Certainly closer than I was to Baba. How was he? Had Jade gotten the bullet out of him? Was he worried about me? It had been almost two weeks since I'd left to make the delivery myself. A lifetime, it felt like. Meanwhile, the days ticked ever closer to winter. The weather eased into winter, which was why we already had snow. But on the official first day, it was as close to a frozen hellscape as I could imagine. Whiteout conditions. Zero visibility making my way to the outhouse using the rope attached to our cabin, required serious preparation. The first day of winter had always been like this, as far back as anyone could remember. And then it continued for five months straight. It was brutal and could easily kill. Jade and Lee's parents accidentally let the fire go out while they were sleeping and nearly froze to death. A few days later, they were sick. Doctors didn't visit Margin's Row, especially in winter. So a few weeks later, their parents were dead. Which was why I took winter so seriously. What's next? Grady asked, stirring some mountain chicory in a pot above the fire. It smelled too sweet to be wolfsbane, but mixed with the already prepared moonshine, no one would be able to tell. Grady had had to make the moonshine outside, since they didn't have a cellar like Baba did. The only thing left is to add all the ingredients to the glass jar, but we can do that right before I leave, since the moonshine has a horribly offensive odor. My nerves stretched thin at the thought, what if this didn't work? No, no, it had to work. Ah, just like Grady's odor then, Archer said from next to me. He sat upright now, the bite in his side healing quickly. Maybe a result of being a wolf shifter. Lucky man. Grady grunted. When you're this pretty, you just don't need to bathe as often. Besides, I'm cleaner than you, or at least I was until a certain someone arrived. My cheeks warmed, but I tried not to show any reaction. It was obvious Grady was referring to me and that I'd inspired Archer to bathe more regularly. A good thing, though I was flattered. There's a pot there in the fire, Archer gritted out. Why don't you stick your head in it for a closer look? Grady stood and limped across the living room to the table where he kept all the flowers and herbs he'd added to the mix. Funny guy. Hmm, I thought so. Archer said after him, his voice icy and sharp. Grady threw something down on the table, always so loud, and then limped toward the hallway. When are you doing this, Ika? As soon as possible. Tomorrow. My heartbeat spiked at how close that sounded. But it had to be done. I ran my fingers through Sasha's fur, who lay curled in a ball on my left. Hellbreath will get me there. So soon? 
Archer touched my hand, gentle so I wouldn't startle, and a bolt of heat shot up my arm. Are you healed enough to ride? I have to be. I've already been here nearly two weeks and winter won't wait. Still, he moved closer across the couch and wound his fingers through mine, settling our clasped hands on my thigh. He wasn't wearing a shirt since he sat right by the fire, a fact I'd been very aware of every time Sasha had jumped up on him or he brushed his arm against mine. He rubbed little circles into the back of my hand. The heat inside me stirred low, skittering across my lap like licking flames. His leg thumped against my knee and there was barely any part of us that wasn't touching. My breaths grew shallow, and I tried to slow them, deepen them so he couldn't hear me panting. What was it about him that did this to me? And why did I like it so much? I wanted to press into him more, have him touch me everywhere. We'll follow as far as we can and stay until you come out, he promised. But I don't like that you'll be going in there alone. His breath sighed against my cheek, like the kiss of a spring breeze, and I tilted my face up to meet it. I know, but it's the only way. I don't like that you'll be going, period. I like having you here. Believe it or not, you're much better company than Grady. He laughed, such a light, effortless sound. That ray of sunshine? I don't believe it. I grinned, but it didn't stick for long. I have to go, though, Archer. But I hope that this won't be the last time I see you. Me too. He leaned in and grazed his lips across mine, hardly a touch at all, but enough to charge my heart into double time. My first kiss with a wolf shifter. My first kiss, period. It had both scattered my thoughts and sharpened them around this moment in time. Despite my inexperience, I knew how the basics worked from some of the books Jade had charmed the librarian in margin into checking out, the books hidden behind the library desk and not on the shelves. I leaned in for more. Mercifully, Archer obliged. Then limping footsteps thudded up the hallway, and we broke apart. Damn Grady and his ridiculous timing. I covered my mouth to hide my heavy pants, my whole body buzzing and my face heating to the tips of my ears. Archer cleared his throat. Uh-huh, Grady said. That night, I lay awake thinking about tomorrow and about Archer about what I would do if this rickety plan of mine didn't work and I didn't get paid. And Archer, I needed to focus so my family and I would survive the winter. But the man, the wolf shifter, had invaded my thoughts with his heat and his heart. I touched my lips, imagining how his had felt there, so soft and full of promise. A quick knock sounded at my door. I flew my hands out from beneath the covers, my breaths coming in short bursts, my skin fiery, my heart making a permanent home in my throat. Yes? I squeaked. Embarrassment swamped my body and I tried again. Yes? The door opened. Ika? It was Archer. Oh, God. Could he tell what I'd been doing? What I'd been thinking? But then the tone of his voice barreled through everything else, tense, enough to seal my lungs together with worry. What is it? And then he said two words that just about killed me. It's Hellbreath. Chapter 9 the walk out to the barn was the longest I'd ever had to take. I had questions, but I couldn't voice them through the knot of emotion twisted in my throat. First, the package was taken, the sole source of money. And now maybe my horse, 
the only means I had to deliver the package, whether fake or not. The universe played cruel jokes. Even if I was successful tomorrow getting money we needed, it wouldn't matter if I didn't have hell breath to go into margin for food. We wouldn't survive the winter. But even more important than that was I couldn't lose my girl. We'd found each other while I'd been teaching myself to shoot with a bow and arrow on the side of the cabin when I was about eleven. She'd wandered up from the direction of margin and we just stood there, sensing each other. I'd known right away she was a horse from her telltale sounds, but I couldn't see her scars. Horrid, Baba had said, like she'd been abused. Since our other horse was on his last leg and no one came to claim Hellbreath, we became fast friends, seeing a kinship in the other, one abused girl to another. Now Grady and Archer came with me out to the barn, their boots crackling over the snow. The night was still and cold like a mirror of frosted glass before it shattered. I pressed the lapels of my wool coat to my mouth to keep any broken sounds inside me as Grady pulled open the barnyard door and limped out of the way. He followed Archer and me inside. I immediately smelled something wrong, sour and sick like an infection. This way, Archer said, his voice somber, and he lightly touched my elbow to lead me forward. She grunted, not her usual greeting at all. I slipped off my glove and reached my hand out to her, expecting her to find it with a nudge. But she didn't. Archer redirected my hand and brought it to her nose. When I touched my fingertips down her silky fur to the tip, they came away sticky and wet. Nasal discharge, which could mean a number of things, not all of them terrible. Please, I choked out. What do you see? Grady took a deep breath and let it out slowly as if this pained him too. She's leaning against the wall of the stable. Her head is tilted like she can't control it. I think it must be some kind of virus because of the discharge coming out of her nose. My eyes filled with tears as I tried to picture all of these things, but I just couldn't. She was tough and stubborn and fierce. She was my girl. Is she... Is she in pain? A pause, then... I don't know, Grady said, his voice low. What can I do for her? The words faltered at the end, but Archer seemed to understand them anyway. You don't ride her, Ika. He smoothed his hand over my back. She's not up for it. We'll do all we can for her in the meantime. But the delivery. It didn't have to be tomorrow, but if not, when? Winter was almost upon us, less than a week away. I had to make this delivery, and I had to do it soon. The immediacy of the situation, the stress at seeing hell breath, the toll just coming out here had on my healing body. All of it loosened my knees. I slumped, but Archer was there to keep me upright with his big, warm hands. Hey, whoa, I got you. He did, but I had to have myself, too. There were too many lives depending on me. I had to still try to make the delivery with or without hell breath. My mind spun on possible solutions until I pinpointed one that just might work. What if... What if there was another way for me to get there? Like if you two pulled me there on a sleigh or something. You could stop before they scented you or before you scented them, rather, and then aim me in the right direction. I blurted it all so fast that I wasn't even sure I understood it. No. Grady paced away, his bum leg dragging over the loose hay on the ground, and then back again. Terrible idea. What? Why? I demanded. Because you barely made it out here, he growled. You're not even healed yet. Archer slipped his arm tighter around my shoulders, enveloping me in his warmth and comfort. 
Even if we did it that way, you'd have to walk at least a mile, maybe more, depending on the wind and how far our scents carry, with nothing to guide you. Wrong, I said, my voice hard. I'd have myself, my hearing, and my sense of smell. I'll even bring a walking stick to help me. The terrain is rough, Grady said. Steep valleys slick with snow and frozen streams. If you fall, I won't. Then we would come and help her, Archer snapped. Fuck the risks, Grady. And if your girlfriend can't cry out for help because she slipped and split her head open on a rock? Grady asked. What then, lover boy? I'm not sticking my neck out for someone like her. Someone like me? Human? Blind? Useless? Archer released a warning growl as he released me and took a step toward him. Leave. Now. I crushed my back teeth together, glaring at Grady while fury sizzled up right underneath my skin. Part of why I'm going there is for you. To find your alpha, to find Thomas. Bull. Shit. Grady said through gritted teeth. It's all for you. As soon as you get your money, you'll forget all about us. Next spring, your pa will continue to make the poison that helped slaughter most of my pack and keep others away, and you'll help and not even think twice about it. Don't you say that, I shouted. Don't even pretend to think you know me. With a furious snarl, Archer drove Grady into the barnyard wall to my left, hard enough to shake the foundation. Grady? Go, with pleasure, Grady hissed and stomp limped to the doors. He must have forgotten his walking stick. Have fun with your plaything. Your alpha's probably already dead, I called after him, the words bitter and sharp. And I knew he heard me because he stood in the doorway for a long moment before leaving, just as silent and cold as his heart. I'd hurt him, and that filled me with a dark sort of glee. The next morning, I woke early and dressed in as many clothes as were in the small chest of drawers in my room. Not my room, even though I'd come to call it that these last several days. Soon, I was ready to go to Old Man's Den, ready to get this charade over with so I could get paid and leave here for good. Leave Grady and the horrible way he made me feel. Leave Sasha. Leave Hellbreath. And leave Archer. Those last two would be the hardest. Archer's warmth and easy nature had slipped underneath my skin and heated through all the way to my soul. He felt perfect there. Like that was where he'd always been. So to go someplace else where he hadn't saturated the place with his smell and laughter and stories, I might only see him a few more brief times before the long winter, if that, and it scratched deep claws down my heart, even more painful than the real healing ones on my flesh. And Hellbreath, she wouldn't be able to travel back home if she was so sick. As hard as it was to fathom life without her, she'd be well taken care of here. If she survived the winter, I would come back for her, no question. With the mission to go find a walking stick first, I stepped into the hallway and then paused outside Sasha's door. I had to say a quick goodbye. I hoped I could see her again, in the special way that I could because I wanted to watch her grow and shift when the time came. She too had wriggled her way into my life, and I'd miss her. I knocked softly and then entered and immediately knew two things. One, she was asleep. Two, Grady was here. His angry, volatile emotions stiffened the air and made it hard to breathe. His glare burned through my skull from the far corner of the room where the faint creak of a rocking chair had stopped, the second I'd opened the door. Doing my best to ignore him, I shuffled across the room with my arms out. He didn't bother to offer direction. A good thing, since I didn't want to hear his stupid voice. 
My fingers grazed a thin wooden bar and then another one, like those on a crib, and I reached over and sifted my hand through the softest fur imaginable. I smiled despite my dark company. Be well, Sasha, I whispered. I hope I get to see you again. Without a word to Grady, I left and shut the door behind me. Making sure my coat was bundled tightly to the cold, I silently said my goodbyes to the cabin and walked out into a blustery day. Morning, Archer said in that deep, easy way of his that never made me jump. Good morning. I stopped on the porch as his footsteps thudded about ten feet away, not over snow, but wood. A short banging sound from that direction, swift and confident, like a hammer driving a nail home. What are you doing? Just finishing up with your sleigh. There's your quiver of more freshly carved arrows just to your left there, and the fake poison is right next to Grady's walking stick. My jaw dropped. I bent to retrieve the items and rubbed my fingers over the arrow's smooth wood. You did this? For me? Already? I did. I could hear the grin in his voice, but imagined it fading much too fast. He crossed toward me and stopped, standing so close I could feel his breath feathering my lips as he towered over me. But also for me. I don't like the idea, and I don't like you leaving here, but I understand that you have to do this. Thank you. Thank you for all of this. No one had ever bent over backward before for me, not ever, and certainly not by making me a sleigh and arrows by hand. Then again, I'd never been this desperate to survive. It showed that he cared, really cared and it stole my next several breaths at just how much. I shook my head, feeling tears rise and overflow, but with my hands full, I couldn't wipe them away. So Archer did, clearing one cheek, then the other, his touch like fire. Don't cry, Ika. I can't help it, I admitted, the words thick with emotion. Grady's going to go insane when he discovers you gave me his walking stick, and these are my happy tears at the very idea. He chuckled, and then it faded out into a long sigh. You want to say goodbye to Hellbreath before we go? I nodded and set my bow, arrows, and walking stick down. Then Archer led me to the barn and left me alone with my poor girl. She seemed to be in the same position as last night. No worse and no better. Mostly we just hugged each other while I promised her dozens of things we could do together when she got better. Like another picnic in the springtime with Jade and Lee and apples. All she could eat. Not a new name, though. She rumbled her dissatisfaction when I suggested it. Okay, not that. Just the other things, but only when you get better, though. I whispered into her fur, wet with my tears. I hated to think this would be the last time I saw her. As soon as spring came, I swore I'd be back here as soon as I could, which might not be soon enough. I gave her one last kiss and scratch on the top of her forehead, her favorite spot, and then walked out of there with my heart dragging behind me. Archer met me outside and wrapped me up closer to him with his arm around my back. Ready? He asked gently. No, I wasn't. Yes, I was. I sighed. Ready. All you have to do is hold on to the handrail. I won't go too fast, but I'll go fast enough to cover the three miles there. It should take about thirty minutes. The wind is super shitty today, though. He led me to the sleigh and then up onto it, showing me where the handrail was, which was rough and easy to grip, even with gloves. Same for the wood under my feet. It felt sturdy and thick enough that I didn't feel like I'd slip off. This is perfect, Archer. I beamed over my shoulder at him, where I could hear him securing the bow and arrows and all my other supplies. 
From the slightly hollow sound of the boards, there must have been a compartment under my feet for storage. It really was perfect. Well, I don't know about perfect, but I think it'll get you there. Okay, I think that's it. He stepped down from the sleigh and stopped at my side. Shout if you need anything. I'm going to go ahead and shift and we'll get going. Oh, one more thing. Can you crouch down a little, just for a second? I did as he asked. Like this? Yeah, a little more. And turn toward me. I narrowed my eyes because his voice was laced with a teasing smile. Why do I have a feeling you're having fun with me? Probably because I'm having fun with you. He laughed and then it cut short, followed by the sound of paws hitting the snow and the smell of snowy fur. In an instant I could see again, my own grinning, tear-streaked face right in front of Archer's eyes. My other eyes. A long pink tongue darted out and slicked across my mouth, and then Archer turned and bounded away while I sputtered with laughter. Hey! I shouted. You licked my teeth! Just as the sleigh began to move, gently at first, I stood upright, the cold wind freezing my grin in place as we left the cabin behind. A miracle grin, because the rest of me cracked open, deeper and deeper like a jagged ravine every foot we moved away. My temporary good spirits at being licked by Archer's wolf tongue chipped away as fast as a certain realization took hold. Grady had been right. This terrain was wild and rough. Archer panted his way through it, dragging me up the sides of hills strewn with sharp stones and twisted tree roots, poking at odd angles up through the snow. He looped me around the widest parts of frozen streams to try to cross the narrower channels. Through Archer's eyes, it looked the same for miles, snow-covered and wild and much too overwhelming. I would be walking through some of this by myself. Finally, I closed my eyes to block it all out, taking comfort in the darkness. Right away, my other senses perked up, right at home taking front and center over vision. Over the hiss of wind and the sleigh cracking a path through the snow, the faint, bubbly song of a winter wren sounded. We moved surprisingly fast, directly into the terrible wind. It whipped against my nose and cheeks, and I dared lift one hand from the handrail to rearrange the scarf around my neck to better cover my face. Archer had said Old Man's Den was about three miles, or thirty minutes, away, but it seemed much farther than that by the time he finally stopped. It must have been a much slower three miles while lugging me around behind him. I opened my eyes to see through his, but nothing but forest still crowded around us. I imagined the town was just over the next hill, which thankfully wasn't too steep. Archer's vision blinked out suddenly, and then two feet instead of four stepped toward me. This is as far as I can go, he said with a sigh. I turned and reached for him, my throat pulling tight. Even though I would see him again after I left Old Man's Den, this felt like the first of our goodbyes. I didn't know what to say to him that could possibly sum up all that I was feeling, and thankfully, I didn't have to say anything. He clasped my outstretched fingers and pulled me to him his lips finding mine in a space between my galloping heartbeats. Unlike his sweet, probing kiss last night, this one felt hard and desperate, his mouth claiming my breaths like he needed them more than I did. And I gave them to him, everything I had and more. Or the best I could anyway, since I couldn't really feel my face. He roughly pulled away his ragged breaths steaming warmth over my cheeks. Go, hurry, come back to me and I'll find you when you do. I won't ever forget this, I said, reaching up to find his cheek. Even now, 
especially now, standing here on the edge of winter. His heat startled me. I wished I could cling to it for longer. Everything you've done for me and everything that you are, I will never forget it. The same goes for me too, Oika. He held my hand to his face for a moment and then guided me off the sleigh so he could gather my supplies. While he did, I took a small container of dried peppermint from my pocket I'd swiped from Grady and crumbled the flakes all over my coat, pants, and even my hair. The scent was potent, and Archer had already tested its efficiency to mask the smell of another wolf while Grady had been making the fake poison. Once Archer secured the package in my coat pocket, looped my bow and arrows around my shoulder and handed me Grady's walking stick, he faced me in the right direction again. Head straight. Move quick as you can so you can get out of the wind. I'll be right here when you get back. Okay. Suddenly, the risks involved in this plan drilled right to the center of my bones and rattled doubt through them. There wasn't any other way, though, and I refused to just give in to the death sentence Winter brought with it. I took the first step, which was always the hardest, and led with my walking stick, tapping it back and forth across the snow-covered ground. Archer's heat faded behind me the farther I drew away from him his gaze a comforting pressure on my back, as if he were helping to push me forward against the frigid wind. I wanted him. The realization popped into my head so clear and complete and bright that it dashed another impossible smile across my face. I wanted him so much it hurt, more than anything I'd ever wanted in my life. I wanted to get to know him more discover what made him beautiful on the inside and out. I wanted to kiss him so much more, do things to him, have him do things to me. My head must have crested the hill because an onslaught of putrid smells carried on the wind, effectively killing all happy thoughts. The smells came from old man's den so thick with coppery blood and death that it slimed my tongue with them. I slammed my mouth shut, my eyes watering from the stink and readjusted my scarf over my nose. The town smelled like a slaughter. I didn't remember it being this bad before. Sometimes lambs or other animals were strung up on the side of the single road, still shrieking and killed right there so the individual parts could be sold. The single street of Old Man's Den was like a marketplace, just outside of the business buildings. My walking stick helped me work around trees and rocks, and then my feet were pointing down the hill. The ground was steep and uneven, too slick in places for me to do anything other than slide uncontrollably. One wrong move and I could twist an ankle, fall and break an arm, re-break my healing ribs, or worse, break the package. I kept going and dug in my heels the best I could. Gradually, the ground sloped a little gentler, but I didn't dare start to trust it. The wind brought raucous male laughter with it, coming from up ahead. I was close. To my left, a tree branch snapped. I stopped and whirled toward it, my free hand going to my bow. A wolf? Another wild? Or the bald man coming to see what I was up to? I mentally shook my head. Not every sound meant I was being hunted. Besides, I wasn't in the crimson forest where the wolves had first attacked me. I came at the town through slipjoint forest from the opposite side than what I was used to. I continued on, my senses on alert, just in case. The town's sounds grew loud enough so I could hear snatches of sellers shouting out their wares. I would have to walk through an assault on my ears, all the way through the center of it, to get to my destination on the other side. More scents enveloped me, not all of them terrible like smoked meats and fried and sugared breads, and then terrible in a different way, with sweaty, jostling bodies pressing in. 
but Ica? My mind scratched at the familiar voice and I stopped, wondering if it was possible to be in two locations at once, because that voice belonged back home, not in Old Man's Den. Lee? I couldn't hear myself, couldn't believe I was saying his name. Suddenly, he stood right in front of me and touched my face just as I always did to him, our usual greeting. I'd always patted him on the cheek as a little boy, and somehow it evolved into touching each other's faces, our thing. You're so beautiful, Aika. I love you. Jeers and whistles sounded nearby. Who's your friend here, lover boy? A man asked and slapped his hand on Lee's back, knocking him closer. But I hardly heard him. A bitter tang rolled on Lee's breath, sharp enough to bring tears to my eyes. Have you been drinking? I asked, astonished. My new friends like me, Ika. He laughed. So much. I started shaking my head even before he'd finished, disgust seething through my blood. These are not your friends. But listen to me. I held to his face harder. How did you get here? Where's Jade? The panic in my voice sharpened to a point, and I could feel him wince. The nice man took us here. Jade's in that place. He nodded his head toward the left. What nice man, Lee? What place? I demanded. The scratching post, one of his friends said. Everything inside of me went numb. Oh God, oh God, Jade. I'd heard of the scratching post the couple of times I'd been to old man's den. Men liked to brag loudly about the women there and all the different ways they liked to be poked. Because the scratching post was a goddamn brothel, and Jade was only 15. My throat suddenly felt raw and hoarse, like I'd started screaming into a void. I had to get her out of there. I had to get them both out of old man's den. Someone knocked into me hard, going the other direction bumping me away from Lee and nearly sending me to the road on my noodle-like legs. Say goodbye to your girlfriend, a rough voice said. It's time to hit the next tavern. Goodbye, Ika. I love you. No, Lee. I reached out for him, searching in an endless sea of movement, but he'd already gone. Lee, please, come back. My shout was swallowed whole by rougher, deeper ones, coming straight at me like an angry wall. Edenberry said he smelled a rival wolf coming this way, a man said as he passed by. Only one, but there could be more coming. Archer. My heart pummeled everything on its fall down to my toes. I spun around in the direction the men were headed into Slip Joint Forest. I could only imagine what they would do to Archer if they found him. I worried my lip, sudden indecision pulling hard in four different directions. To Archer, to Jade, to Lee, or to make the fake delivery. Forcing a breath from my icy lungs, I took my next step, my mind made up. Chapter 10 I hated walking through towns, especially now with a walking stick, because I felt like I was shouting the fact that I was blind from the top of my lungs. I grew defensive if anyone got too close or said the wrong thing. Just ask Jade. Who this? She'd said once while nudging me. I'm taking care of her and my brother. We'd been strolling through margin with Lee on our heels and she'd said it to impress some random boy she'd met two seconds earlier. So I'd taken Lee and Hellbreath back to Margin's Row without her, and made her walk a large chunk of the twenty miles back. 
I would have let her do the whole trek if not for Lee getting upset about it. And after I finally rounded back to pick her up, the summer sun beating down, she didn't speak to me for weeks. We had a complicated relationship, and I often hated the attention she received for her looks and was even jealous of her name. Jade sounded so much more exotic than Ika. Jade had purpose. Ika was just some random letters strung together to make a weird sound at the back of your throat. Still, she might as well have been my blood sister. And now I was leaving her behind in a brothel. Leaving her brother behind to drink even more at another tavern with his so-called friends. And Archer? He could fend for himself. I had to believe that. Just as I had to believe I was making the right choice by continuing with my original plan. Guilt dragged at each of my steps, though, as I cut my way through the crowd in slow motion. Someone's elbow jabbed a little too close to my healing ribs and I let out a hiss. Whoever it was just chuckled, a smoky feminine sound that instantly made me think of sex. Not with her, but in general, like maybe she worked at one of the brothels in town. Sorry, dearie, but you're on the wrong side of traffic, she said. Oh, I swatted at the ground with my walking stick and tried to maneuver to the right, but there were too many bodies. This place was hell. Oh, for fuck's sake. I swung my walking stick higher and landed several hits until people finally moved out of my way. The woman had been right. Over on the right side, the crowd flowed in the direction I needed. Soon, my ears perked at the sound of horses snorting and pawing the ground up ahead. There was a hitching post there where Hellbreath always went directly to when Baba and I would arrive from the other side of town. Just to the right of it was where I needed to go. When I got there, I could tell I was in the right place because of the booze and tobacco smell and the certain clang, flap, clang of what sounded like a flag with metal parts beating against its pole. From the sound Baba's voice had made when he was here, the place he went to sell the poison had a window with an awning over it within a small offshoot of a building. A man always stood behind the window, and I could hear him now, spitting into a tin cup and setting it back down again. My stomach turned, but I tried to ignore it. I iced my voice with as much authority as I could and said, Here for a delivery for Gabriel or Faust? Faust's not expecting any deliveries today. That doesn't change the fact that I have one for him. He sighed. What is it? It's the same thing my baba, my dad, brings every month. Was it called poison or something else? Baba never had to answer all these questions about it, so I had no clue what the answers were. The first of every month, the guy said, seeming to know what I was talking about. He must have known my baba. Yeah, I snapped. I left on the first and now just got here. Things happen. The guy stood there, seeming to assess way too long. If I couldn't even hand the fake package off to Gabriel or Faust, this was a waste of time. I'd have to find another way to get the money, and fast. I thought of the smoky woman who'd run into me on the way here. Did she work in a brothel? I could never do that. Jade could never do that. I wouldn't let her even if she did. The guy stepped back and parted a beaded curtain behind him. Winky, is Faust here? In the back, a voice hollered. Follow me, the guy said. Follow him where? I gritted my teeth. I'm afraid you'll have to be more specific than that. Why the fuck? He opened a door to his left and mumbled low enough that I almost missed it. Stupid, helpless cunt. A simmer ignited in my gut and flared outward under my skin. Sorry, didn't quite catch that last part, 
I ground out as I shoved past him through the door. I said, solid heavy coat. Yours, I mean. Great craftsmanship. Did you make it yourself? What a terrible liar. As his footsteps thudded past me, I swung my walking stick out at the last minute and cracked him hard in what sounded like his kneecap, enough to earn a grunt and then silence from him. I didn't even try to look innocent afterward, either. I followed the sounds of his movements through the beaded curtain into a building with dusty wooden floors, drafty walls, and loud male voices ahead and to the left. As we moved to the right, all of my doubts hardened into stone. This wasn't a good idea, coming in here like this. Not where I felt trapped between walls. Not where there were fewer witnesses. How about I just give it to you, and you can give it to Faust in exchange for my money? I asked. He didn't say anything as he turned right, his footsteps clipping along the wooden floor. Yeah, I like that plan better. I fished in my pocket, comforted slightly by the sloshing inside. Here. He wordlessly turned right again, and I followed into a much narrower space as the hallway. The walls bounced back our sounds much faster than they had. Wait, he snapped and shut the door. No, you wait. I lunged toward the door just as a lock outside slid home. My breath stalled. Hey! I banged on the wood with both my fists and my stick. Silence. God damn it, Ika. I suppose I'd really pissed him off. This was not good. Of course, I couldn't have predicted that coming to Old Man's Den would end with me locked inside a room. A closet, more like, I realized as I turned around. My stick hit the leg of a table and beyond it a simple wooden chair. I sat there to rest for a bit, my exhausted body feeling like it was going to revolt any second against me and shut down. My ribs hurt something awful and even my healing wolf bites protested that I'd pushed myself too far. Time ticked by. I could feel it in my empty stomach, growing emptier by the second. My body did shut down for a while, and I dozed. When I woke again, my brain felt foggy and everything ached. How long had I been out? Hey! I tried to shout. But my throat had dried, so I couldn't push out anything beyond a croak. Lucky for me, I didn't have to get up to bang on the door with my walking stick since the room was so small. I could sit here and do it. How long would Faust keep me waiting? More and more, I just wanted out of here, never mind the package and the money. This had been such a terrible idea. There had to be another way to get money. I could steal it. Maybe from this tavern. Or I could go somewhere else and try to work for that kind of money over the next couple of days with my shitty, still-healing body. There had to be another way, though, because this wasn't working. I rose slowly, my very bones creaking, and turned to explore my options in this room. Behind me, my fingers hit a pane of arctic glass. A window. Narrow. Really narrow. I searched along the other walls, but that was the only one. I returned to it, found the latch, jammed the heel of my palm against it to make it budge. Could I make it? The door opened behind me. I whirled around and a wall of spruce and dirt scents pushed toward me while heavy, confident footsteps thudded inside. Well, Cain Song's daughter. Faust, I guessed. His voice was gravelly, but with a lot of boldness behind it. I tried to blank my face, even though my insides recoiled. He was a wolf shifter, and not the good kind like I was used to. How many had he killed with my Baba's poison? I gotta say, this is a surprise. I expected your pa on the first of the month. A chair dragged across the floor and then creaked as he sat. Not today, and certainly not you. Alone. I cleared my throat, even drier now, my tongue growing thick. 
No time for nerves, though. I had to literally sell my lie. I left on the first of the month, but am only just arriving today. I was attacked in the Crimson Forest. Better to start with the truth, I supposed. Yes, he said. I would imagine you were. But my Baba never was, I blurted, then scolded myself internally. That wasn't part of my script. No, he wasn't. Your pa had permission. And then it clicked. Of course he did. He was the one who was supposed to make the delivery each month, not me. The wolves in the Crimson Forest must have known I didn't belong and attacked. A long pause while I could feel him staring at me. Your pa never told you, did he? He never told me a lot of things, I admitted. Curious, though, that he didn't tell you he hired someone else to make the delivery for him. A little later than was scheduled because your old man is sick. Hired? Sick? What? No, he'd handed the package to me and told me to hide at Lee and Jade's. We didn't have money to hire someone when we could barely afford to survive. Realization, sharp with many corners, dragged through me. No, not hired. The bald man who'd stolen the package from me. He'd delivered it, late, with some sorry excuse that my baba was sick. Since I'd been in the slipjoint forest when he'd taken it, he'd likely taken that route to get here safely. You could get from Margin's Row to Old Man's Den while avoiding the Crimson Forest, but it would take a lot longer. The bald man obviously had. Shit. So if he'd already delivered it. So, I'm sorry, Faust said. But I've already got this month's supply and won't need any more until after winter. Panic burned up my throat so raw and fierce that I thought I might scream. I had to make him listen, do whatever was necessary so he'd pay me. I have something better than what he gave you. I fished the fake poison from my pocket and laid it on the table between us, a temptation wrapped in hope. It's twice as potent. Mm. He picked it up and I licked my lips my mind spinning on what I could possibly tell him that would make him believe me when I still wasn't sure of the dosage and all the different ways it worked exactly on people like him. Wolf shifters. And on the fact that it was just moonshine mixed with harmless herbs and not real poison at all. The screw lid on top squealed slightly as he twisted it, and then he inhaled. Well... Certainly smells that way. Ever heard of the five-step snake? I blurted. Can't say that I have. After a five-step snake bites you, that's how many steps you take before you fall over dead. Just five. I nodded at the bottle still in his hands. That concoction? That's what I would call a five-step snake. You don't say. There was a tinge of interest in his boisterous voice. But that didn't mean anything. Interest didn't put money in my pocket. And how do you know this for sure? Did you try it out? I did. I dipped one of my arrows in it and shot it into my horse. The lie poured out easily, but my inside shriveled back from the words, as if they were offended I could even think such a thing. I was offended too, but I kept going. She was sick anyway, so I was doing her a favor. Five steps and that was it. A horse, huh? Impressive. I couldn't tell if he believed me or not, or if he was just spouting off what he thought I wanted to hear. Surely you didn't strengthen your pa's potion all by yourself, though. His tone wasn't dismissive of my intelligence, but the words sure were. I perfected it, I bit out. All by myself. He paused for several beats and then, show me. I was too busy glaring daggers at him to realize the implication right away. On you? He chuckled, completely void of any humor, a chuckle that crawled across the table and glared right back. 
let's find an animal, and you can show me this new and improved version. Thoughts crashed together inside my skull. One, this poison couldn't do what I'd just said. Two, by animal. What if he meant Archer since he'd already been detected outside of town? Three, this poison couldn't fucking do what I'd just said. I schooled my expression, feigning confidence, and shrugged. Whatever you say. He stood, and I could feel him towering over me and reveling in it. What's your name, girl? Ika. Pleasure to make your acquaintance, Ika Song. He turned, his heavy boots carrying him out of the cramped room. If it's such a pleasure, then you won't leave me here for long, I called after him. I have places to be, after all. Another empty chuckle. <laughs> Don't we all? He shut and locked the door behind him. Bastard. Now, alone in the silence, I could think about how screwed I was. Like, really drill down and discover the depths of my stupidity. The dumb had no end. Shit, shit, shit. What was I supposed to do now? Sure, a well-placed arrow could kill anything, but poison? That quickly? What the hell had I been thinking? But I refused to let myself crack. I'd come so far and had a little farther to go. Whatever animal he brought me to kill, I'd just have to shoot it and hope for the best. Not Archer, though. Oh God, please be okay, Archer. And Lee and Jade and even my Baba, too. This would all be over soon, one way or another. Sooner than I expected, footsteps pounded outside and the door banged open. Vision, clear as day, clicked into place inside my head. I gasped as I looked at my face through something else's eyes. Oh, shit, no. Archer? Thomas? Yet another wolf? But no. The only wolves I could see through had been poisoned, just like me. The unexpected disorientation caused my stomach to sway, my hands to fly to the table's edge and hang on. Wait, not just my stomach was swaying, but the thing I was peering out of as well. Behind my head in the darkened window, I spied the animal through my borrowed vision. A wolf pup with red eyes, no older than Sasha. It swung from Faust's meaty hand from the scruff of its neck its nose twitching furiously. Another wolf I could see through. Was it part of Archer and Grady's pack? Did they even know it was here? It let out a pathetic little howl and squirmed violently in Faust's grip. I'd shot all kinds of wilds before. Young and old, I was sure, because we needed to eat. But never one I could see through. And never one to prove a lie. I'd talked myself into a corner. Now it was time to talk myself out. Because I couldn't do it. I couldn't shoot this wolf pup. Even if this poison I brought really did work. You have anything older? I asked as calmly as I could manage. I'm not accustomed to shooting pups just to make a point. And I'm not accustomed to little girls demanding I pay them when I already did. Faust's voice came out low, dangerous. You never paid me. I'm sure I did. I paid the man who says he works for your pa. Sounds like there was a communication breakdown between the three of you, which is not my problem. Shoot the pup or get out. Either way, do it quick. When I refused to do either, he made a low growl in the back of his throat and turned to the door, the room tilting crazily through the pup's eyes. What about an advance for spring? I blurted, my desperation lifting my voice higher. He stopped. That's not how any of this works. Why don't you go home to your pa, little girl? I could work for you up until winter. Sweep, do dishes, whatever you need me to do. I swallowed down the terror those words brought me. I shuddered to think what whatever might be, but I didn't have much of a choice. 
It sounded like Lee and Jade didn't either, and I had to do anything I could to get them far away from here, with money, so we could survive like we always had. I don't hire people who waste my time, he said, and then left, taking the pup's eyes and every last shred of hope I had with him. I slumped into the chair, feeling my defeat crush deep into my bones. What now? See if someone else was hiring, like the brothel? The idea made me numb, hollow, and maybe that would be how it would feel lying on a bed with a stranger on top of me. I might as well be dead. Right now, I wasn't, though. I could still find a way to survive the winter. I could steal food. But without sight, I couldn't see who might be watching me, and then afterward throwing me in jail. Terrible idea. I gathered every ounce of will I had left and rose from the table. I would go get Lee and Jade at the very least. After that, well, I didn't have it in me to think that far ahead. I left the tavern the same way I came in, though much slower, listening over the taps of my walking stick for where Faust had gone with the wolf pup. But the hallways were empty the rooms beyond silent other than the main part of the tavern which I avoided. Outside, the frigid air closed in with snapping bites and the harsh promise of the coming winter. The reminder I didn't need turned my lungs to ice. I had no sense of how long I'd been in the tavern, but the gnawing in my stomach suggested quite a long time. It might have even been night. Time to head back. See if Archer... Something hard rammed into my shoulder as it passed and I spun around in absolutely no mood for that bullshit. Get the hell out of my way, I snapped. There's plenty of road, this part is mine. A whistling chuckle came on a horseshit scented gust of wind. One I'd heard before, floating on the wind the night Hellbreath came back to me. A chuckle that locked my muscles up tight. Him, the bald guy who'd shot Baba, the guy who'd stolen the package and ruined everything. So sorry, must not have been looking. I recognized his voice, too, the strange accent, the same as when he'd shouted at Baba before he shot him. The snow between us crunched as he came closer. I fought the urge to back away to shoot him with a real poison-tipped arrow, to scream for him, to beat him to death with my walking stick. He was the reason I was here right now, seriously considering selling my body for money while it sounded like part of my family had been taken against their will and my baba might be dead. Fury shook through me, more penetrating than the cold. Hey, don't I recognize you? He asked. My stomach turned in sickeningly slow circles that he was even looking at me. He'd stood in the same room with me at Archer and Grady's when he stole the package. Who knows how many times he'd seen me before or after that. Doubtful, I said, trying to keep my voice even. No, I never forget a face. You're that blind girl, aren't you? Kane Song's girl. How dare he even say his name? How do you know him? I gritted out. We're both businessmen who happen to be in the same line of business. The business he'd stolen. When did you meet him? Well, a whistly chuckle. I only ever met him the one time. The one time you shot him, you mean? A low rumble circled us, and I realized we'd drawn a crowd. Alcohol-laced breath drifted on the air. That's quite an accusation, he said, his voice like a warning. I'm not so sure I would go around spreading such filthy lies if I were you. What little control I had fled as anger stampeded all my senses. Within seconds, I had an arrow knocked and aimed. 
Don't you ever threaten me again, or I swear. You swear what? That you'll kill me? His laugh rose up louder than the rest of the men who surrounded us. He stepped to the right like he was circling his prey, making a show of mocking me. A blind girl? I'm blind, not stupid. I snapped, homing in on his every sound, every movement, every backtrack he made to try and trick me. I know exactly where to shoot to bring you down and make you suffer, and I very rarely miss. Our growing audience hooted and jeered. Give me the money that should have gone to my baba, I shouted. Sure, okay, but only if you can answer me this. He seemed to do a little dance in the snow for his admirers from the sound of his frenzied steps, and they yelled appreciatively. How many fingers am I holding up? Yeah, we were done here. He wasn't going to give me shit unless I gave him a very sharp reason to. I let an arrow fly. I heard it split through the air, the crowd's sudden intake of air, and then a satisfying howl of pain. How many fingers are you holding up now? My fury ripped up my throat as I knocked another arrow. Jesus fucking Christ! He screamed. A click sounded, just barely over the tumultuous pounding of blood through my veins. The onlookers jeering turned to angry shouts as they pressed in. A horrendous crash of thunder ripped through the air. Then, suffocating silence thick as a blanket of snow. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why. Why the thunder? Why the silence? It wasn't until pain, fierce and hot, registered in my shoulder that I realized my mistake. One of my many, many mistakes. That hadn't been thunder. It had been a gunshot. At once, two thoughts crashed against my temples. I'd been shot and run. Chapter 11 I darted to the right, toward the tavern I'd just left, swinging my walking stick in front of me like a bat. Another shot went off behind me and a hailstorm of splintered wood sliced at my cheek as part of the exterior wall exploded. The bald man, or whoever was shooting at me, was aiming toward my head, and he might not miss the next shot. The bullet hole in my shoulder chewed pain down my entire arm, blood soaked down my side, my legs threatened to curl me to the ground. I ducked through the door next to the windowed entry and spun to bolt it behind me just as someone flung themselves at it. From the outside, the floor shook from the force. I'd pissed quite a few folks off today, doubly so since I was a girl and not acting like one. I had a feeling every single man outside the door would not be stopped by a simple locked door, and I wasn't too stupid to think it was the only one into the tavern. They would come for me, all of them. I was a stranger, a smart-ass girl, and I'd hurt one of their own. I had to get out, find a way back to Slipjoint Forest, back to Archer. Shit, what if something had happened to him? What if he wasn't even there? I would be wandering the forest by myself in the middle of the night while bleeding out from a bullet wound. But hell if I'd stay here. I moved through the side halls in the tavern the same way I'd gone before remembering the way by touch and sound and memory. There had to be a door. The window. The window in the room Faust had kept me in. Not ideal, but I knew exactly where it was, and if I was right in the layout of the building, it should lead to the back of the tavern, which could be ten times worse. And if I got stuck in the window? Shit but I didn't want to spend all my time looking for a door that led outside either, unless I doubled back and went out the front again. My shoulders screamed so brutally that it made my head swim. 
What if I couldn't even make it through the window without passing out from pain? Blood had tracked all the way down my side and was dribbling into my boot. If I wasn't already, I'd soon be leaving a trail that would lead right to me. Best to end the trail by doubling back. I started to do just that when footsteps thudded behind the corner I'd turned five seconds ago, heavy and fast. My heart pitched into my throat. Too late. But they couldn't see me yet, not until they took one more right turn. I sped my steps, silenced my panicked breaths, and willed the blood on my body to stay on my body for a little longer. Where is she? Where the fuck is she? The bald man shouted from somewhere, his voice farther away than the footfalls closing in. The violence in his voice chased up and over my shoulders, as if to grab me and drag me back. It cut down my spine, shrill and sharp as the memory of my mother, and just as terrifying. I sidestepped into the window room and shut the door with as little sound as possible. The vague sense of fur in here briefly registered, but I didn't have time to rescue the wolf pup. I didn't even know where it was. I scrambled for the window, remembering that I'd already unlocked it. Without the use of my left arm, it took for fucking ever to get it open. I shoved and pushed, every single movement drilling more pain into my shoulder, even though I wasn't using it. Finally, a cold blast of air hit my face, a small dash of hope. It brought tears to my eyes. Using one of the chairs at the table to stand on, I poked my head out, listening. Eerily quiet other than the rush of wind. Good enough. I pulled my walking stick through and hit the end into the hard-packed snow outside. So, landing should be fun. I winced at the thought. I wriggled through, first one shoulder and then my injured one. It scraped against the edge, pulling the tear in my flesh even wider. I opened my mouth to scream but swallowed it back. Tears streamed down my face as I forced myself to go farther. Don't pass out. Please don't pass out. A sob choked its way out of my mouth when I finally cleared the edge. I allowed myself a second more of crying because I fucking deserved it. Then I dragged myself the rest of the way through. Gravity helped a little and then I dropped to the snow in a crumpled ball. I'd gotten out. Now came the hard part. If I walked toward the right, parallel to the road I'd come in on, I would eventually get to the forest again. After that? Well, I wouldn't know until I got there. So I hauled myself up with help from my walking stick and kept going. Tree branches tugged at my hair as I passed, so the crimson forest must have butted up against the back of the tavern. I stayed close to the walls of the buildings, though I often had to stray around what sounded like tin barrels and wooden crates after I nudged them with my walking stick. Technically, I wasn't in the crimson forest if I stuck close to the buildings. At least I thought so. The sound of smoky women's laughter filtered from my right, so I guessed I was close to the brothel to Jade. Everything inside me magnetized toward that sound, toward her, but I couldn't go to her now. The idea of leaving her there shredded through flesh and bone worse than any bullet ever could. While I crossed the road that had led into town, I would be all alone in the wide open nothing before I disappeared into the slip joint forest. I had to be quick, if anyone saw me from the edge of town and knew what I'd done, they might give chase. News traveled fast in small towns, so I'd heard. As soon as my walking stick hit open air instead of the side of a building and my feet hit the steep incline leading to the road, I knew I'd just about made it out of old man's den. With nothing to block the wind, it reached down my throat and stole my breath in its frozen fist. It hurt. Everything hurt as I pushed on. It was coming at the forest at a different angle, but once I was across the road and hidden by the cover of trees, there, a voice said from the direction I'd just come. 
No, I said, the word like a squeaky sob. I hurried across the road and then down the small hill on the other side, my boots slipping on the uneven terrain. Footfalls crashed far behind me. I needed to get as far from the town as possible where Archer would be waiting for me. Might be waiting for me. I stumbled but quickly righted myself. I was practically running now, swinging my walking stick in wide arcs so it would find the trees before my face did. But the naked branches still whipped at my cheeks, snagged at my hair. I will split your cunt open and make you bleed, you hear me? The bald man, still far behind but drawing closer. He was going to kill me, no question and he wouldn't stop coming after me until I was very dead. Desperation clawed at my throat. Tears froze to my face, and I lifted my scarf higher to brush them away. Archer, I whispered, and then a little louder. Archer? There wasn't another way out of this, not bargaining since my stupid mouth had gotten me into this mess in the first place. I had a full quiver of arrows, but from the loud crashes of feet behind me, I wouldn't have enough. I had fake poison, which was completely useless, even if some of my pursuers changed into wolves. But I didn't have Archer. Not yet. I just had me. That had to be enough. My feet hit a sharp incline, and I thought it was the hill I'd come in on because of the angle I had been going but I soon realized that this part of the hill had giant boulders carved into it, too big for me to even think about climbing. Shit. I wasted precious seconds and retreated a few steps to find a new path. The sound of my pursuers grew louder with more legs, heavier pants. Wolves. Some of them had shifted. They were maybe 300 yards behind me and closing in fast. I would never be able to outrun them. Just like in the Crimson Forest, I would be ripped apart in the Slip Joint Forest. The icy hands of defeat wrapped around my neck from behind and squeezed. Still, I kept going, shrugging those hands away. A soulful howl ripped through the night. I gasped. It sounded like it was everywhere. Snarling growls sounded from behind me, and then the wolves veered off in another direction. Archer, had that been him? I sped my pace even more. I had to be almost to him by now, even though I hadn't yet found a good place to climb the hill. My stick thumped a tree to my left, just as I stepped forward with my right foot. When I shifted my weight, the ground gave out underneath me. My forward momentum couldn't stop in time, and I was falling, falling into a void. I opened my mouth to scream, but I couldn't get anything out of my frozen lungs. Then my feet hit a sharp decline and skidded, tumbling me backward on my ass. I clawed at the snow, at the rocks, at the roots, anything to slow my progress. But I was falling too fast. The ground bumped hard all through my body, but especially at my shoulder. Then, finally, I stopped. I lay there, stunned. My breaths had been knocked out so many times on the way down that it took a long moment to get my air going again. A murmured voice sounded to my left about a hundred feet away. And then again, even closer. Fucking bitch. The bald man. Oh God, it was him. Falling away from him had just brought me closer. An icy chill swallowed up my body, but I had to move, had to hide so I could get the jump on him before he did on me. I wriggled my legs, my one working arm. Everything hurt, but nothing broken as far as I could tell. A miracle. You make me bleed, I make you bleed. Drop for drop. Snow and roots snapped under his feet. With killing on his mind, he didn't seem to care how much noise he made. Quiet as I could, I pushed to my feet. I no longer had my walking stick, and I didn't have time to search for it. 
but I did still have my bow and arrows. So now it was just me against him, against the forest. My stomach rolled faster than I had down the hill. I would not panic. I wouldn't pass out. I wouldn't. I wasn't dead yet. With my arms out, my numb ears perked, I stepped toward the incline I'd fallen down since I knew for sure that was there. Once I found it, I skirted to the left, away from the bald man. When my fingers brushed against an ice-covered boulder, I rushed around it and pressed my back tightly against it. You hearing me, little girl? Because I want you to know that I'm coming. His loud footsteps carried him closer, and closer still, just on the other side of the boulder. Everything inside me grew in volume, and I felt certain he could hear the rush of my blood storming through my veins, the sounds of my labored breathing. I crushed my lips together and tried to quiet myself, but even that little movement seemed to crack like thunder. If I ran, he'd see me. If I didn't, he'd see me. I plucked an arrow from my quiver. With my injured shoulder, I wouldn't be shooting for a while, so close quarters jabbing would have to do. Would it be enough against his fury? He drew closer, circling around the boulder. I readied the arrow in my fist, my muscles coiling for the attack. I'd stab and run. Aim for the eye, blind him, and level the playing field between us a little. A rustling sounded in the trees, a little deeper in the forest. Is that you, little bird? Are you hiding? He stepped in that direction, but I didn't dare let myself feel an ounce of relief. Not yet, if ever again. The rustling came once more, drawing him toward it like a light. I would only move when I couldn't hear that noise or him, and then I'd go as fast as I could in the opposite direction. As fast as my next heartbeat, vision slid behind my eyes. I gasped at the suddenness of it, at what it meant. Darkness crowded in around my huddled form, but there I was, as petrified as the boulder behind my back. Behind the sour smell of my own fear, I smelled a faint whiff of caramel and wood smoke. Archer? A wave of tears stole my whisper and turned his name into a croak. I couldn't see him, just me out of his eyes. Feet padded closer and then wetness grazed my knuckles. His tongue, I realized. Then he stepped closer and licked my face. I threw my arms around his neck and buried my face in his fur. He was here. He seemed okay. He'd waited however long I'd been gone for me to come back to him. My chest swelled until I thought it might burst, because I hadn't known if I would ever see him again. He leaned his head into mine before he pulled away and took the side of my hand into his mouth. His teeth clamped down slightly and he pulled. Time to go, he was saying. I stood, leaving my hand in his mouth so he could lead me. He went quickly back the way I'd come around the large boulder, his paws much softer on the snow than my clunky boots. I closed my eyes so I could feel where we were going. Seeing through Archer wasn't telling me what I needed to know. Voices sounded far behind us. Not close enough to hear the words, but plenty close enough. Archer pulled harder with a bit more teeth. My heartbeat spiking, I moved as fast as I could go. Finally, my foot knocked against wood, a familiar hollow sound, and I stepped up onto the wooden sleigh. Relief flushed through me, but froze at my knees and locked them up tight. Threaded through the voices came several wolf howls. Archer released me then and sprang to the front of the sleigh. A sense of urgency tightened the air around us and squeezed. I gripped the crossbar and then we were off, faster than we'd come here. The sleigh bounced so high that I looped my one working arm around the bar and ducked down to avoid decapitation by tree branch. If only that had been my only worry. 
feet pounded the snow behind us, even faster than Archer could pull me. Wolves, closing in on our heels. I leaned over the crossbar to put my arrow between my teeth and yank my scarf from around my head without letting go of the sleigh. With only one working arm, I wouldn't be able to hang on and shoot at the same time. But with my scarf, I could tie myself to the sleigh. Not the greatest solution, but it was all I had. Turning to face the back of the sleigh, I worked as fast as I could, looping the scarf around both the bar and the waist of my coat, and tying a tight knot using both hands. My shoulders screamed with the effort, but I had to ignore it. Growls vibrated the air. Claws scraped the back of the sleigh. Heavy, panting breaths sounded from all around us between thunderous footfalls. They were circling us, just as they had me in the crimson forest. I transferred the arrow from my mouth to my hand and jabbed toward the back of the sleigh again and again, a warning not to get too close. They would, of course, but from a different angle. So I stabbed every which way and mixed up the pattern to try to deter them from lunging. Archer took a sharp turn, and one side of the sleigh tilted dangerously. My boots slid across the surface, and I knew for sure I'd fall off. But the sleigh righted itself before I did, crashing back to the snow with bone-jarring force. Before I righted my balance, teeth snapped toward my arrow hand. I jerked it away and then thrust the arrow again. It sank home, and a loud yip echoed through the night. But that seemed to piss the wolves off even more. More scrapes at the back of the sleigh, which I realized slowed us down with the extra weight of their paws, no matter how brief. I kicked my feet out and used the arrow. I couldn't do this for much longer, though. The scarf at my waist was loosening, and if I paused to tie it, those couple seconds would cost me. Archer yipped, which sprang my eyes open. Through him, I saw another wolf bound off to his side with a bloody grin, as though he'd just taken a bite out of Archer. Dread swallowed up my neck with prickling heat. How were we going to get out of these woods alive? Archer sped his pace even more as if he'd just had the same thought. The sleigh bounced even harder so hard that my scarf slipped loose at the exact moment my feet jerked out from underneath me. I started to fall sideways. Terror seized everything inside of me. Images of a violent death by a pack of wolves flashed through my mind, exactly how it had played out the time before, only worse. I flashed my arms out to catch my fall. My arm, my injured one, smashed against the crossbar. I sucked in a breath at the horrible pain. Shadows edged in around my consciousness. But a powerful jaw clamping down on my other arm triggered a new kind of pain that chased those shadows away. I screamed and yanked my arm away on instinct. Flesh ripped, but I freed myself and hauled myself to my feet again, hanging onto the crossbar as tightly as I could. I'd lost my arrow. Good thing I had a dozen more. But when I went to reach for one, the pain in both my arms nearly sagged me to my knees. Archer, I tried to say, but the bouncing sleigh hurtling into the wind drowned me out. Without a weapon, I wouldn't last for much longer on this sleigh. I had feet to kick, but they didn't carry the threat to kill like a sharp arrow had. He barked as if he sensed I was in trouble, or maybe he looked around to me. I didn't know, because I squeezed my eyes shut, too afraid to see through him what else was coming. Nothing good, it turned out. The sleigh felt like it was sailing right off a cliff. My stomach jumped into my throat and choked off my scream. I was free-falling, my body spiraling through the air. I grasped at nothingness, scooping up giant fistfuls of it. Then I landed on a drift of powdery snow. Not hard, which shocked the breath from my lungs, because I expected it to be bone crunching. A snarling growl emitted from several feet back, but not directed at me. A whole symphony of growls met it and peppered my skin with goosebumps. 
archer against the entire wolf pack, I guessed. And I was right in the middle of it. Chapter 12 An icy chill dragged down my back. I scrambled to get my legs underneath me and get away fast. But behind me another growl sounded, low and lethal as paws stalked forward. I was now surrounded by wolves and still unable to get myself freed from the snowdrift with my arms, which had all but given up. Raw panic scraped at my nerves. I snapped my eyes open to see through Archer to find an easy escape. My vision swayed between two wolves, the one behind me and the one with bristled fur along its spine, as it faced off with the other pack. That one was Archer. And behind me, Brady. I hauled myself out of the snowdrift and crawled toward him, a relieved whimper managing to escape me. Archer moved closer to the wolf pack, and the ferocious sounds he was making triggered a full body shiver. He was the distraction, while I crawled my way to safety. Once I got there, to safety in the form of Grady, he and Archer both stood between me and the wolf pack. I pressed my face into Grady's side and breathed in his almond smell behind his coat of fur. The sounds of the other wolves gradually retreated, though not without frustrated rumblings. I guessed we were back at the cabin, right on the edge of the crimson forest, but still in the neutral slipjoint forest. I'd never been so glad for an imaginary line drawn in a forest in my life. I allowed myself a relieved exhale into Grady's fur. It was twice now these two had saved my life from wolves or wolf-related injuries, a fact I would never forget. Ika, strong hands settled on my back, Archer's familiar touch melting through me. Are you all right? I opened my eyes again, finding myself staring out of Grady's. When I didn't answer, he looked back toward me and curled his gray, bushy tail around my shoulders. I don't know, I admitted. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. Archer crouched down next to me and brushed my windblown hair off my face, his breath steaming my numb skin. Did I hurt you driving the sleigh that fast? I honestly didn't know if we were going to make it into slip joint before they got us. Hence the wild ride and crashing. Well, everything hurts at the moment. I said. I got shot. I got bit. The pillow of fur I'd been resting against suddenly shifted. But before I could fall over, Archer scooped me off my feet and carried me in the direction of the cabin. Shot by who? Archer demanded. Tension rolled across his chest so much I could feel it through my coat pressed up against him. His heat, too, and his rock-hard planes. All of him pressed up against me. I hadn't realized just how frozen to the bone I was before he touched me. Next time lead with I got shot, I got bit, Grady said, his voice hard as he limped behind us. I heaved a stuttered sigh. Can we just settle for no next times? We entered the cabin then, and all of its familiar sounds and smells took off the slightest edge of my pain. I didn't think I'd be in this place again for a long time. Ready, get the med kit. Archer settled me on the couch and gently peeled off my coat and the rest of my layers until my top half was completely bared. Maybe I should have felt self-conscious, but I was too tired, too hurt, too relieved and too sticky with blood to care. Besides, both of them had seen me naked before and none of them said a word about it. As Grady came back down the hallway carrying Sasha, my pain combined with seeing through her eyes as he bounced her along, slammed my eyes shut. The rocking, involuntary movement made my stomach roil and I thought I was going to be sick. Archer examined the bullet damage in my shoulder with gently probing fingers. 
It just grazed you. Grady let out a low whistle. Lucky. Who did this to you, Ica? A hint of the growl I'd heard while he faced off with the wolves tinged Archer's voice. I shivered despite the crackling fire. The same man who shot my baba and came in here to steal the package. He told Faust he worked for my baba and was making the delivery for him. Let me guess, Grady said as he opened the med kit. This guy got your money. Yes. Little paws and a wet nose nudged my hand dangling off the couch from where I lay, and I opened my palm to invite Sasha's welcome back licks. I confronted him, I continued, and I may have shot his finger off with an arrow. Grady grunted. Well, that's a sure way to get shot at. He asked me how many fingers he was holding up, so I gave him my goddamned preferred answer. Gentle pressure from soft bandages pushed against both sides of my shoulder, and I hissed through gritted teeth. And that's when he shot you, Archer said, his breath feathering my lips. Yes, so naturally I ran so he wouldn't do it again. Apparently he's made himself a few friends, and they all chased me back into the slipjoint forest to get me. The sound of tape ripping almost drowned out Archer's sigh. Jesus, Ica. Drunk men and guns against a woman who'd just hurt one of their own? Do you have any idea what they would have done to you if they'd caught you? I knew he wasn't asking it because he thought I was stupid. He asked it because he hated to think it, just like I did. The bald man made it clear what he would do to me and what else he would do to me. I couldn't think about what would have happened if I hadn't gotten away. I did. That was all that mattered. Still, though, I knew just how lucky I was. Grady huffed a breath and then began to tape me up. How did you escape? Through the window in the room Faust kept me in for hours and hours. I told him about the fake poison. Made it seem even deadlier and everything and he said his supply was already full until winter was over. Shit, Archer said, releasing his hold from my other shoulder. I'm sorry. What are you going to do with no money? Grady started to pace with his long, limping strides, the floorboards groaning under his muscled weight. Go back to your family and hope for the best this winter? A sense of hopelessness flooded down on top of me so heavy and defeating that it took a moment to draw another breath. That's just it. Most of my family is in Old Man's Den. Brady stopped pacing. I thought you said- I did. I ran into Lee while I was there. He'd come from the direction of the brothel, smelling like alcohol, surrounded by men who were trying to get him drunk. He said- He said Jade was in there too. Didn't you say she was only 15? Archer asked. Yes. The word hissed out as my whole being deflated. I don't know what happened after I left home with the package, but maybe it was the bald man who took them with him. And my baba, I have no idea if he's even alive. My voice seized altogether. Archer brushed his fingertips over mine and squeezed. I squeezed back, thankful for the comfort. It's just a rumor, Grady started, so low I could barely hear him over the crackling fire. But I've heard you can sell people in Old Man's Den. For money. My whole body compressed into a block of ice. What he'd just said cut through my mind with too many sharp edges. What? I'm not saying that's what happened he said, limping back and forth again. But it's possible. What? I said again, more like a whisper. How could someone sell another human being? That was beyond my scope of horrors. Suddenly the air in the cabin was too heavy, too punishing. But I knew if I moved from this couch, I'd drop before I made it outside. Lee and Jade? 
I wanted so badly to go back for them, but I shook my head hard, scattering the tears that had started to fall. I wasn't even sure I'd get back to Slipjoint Forest safely. You did good by running, Archer said, his voice firm. You couldn't have saved them anyway, since you were shot. He was right, but it still didn't change the fact that I'd left them twice now. Jade was tough. She could handle a lot. But being sold like a piece of property? I knew Jade almost better than I knew myself. And underneath that fierce exterior was most definitely a terrified 15-year-old girl who would never, ever let her brother wander free without her to get drunk with a bunch of strangers. She loved him. We all loved each other in that complicated way families do. Which firmed my decision. My stomach made a steady climb up to my throat, but I forced it down with a swallow so I could say my next five terrifying words. I have to go back, Archer groaned. You were just shot and barely made it back here. Fuck no, Grady rumbled. I have no interest in seeing Faust's pack at our doorstep again after they chase you out. Even if you did go, Archer started. They're not going to accept you with open arms or open hands, what with the missing fingers and all. Besides, if they're selling people now. I saw a wolf there, a pup. I could see through its eyes. Silence. Even Grady stopped his pacing. You. What? Archer said. I saw a wolf pup, actually saw through its eyes, and its reflection stared back from the window behind me. Red eyes, similar markings as Sasha, but a little bit bigger. Is it one of your pack? Grady wheezed like I'd just punched him in the stomach. Archer's throat ticked, and I was afraid he might start to gag or be sick. He snatched back his hand from mine as if I'd burned him and stood without a word. In the next seconds, the door burst open and he walked out. Just walked out, without shutting the door behind him against the wind and snow. Grady, is he- Every detail, he demanded, his voice catching slightly as he shut the door behind Archer. Give me every detail about that wolf pup. So I did, about Faust holding it by the scruff of the neck and how I couldn't shoot it. Its markings, its smell, everything. Where do you think they kept the pup? He asked. There at the place you tried to make the delivery? I think there, yes. It didn't take long for Faust to go get the pup. How long? My blood simmered at his rising voice. Less than two minutes, now tell me what's happening. That still doesn't mean the pup was there to begin with. Maybe not, but the tavern I went to is Faust and Gabriel's domain, since it's always where we go to make the delivery for them. Plus, there are several side rooms to keep a wolf in. The floorboards creaked while Grady seemed to consider that. Talk to me, I told him. What did I say to make Archer leave like that? He was quiet for so long. I didn't know if he was going to answer me. Just the drag thump of his pacing, which grew more frenzied by the minute. He was an animal caught in a cage, desperate to find some of his pack, but stuck in here with me where I demanded he explain shit. Exasperated, tired beyond belief, I let my head fall back on the cushion and gave up on him. Ever hear of the game CKR? I sighed. A game? No. I don't have time for games. This isn't one you want to play. It's Faust's favorite game. He cornered some of my pack into it with poisoned arrows aimed at our heads. All of us were in human form except for three pups, since they couldn't shift yet. Three pups. I sat up and waited, a twinge of dread pressing into me at the sound of his voice, so full of loss and pain. It took a moment for him to start speaking again. The pups belonged to our alpha's sister, a respected woman in our pack. She was already dead by then, as were her mates. 
And Thomas? Your alpha? I asked. He was there. Weak. All of us were, from the effects of the poison. Faust explained the rules of CKR and chose Archer to play it. I sucked in a slow breath and shifted uncomfortably on the couch. How do you play? Faust told Archer that the sea was for catch. Archer could choose one of the pups for Faust to throw. If Archer caught it, he got to keep it. My jaw dropped into my lap. I was already so done with this game. Archer chose Sasha to catch because she was the runt, and at the time, he didn't know the rules for the rest of the game. He caught her easily enough. I took a slow breath. And the K? Grady swallowed loudly. Archer had to choose a pup to kill. My stomach twisted. Oh God, I whispered. And did he? A loaded silence, and then, yes. Nausea bubbled up into my throat. Archer's shaking hands, his haunted silences while he seemed to be hundreds of miles away. It made sense now. How could he ever come back whole from that? Three pups, the very last of their pack, and he'd been forced to kill one. The pup was a male. Brennan, we called it. Archer refused to kill him at first. So Faust shot Thomas with poisoned arrows. Over and over again, until he did. Oh no. I could hardly hear myself over my cracking heart. R, the last part of the game, means release. Faust told Archer to release the third pup into the Crimson Forest and leave it there. CKR, catch, kill, release. All those choices Archer had had to make, impossible choices of which pup lived and died and was left out in the snow to die. The weight of those decisions crashed down around me, and I couldn't even stand it, even though I hadn't lived it. How were these two men still upright, still functioning after such an ordeal? Especially Archer, who was so sweet and protective and funny and smart. How could he possibly be so resilient? I buried my face in my hand, the other one wrapped around Sasha, and allowed myself to crumble for Archer, for Grady, for Thomas, and for the three wolf pups who hadn't deserved such a cruel game. If I had known this while sitting across the table from Faust, I would have put an arrow through him. How could someone be that monstrous? The wolf you saw in old man's den. It could be little Ronan, Grady rasped. It could be that when Faust ordered us to leave after the release of Ronan, he picked her up for himself. Why? I whispered through my fingers. The man's a psychopath. He doesn't have a heart, so he must have taken her to find the ruby caves once she's old enough. Female shifters in our pack inherently know where the ruby caves are. His pack isn't from anywhere around here originally, so my guess is his pack had trouble reproducing and heard about the ruby caves somehow. Shifters can only conceive in the ruby caves, I said, repeating what Archer had told me. Right. After we left the game, we holed up for a night. And the next morning, Thomas was gone. Left, not dead. Archer would disagree. I didn't have the heart to point out that maybe Thomas had left in order to die, since he'd been shot again and again with poison arrows. Besides, according to what they'd told me, quite a bit of time had passed since then, about a year and a half. Any number of things could have happened between then and now. I swiped at my cheeks. I'm sorry. It sounded ridiculously hollow and didn't convey at all what I truly felt, but that was all I could choke out. Not another declaration for us to go rescue everyone we loved from old man's den. Nothing. I just couldn't find the words now. Neither could Grady, it seemed. He hobbled towards Sasha, toward one of the last babies of his pack 
scooped her up without a word, and hugged her to his chest as he walked her back to her room. The kind of love these two men felt for her. Well, in some small way, it made her the luckiest wolf pup in the world. Chapter 13 I came into consciousness ever so slowly, one aching body part at a time. Warmth enclosed me from all directions, the furry blanket, the blazing fire, and the column of hard muscle I tucked myself against on the couch. Archer, sound asleep from his heavy breaths. I couldn't remember him coming back in last night, but I was glad he'd parked himself next to me. He'd wrapped his arm around me and held me tightly to him while we'd both slept, and I felt so safe next to him. I wished we could sleep like this more often. My hand was splayed across his bare chest, the steady thrum of a heartbeat beneath my palm. I traced it lightly and pretended I could move the pieces of his broken heart back together. No wonder he'd left last night after I'd brought up Ronan. After thinking he'd killed not one but two wolves while playing Faust's fucked up game, I couldn't begin to understand the shock, the guilt. I didn't know how he was feeling, but I wanted to let him know he could talk to me. My fingertips roamed his perfect dips and peaks. I wondered if he felt like this all over, if he would mind if I found out. I stretched a little higher and kissed a sharp collarbone. Archer's breathing grew ragged like I was stirring him awake. My own breaths grew heavier as I kissed my way across his collarbone. If he woke up soon and saw me like this, what would he do? Take me right here, even though Grady was surely lurking nearby? The front door blasted open then, bringing the sharp cold with it. I jerked back and yanked the blanket higher around me while the air cleared the strong opiate tea haze from my brain and all my naughty thoughts about Archer. You're awake, a cheerful voice said. I froze as a pair of wolf eyes swept from Archer standing by the door to me and Grady. I'd been kissing on Grady who now sat upright and scrubbed his hands down his face. How long had he been awake? I surged to my feet, my whole body flushing hot, and then I stumbled, still tipsy from Grady's opiate tea he'd made me. How had I made that mistake? They were two different men, two different scents I should have immediately recognized. But I guessed my lips didn't care. Archer, you came back, I blurted, thinking I should say something, anything, before Grady could. Yeah, Sasha and I were outside playing, and I crossed toward them and threw my one good arm around him and the pup both. As soon as I did, the embarrassment faded some, and all I felt was the two of them wrapped up tightly against me. Archer pressed me in close, careful of my shoulder his big arms able to hold Sasha and me both. If he'd seen me with Grady, he didn't say a word. I'm so sorry, I whispered into Archer's coat. Grady told you. He didn't sound mad, not that he would, just his usual good-natured self, which made me wonder yet again at his strength. Yes. It took me a long while to be able to work up the courage to say anything more than that just yet. So I kept standing there holding them. Making Archer relive this again and again by talking about it weighed heavily on my shoulders. But of course we needed to. If we were going to go get the other wolf pup, then we were running out of time before winter. Grady brought it up first, though. It could be Ronan Archer. It could be that Faust took her with him so he could use her to find the ruby caves. Archer dropped a kiss on the top of my head and stepped out of my arms. Even if that's the case, he said, his voice low. What do you propose we do about it? They know our faces. They know our scents. 
If we step foot in old man's den, that's as good a declaration of war as any. A quick one that won't do anyone any good, least of all Sasha and Ronan. I stepped back toward the couch, my legs slightly wobbly and dropped onto it. I also need to go back to old man's den to get Jade and Lee. I have a funny feeling the town won't accept me either, but... Unless someone locked it again, the window to the tavern where I saw Ronan would be a great way to slip inside. Well, Grady started. If we make a big enough distraction, that's away from where we need to go. I snapped my fingers. A fire. A big one. It would draw the men out of the brothel and the tavern, and that's when we would sneak in. We could cover our scents with star anise, since it smells really strong, and wear some kind of disguise. And then what? Archer said, incredulous. Where do we go so Faust and Gabriel won't find us? Where does Ica go so the bald guy won't find her? You're right. I blinked toward the door and mentally kicked myself since I hadn't even thought of that. He could come back here any second. Probably was already on his way. If he'd been smart and gone back to town for someone to sew up his missing finger first, that is. Archer plopped down next to me with Sasha, nearly squishing me between him and Grady. Sasha blinked up at me, and I crushed my eyes closed at the frightening sight. Not to mention we also have winter to worry about, Archer said. What if you go south? I took Archer's hand and squeezed. With me. We could probably make it to Margin's Row before winter hit. Doesn't that bald guy know you live there? Grady asked. Yeah, but Margin's Row is farther away than here. If he's stupid enough to come get me just for revenge in winter, he's not going to last long anyway. Ika, Archer said softly. Even if we do this, what about Hellbreath? The pit of my stomach dropped out because I didn't know. She could barely stand, let alone travel. I'd felt okay leaving her with Archer and Grady, but if all of us left, then what? I know someone who might take her, Grady said. He knows a lot about horses. So, give her away to someone. I swallowed hard. Losing her would cut me deep. But if it meant she could be taken care of, then I had to do it. After winter, I could get her back. If, well. I'd leave it at that, if. Sasha wormed her way into my lap and I held her with my good arm so she and I could see the two shifters. Grady sighed as he pushed to his feet. If we're going to do this, then we can't sit here with winter only two days away. We need to pack this place up. We need to have a foolproof plan. We need to be ready for what comes next. War, Archer said simply. If we take back Ronin, there will be war. Maybe not right away with Winter, but Faust and his pack will come for us. I nodded. And the bald man will come for me. The man who took over my Baba's poison business. Maybe now or maybe after Winter, but he'll come for me. Of that, I was sure. The viciousness behind what he said he would do to me wasn't the kind of thing that would just go away. I'd be ready, though. I'd have to be. Twice the war then. Archer bent with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands and his black hair curtaining him off. Honestly, I'm not sure about those odds. Do we even have a chance? Do we have a choice? Grady asked him, his tone as soft as I imagined it could ever get. Archer didn't immediately answer, and I didn't blame him for his hesitation. He had already lost so much. They both had. Doing this could mean risking more than they should. Archer released a long breath. Ronin belongs with her pack. Grady slapped his hands on his thighs loud enough to make me jump. That she does. You two are finally agreeing on something? I asked in mock awe. Archer sat up and looked first at Sasha and then at me with a glint of hope in his eyes that kindled deep inside my heart. First time for everything, I guess. 
I grinned and he grinned right back. Perfect reflections of our broken souls on the path to healing. We spent the next several hours planning and packing our few belongings. What about the books? I asked Archer as he crossed back and forth through the kitchen. Those aren't ours. They were here when we got here. You mean someone just left them? I stared at them through Sasha's eyes as I stood before them, incredulous that someone could abandon so many. Well, books don't travel well to the afterlife. Oh, the person before died. He was older, I think, maybe senile, and wandered right into the crimson forest. I brushed my hand over them, feeling the worn spines and the letters etched into them. My favorite as a kid had been thick and green with golden lettering on the cover. I couldn't remember what it was called or anything else about it, really, or even who'd read it to me, since that was long before Jade. But I remembered I loved it and felt a rush of excitement when I hugged it to my chest. Maybe it was here. Ika. Archer said from almost right next to me. I'd been so lost in the idea of books that I hadn't even heard him come closer, and Sasha was too busy lazily batting at a red ribbon dangling from a book to notice. Can you read? I tried for a smile and shook my head. I started to learn before I went blind. I'd study my brother's old school papers to teach myself, but afterward... My baba said it cost way too much money to learn to read by feel. And the librarian margin didn't have anything to help. He was watching me closely, the firelight next to the bookshelf playing across his dark eyes. I could teach you. You can learn by feel? Well, no. But I could learn and then teach you. My jaw dropped. You would... My chest warmed at the very idea that he'd do something like that. Basically learn a whole new language. Just for me. Especially when most people I'd ever known wouldn't bother. But when? He chuckled. Probably not today. A laugh bubbled up from inside me, making everything hurt again. But I didn't care. You would do that? He brushed my fingers with his, triggering a thrill straight up my arm. That night, the one when you heard a noise outside and you came out here to investigate, when you found the books, you smiled so big, bigger than I'd ever seen on you before. And when you first got here and I read you stories, I think you forgot you were hurt for a while. Either that or I couldn't get enough of the reader's deep voice. I snapped my mouth shut. Oh, for fuck's sake, why had I admitted that out loud? I'd blame it on the extra cup of opiate tea he'd given me for the pain in my shoulder. He chuckled low and then touched my chin. You like the sound of my voice? I liked everything about him but I just nodded and chomped down on my tongue in case more truths came out that I wasn't quite ready to reveal. Well, I could read to you and teach you. He grazed his fingertip upward and traced the curve of my lower lip. I felt the feather light touch throughout my entire body in fiery shocks that made me shiver. I would love that, I admitted. Yeah. He slid his finger along the seam of my lips and stepped closer. The air between us grew heavy, making it harder to breathe. My heartbeat kicked up at his nearness. His lips touched mine briefly, and then again, harder. I tore away from his kiss, lost in the sensation of wanting him, of him wanting me. The door opened and we flew away from each other while I yanked my shirt back down and panted embarrassingly loud. Did I interrupt something? Grady asked. Yes, Archer growled. No, I said at the same time, but it was pretty obvious he had. Well, you might be interested that I did talk to the guy about Hellbreath. 
He's willing to take her off our hands later today. Thank you, Grady. The words came out breathy and insincere when really I felt grateful. Damn hormones. He grunted as he lowered himself to the couch. Now since I'm not interrupting anything, have a seat here and describe everything you can about old man's den so I can draw up a map. Archer will just have to carry on without you by himself. I could hear the giant grin in his voice. I need a lock with a key you don't have, you fucking shit for brains. Archer snapped and then stomped into the kitchen. They're called bedrooms, man. Or just fuck in front of me, I don't care. Grady patted the cushion next to him loudly. Get it out of your systems before we go get Ronin, so you can focus. Sighing, I tried to describe old man's den. But Archer had gotten me so riled up I could hardly think straight. I knew I had to get this right so they'd know where they were going. Besides, we only had one shot at this. If there were any mistakes, it could mean our lives. Eventually, though, he had a drawn map of the town. Let me go get Sasha so you can check it. He palmed my thigh before he got up to go down the hall. I frowned after him. Why had he done that? He'd never touched me before, except while sleeping here on the couch, where I'd cuddled up to him in an opium tea haze thinking he was Archer. Did he even know I'd done that? I placed my hand where his had been. Even though I'd thought he was Archer that morning, I remembered how he felt tucked against me, achingly soft with hard muscle forming perfectly to my body. And the way he'd protected me after I'd crashed off the sleigh, the way he'd saved me from the crimson forest. Hell, what was wrong with me? Wolf shifter females had more than one mate, but I was not a wolf shifter. Being around them didn't change that. I was attracted to Archer, and that was it. But when Grady handed me a wriggling Sasha, our fingers brushed. My heartbeat stalled at the rush of energy between our flesh, at the idea of him. The wolf shifters and I had a connection that was hard to deny, and not just physical either. They'd accepted me for who I am, saved me countless times, and trusted me enough to help carry out this plan. Are you going to make Sasha stare at me, or are you going to look at the map? Grady asked. She and I were both staring. His chiseled jawline, his sharp cheekbones, his bulging shoulder pressed against my good one, his deep, unwavering gaze with eyes the color of gunmetal. Focus, Ika, he said. I turned Sasha toward the paper he held out and kissed the top of her head so she'd go limp in my arms. There were words written on the page, but the basic drawing of old man's den's one street was accurate. I don't know what you've written there, I said, pointing vaguely. I was in a hurry. That's not what I meant. You can't read? I shook my head. Might as well make that common knowledge. Archer said he'd learn to read by feel. Braille, I think it's called. And teach it to me? Did he now? That's awfully big of him. But when is he going to find time to do that? We agreed we'd go south, not move in with you, unless I fell asleep at the important bits. No one said anything about moving in with me, I snapped. Archer strode down the hallway toward us. In less than two days' time, winter will be here. Wherever we happen to be where there's shelter, that's where we'll have to stay. And, Grady said, Ika has her own family. We have ours. The separation shredded me apart with the brutal reminder. We were not the same. We never would be the same. And to Grady, at least, that mattered a lot. I was already different. But I didn't want to be so different that I couldn't continue to know them after tomorrow. Especially Archer. After this, Grady continued. She'll go home with her family and we'll keep looking for ours when we can. We'll find ours in Old Man's Den tomorrow, Archer said, with Ronan. 
Thomas is gone. When will you get that through your thick head? I'm sorry I couldn't hear you over your sexual frustration, Grady shot back. We find Ronan tomorrow. We find Thomas eventually. Eventually, Archer scoffed, and I could almost hear the sound of his eyes rolling around his head in annoyance. But if you stayed for a while, stayed in Margin's Row, you could stay with us. I looked to Archer more than Grady, though I knew they would never separate. So you survive the winter, Grady's voice went hard like an accusation. Well, yes. I never did get the money for food, so steal it, he said. While we're burning buildings down in old man's den, kidnapping and starting a war, it seems like the perfect time for some thievery. Take money, take food for winter. Well, he had a point there. Might as well go all in with the crimes while we were there. Jade and Lee could help me. You're quite an influence, you know that? I said, unable to help myself. I do, yeah. Grady slammed his hand down on the map in front of my feet, so loud even Sasha jumped. So is the rest of it right or not? For fuck's sake, can you not be so loud for once in your life? I shouted. I have to be so Archie will listen to my infinite wisdom, he said. Archer shook his head. Sorry, what? Stop talking so I can concentrate, I snapped. Swear to God, you two bickering make me want to fling myself back into the crimson forest. Quiet, Grady, Archer said. Me? Fuck you, he bit out. Gritting my teeth, I angled Sasha down so I could see the map. Whatever was making them act like idiots, stress over tomorrow, the cramped quarters, the coming winter made me want to stick their mouths shut with frozen molasses. I focused on the buildings and their locations rather than the words I couldn't read this time. The window into Faust's tavern? I pointed. That's it, Grady said. The abandoned jailhouse? Yep. The times I'd been to Old Man's Den, I'd paid attention to what the locals were saying. The jail had been abandoned. The law enforcement run off or killed. Looks good, it's all there. Even the brothel where I'd find Jade, and hopefully Lee. Then I suggest we leave here as soon as possible, Archer said. There's a rickety old cabin up north a few miles we can stay in tonight, in case the bald guy comes back. While they packed up the sleigh, I said my goodbyes to Hellbreath. I felt like I owed her an explanation of why I was handing her over to a total stranger, and she listened while I cried. With one last parting kiss, I left her, my heart splintering with every step I took away from her. When the man came to pick her up, he also brought a sleigh of sorts that dragged behind four other horses. He said he only lived about two miles away, and he seemed nice enough but I couldn't squeeze out any questions for him through the lump in my throat. We left shortly after, and our new cabin couldn't compare with the old. It was barely four walls leaning against a roof, but it did have a fireplace. We cooked over it, and I requested the smallest dose of opiate tea possible so my brain would stay sharp for tomorrow. Afterward, I curled my body around Sasha's next to the fire, but my mind wouldn't shut off. It kept replaying details of our plan for tomorrow as if my subconscious would forget. Not likely. I'd committed everything to memory like I suspected Archer and Grady had. Tomorrow was far too important to make even the smallest mistake. Sasha, on the other hand, went right to sleep, her little furry body warm and comforting. I pressed my lips between her ears one of my very favorite places in all existence, and matched my breaths to hers. The hairs along my arms prickled with the sensation that I was being watched over the crackling fire by two different sets of eyes, watching me with Sasha. I'd grown too attached to her, and to Archer, too. Yes, we weren't the same, 
But that didn't matter when it came to caring for something. The heart loved who it loved, and there wasn't much anyone could do about it. Ika, Archer said, his voice soft and sleepy. Yeah? A pause, then. How were you poisoned? I firmed my mouth to keep anything from escaping. Those memories stirred up countless others, all of which hollowed out my chest and made me ache for another life, one where I wasn't me. Useless. So useless and broken. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. I'd never told anyone. Not even Jade. Though I bet she suspected. She didn't miss much. But what did I have to lose by explaining what happened? They'd told me how they were poisoned. Talking about that and their packmates seemed to help them, I don't know, face what happened. Reconcile it with the other horrors in this world. Remember the sharp ache so it might not sting so much next time they thought about it. My baba, I started trying to figure out how to put this into words when it still didn't make any sense. He wasn't the one who invented the poison. It was my ama. She was gifted in herbs and had supposedly helped her baba make moonshine before coming here with her best friend, Lee and Jade's mom, from the Far East. But she didn't know how much of her poisonous concoction was deadly, or how much it took to significantly slow someone down. I opened my mouth to explain the next part, but decided to backtrack first. Both directions filled me with dread the spiky, hot kind that swallowed up my neck. Ama wasn't a nice person. She yelled and screamed when something wasn't done right, even the smallest thing. She'd whip my brother and sister. She shouted at my baba and called him all sorts of things. And me, well, I just got in her way and asked too many questions. So she decided to shut me up. A slow, shaky breath sounded over the crackling fire, loud enough that it seemed Archer had been holding it for a while. Silence from Grady, not even a snore. She, my voice wobbled because I could see her in my memory, stalking toward me with a glass container. She was shouting at five-year-old me, telling me how useless I was. She poured the poison down my throat. Not too long after, I started losing my sight. How old were you? Grady asked, almost in a whisper. Five? A low hiss from him, a string of impressive curses from Archer. I barely heard them, though. It was as if someone else were telling this story, as if it hadn't happened to me, but to someone else. Even so, I couldn't stop. The fastener on my lips had come undone. After that, I continued, Amma knew exactly how much could slow someone down. She began selling her poison on the black market, secretive with no one the wiser except for my family. The money she made went to help make more. Not to help you, Archer said, his voice edged with glass. I went silent for a second, contemplating that fact for the first time ever. But not too much, or I'd drive myself insane. No one had even brought up helping me, and I didn't even know if that was an option, then or now. No, I took a shaky breath, and then another to flush that thought away. My parents fought all the time. But one time I heard Baba crying. In the 19 years I've been alive, I've only heard him cry twice. That day and the day he got shot. I was maybe around 10 when this happened, and I went to see if he was all right. He was in the barn, sobbing. And when I got there, Ama lost it. She started hitting him hard. I didn't know what was happening except Baba was... My voice cracked was crying. 
I had to help him get her off him, so I went for the tools I knew were hanging on the wall. I found the shovel and scooted it across the hay toward him. And after... I don't really remember. Just silence. No more crying. No more screaming. No more... Amma. Did he find out what she did to you? Archer rasped like it hurt him to ask. I don't know. He didn't say a word. Hardly said a word to me for the next nine years. After that, he continued selling on the black market. I bet that's where Faust found him, Grady said. I nodded, suddenly exhausted now that the weight I'd been carrying had centered itself inside me in order to be poured out. But I still felt it within me, raw and painful, as though my insides were now outside and it didn't change anything. Not really. Ika, Archer said, and I felt him slide closer and curl his fingers around my foot. I'm sorry. I shook my head, too tired and emotionally spent to tell him he had no reason to be. He laid his head next to my foot with his hand still curled around it. I settled into sleep, nuzzling my face deeper into Sasha's fur. The sound of the crackling fire faded as I drifted, but not so much that I didn't hear Grady shift on my right. Something light brushed against the top of my thumb pressed to Sasha's fur. His fingers, I realized. And then Grady's voice came only inches away. I'm sorry, too. His hand folded around Sasha, his fingertips still grazing my thumb and shooting an unexpected hum through my blood and a sudden burst of warmth around my heart. I fell asleep, touched in every possible way by wolves. Chapter 14 We would take turns in slip-joint forest with Sasha while we each did our parts. This was what terrified me the most. Not the fire that Archer and Grady would start. Not entering the brothel by myself to search for Jade and Lee. Not even Ronan's rescue. Just Sasha all alone with me. If something happened to her... I would never forgive myself, not after everything she and her guardians had been through. Just the idea made me feel sick and shaky. While Archer and Grady prepared to leave the next morning, I could barely lace up my boots. We couldn't fail tonight. There was too much at risk. My fingers trembled as I tried to tie my scarf around my eyes, and I had trouble bending them since they were already numb with cold. Grady had long since put our fire out. When I'd protested, he'd said, You're going to be cold all day anyway. What's a little longer? Besides, it'll put hair on your chest. I hadn't thought that was amusing, especially coming from a wolf shifter. The scarf over my eyes was necessary since traveling here with three wolves I could see through, but had no control over who I was seeing through, had made my stomach do somersaults. From outside, the sounds of Archer playing with Sasha couldn't even make a smile crack through all my worries. He was trying to get her to growl, but she just gave gentle yips. Adorable, but we could really use more growling. Grady came in then, sounding as if he were smashing through the entire rickety cabin. You're still not ready? You're going to put a muffle on yourself tonight? I countered. Do you know how to sneak? Never needed to. Here. He whipped my scarf out from between my fingers. Since you're moving at the speed of ice. Hmm, I wonder why. Maybe it's because someone put out the fire. He grunted, his usual response when he knew I was right. He pressed the scarf to my eyes and looped it around my head. Watch the hair, I warned. I'd already managed to put it up first thing so it would stay out of my face. Yeah, yeah. His breath feathered across my nose, a light caress so at odds to the yanking and pulling behind me. Are you scared? I blurted. No. Are you? 
What if something happens to Sasha? He pulled away, the scarf now in place. If we stick to the plan, nothing will happen to Sasha, or Ronan, or Archer, or you. You forgot to add yourself. I don't need to. I know my part. I do too. Then play it. Stop worrying about the what ifs and start worrying about the aftermath. Because there will be one. There was an edge to his voice at that last part. One that scraped over my flesh and trailed goosebumps behind. Then all of us need to stay together to face it, I said. I go with you and you go with me. We're connected now. We both had something taken from us. Now we're going to take it back, and I mean all of it. Your land in the Crimson Forest, my family and our means of survival, not just what we take back tonight. His gaze penetrated deep, searching every corner of my face despite my blindfold. The air flickered between us and the size and strength of him flooded my awareness. You really mean that, don't you? He said. Of course I do. Something shifted. Not like an actual movement, but something that echoed like one. Like a decision made with finality. In the space between heartbeats, he closed the distance between us and put his hand on my neck. Not squeezing. Just an unexpected pressure. What are you- He slid it lower until he found my pulse, a rhythm that had gone haywire. Then something soft brushed my lips, softer than I could have ever expected from Grady. His mouth, I realized. A kiss. I'll help you. His words brushed against all my senses, all their jagged, coarse edges scratching an itch I didn't even know I had. Help me. I wanted to ask it as a question. Help me how? But I was too breathless too overcome with curiosity that it sounded like an invitation. And Grady took it as one. He captured my lips in another kiss, this one as hard and rough as the rest of him. His hand left my throat and wound around my waist, burning me even closer to him. The muscled expanse underneath his cold coat pressed closer and consumed the chill, leaving only his fiery heat My healed shoulder hit the flimsy wall and something started to unspool deep inside of me. Something I didn't have a name for. A knot of control. Or maybe inhibitions. And Grady held the thread. Then, with one last shudder racking my spine, he pulled away, taking his hand with him, and left the cabin without a word. I existed in stunned silence for a long moment. Um, what? That was strange. Exciting, but strange. He'd said that was what he did to take the edge off his nerves. To himself. Well, he'd said he wasn't nervous, so... The thought of him doing that stirred my blood faster. I followed after him on rubbery legs. Outside, the cold air slipped in through my coat and scarves, bit at my nose and cheeks, but I barely noticed. I still felt Grady's touch lighting my whole being on fire. Archer stepped up next to me and took my arm. Ready? I nodded, listening to Grady's steps on the snow just ahead and wondering what he was doing, what he was thinking right now. Had he liked touching me like that? Had I? Yes. I answered myself immediately. Yes. What would Archer say if he knew? One female sharing several males was how they did things, but I wasn't a wolf. I wasn't one of them. Shit, now I was thinking about this instead of what was to come like I should have been. So much for getting rid of my worries. But my body did feel looser, my chest slightly more unlocked so I could draw easier breaths. I did a number of changes on the sleigh for you, Archer said, leading me toward it. It's got a leather harness to keep you and Sasha secured to it. And if it flips, will Sasha be okay? I asked as I stepped up onto the sleigh, trying to keep my voice even. 
My knee knocked against the stack of our supplies, wooden crates full of food, clothes, and other items. Sasha will be fine, but she won't like being contained in the back part of the sleigh. I basically made that part into a wolf pup-sized box with a secure lid. It's big enough for her and Ronan, and I lined the inside with blankets so they don't bounce around too much. I smiled in his direction. Sounds like you thought of everything. I doubt that, he replied. We've wasted enough time, it's almost nightfall, Grady said, his voice rough and mean again, when minutes before it had been almost soft and touched with desire. He came up behind me and wrapped a leather harness around my waist, tugging forcefully until it was secure. Then he tied it to the crossbar in front of me, the leather creaking in the cold. He acted like our kiss. The magic he'd done with his fingers was nothing. Was it? He'd just left afterward, and I really wasn't sure how to feel about that. Now he stepped away without a word, without a lingering touch. I had no time to waste on this or him right now. Too much was at stake. Okay, I think we have everything. Archer came around to my side, his feet crunching the snow. Remember, the way there was nothing last time. We're a little farther north of Old Man's Den than our old cabin, but it won't take us too much longer to get there. I nodded. It was running for our lives out of there that gave us the most trouble. I had a funny feeling we'd be doing more of that tonight. Archer stepped up onto the sleigh with me, cupped my face in his large hands, and kissed me deeply. So different than Grady, but not any less talented. Archer kissed missing pieces back into my soul, while Grady burned my soul to cinders. He pulled away, his rough breaths steaming my face. See you on the other side of Slipjoint Forest. Paws hit the ground once he and Grady shifted and soon they were pulling the sleigh. We were off at about the same pace as last time, even with two wolves, since we had more weight. Grady didn't appear to be limping in his wolf state, but over the racket we made, I couldn't be sure. The air tasted wetter, heavier, like the sky could barely contain the whiteout it would unleash on everyone in just a few hours when winter was officially here. If there was ever a time I hoped winter didn't come any earlier, it was right now. Our success tonight to start a raging fire depended wholly on if winter held off, like it was supposed to. I had no reason to doubt that it would come when it always came, but my luck lately had been epically shitty. My ears burned for any sounds of distress from Sasha behind me in her box and I was certain Archer and Grady were, too. But she stayed quiet, hopefully enjoying an innocent adventure. Me? Not so much. I was shivering cold by the time we stopped. The two sets of paws in front of me quickly turned into two pairs of feet and strode toward the back of the sleigh. How Sasha? I asked, keeping my voice low in case we weren't where I thought we were. A slight clatter behind me, and then Archer's chuckle sounded. She's pissed. Hey, girl, are you finally growling? Sure enough, a light buzzing noise came. Hardly a growl, but ridiculously cute. Well, Grady started, taking supplies from our stack behind me. I'm not sure you're going to scare anyone off with that, but it's a start. It's fantastic, I said with a laugh. I worked at the knot of the leather harness on the crossbar to free myself. An almost impossible task with gloves and numb fingers. Don't let anyone tell you different, Sasha. Don't listen to the human, Grady muttered. The human. Because what could a lowly human possibly know about anything? A splinter formed at the base of my heart. Star Anise infused the cold air as Grady and Archer rubbed the crushed herb all over themselves to mask their wolf scent. It was even more powerful than peppermint, and I wrinkled my nose. 
While they did that, I took Sasha out of the back of the sleigh and sat down on it with her in my lap for warmth, for comfort. Then I undid my blindfold. Through Sasha's eyes, I found that we were in roughly the same place Archer had stopped the last time we were here, right behind a large hill. Archer knelt down next to me and smoothed his hand over the back of my head, and then Sasha's. Tension stiffened his broad shoulders and pinched the corners of his eyes and mouth. Steam puffed between his lips as he looked between the two of us, his midnight hair feathering the strong cut of his jaw. You know the plan, he said. Grady will be back once we start the fire, and then it's your turn while I get Ronan. I nodded. Be careful. You too, he said, his voice tight. Wish I had my walking stick, Grady rumbled. I heaved a frustrated breath. If only we were in a forest full of sticks to choose from. He fixed me with those gunmetal eyes of his, his irritation flaring deep. None of them are mine. The one you lost was perfect. Archer threw up his hands while he cut Grady to pieces with the force of his glare. Yeah, let's do this instead of what we came here to goddamn do, asshole. No matter what he did, I couldn't get a consistent read on Grady. How could he go from fiery hot to frigid so quickly? What is your problem? I demanded. Without a word, Grady turned and limped up the hill. Ignore him. I do. Shaking his head, Archer turned to me. See you soon. Take care of Sasha for us. He followed up the hill, leaving me alone in the middle of a forest with their wolf pup as the last autumn night began to fall. What could go wrong? I watched them through Sasha until they crested the hill, and then I waited in the quiet. There wasn't any wind, which made it easier to hear any sounds in the forest, but it might not help too much with building a boiling fire. It was as if the air was saving its fury for tomorrow's winter. I pressed a constant stream of kisses to Sasha's head to keep her from wriggling, and she just sat there and took my loving, though I could tell she was getting restless. They'll be back soon, I whispered into her fur. Sitting here made me shiver farther into my coat until my teeth clicked together, so I got up and paced a tight line in front of the sleigh. Sasha seemed fascinated with the tops of the trees, so I closed my eyes to her constant head tilting. Not that I blamed her. There was nothing else to do while we waited. Soon, or not, I really had no idea. I smelled smoke. Anxiety squeezed my chest around my thrumming heartbeat. The size of the fire they'd talked about making was dangerous. But that size was needed for all of this to work. Still, what if something happened to them? The smell grew thicker. Somewhere deeper in town, a bell rang like an alarm. I waited, turning Sasha about every two of my steps to see toward the top of the hill. Still nothing. Sasha whimpered and I bundled her into my coat, with her face peering out the top so we could share body heat. But she just whimpered again as though she could sense something was wrong. It's okay, sweet girl. They'll be back soon. I started counting the seconds, keeping time with my steps and looked toward the hill. The smoke smell grew thicker, stronger. When my number counting became ridiculously large, I couldn't stand it anymore. Grady should have been back long before now. Something had happened. I'd have to go in there myself, with Sasha because there was no way I'd leave her out here by herself. Shit, I hissed through chattering teeth. Shit, shit, shit. Working as fast as I could, I found the crushed star anise on the top of our supplies and rubbed it all over the both of us, then bundled her wiggly butt to me using the leather harness on the sleigh. Even though I could really use her eyes to help me find Jade and Lee, I couldn't risk anyone seeing her. So I buttoned my coat up to my neck, so not even the tips of her ears showed through. The buttons pulled around the both of us, 
allowing plenty of frigid air for her to breathe and me to freeze, unless I got moving. Sasha, I said, grabbing up my bow, arrows, and a perfectly good walking stick from the forest floor. We need to find your pack. But to do that, I need you so quiet, okay? Not even a peep. She nestled closer to my breasts where my heart pounded out of control and remained silent. Good girl. I started up the hill towards a very literal wolf's den. Chapter 15 I went as fast as I could, digging my heels into the snow as I climbed. The cold air burned my lungs, and when I reached the hill's peak, so did the smoke coming off of old man's den. Once I reached the bottom of the hill, several shouts reached my ears that sounded like frantic calls for help. I sped my pace as I crossed the road into town, hoping the fire hadn't gone out of hand yet. If the brothel evacuated everyone, it would be impossible to find Jade in the chaos. As I neared it, tapping the snow with my walking stick, I could hear the fire up ahead devouring the old jail, feel the heat like a physical wall. My walking stick hit some steps and I climbed my way into what I was sure was the brothel. It was as if I'd stepped into a different world, one where there wasn't a fire just up the street. Someone played piano from the far corner, an aggressively upbeat song with too many notes for me to handle right now. I stepped away from it and toward the sound of a heavy bottle tinkling something into a glass that smelled like it had only slightly fewer fumes than moonshine. Three women were gathered around the bottle and talking quietly, their voices whispery but distinct. It smelled like peonies in here. Peonies and sweat and liquor. I found the bar and then sank onto a bar stool near the women, so it appeared it looked like I knew what I was doing with myself here. Then I cleared my throat loudly to interrupt their conversation. Who do I need to talk to if I have a question about one of the girls who works here? I asked. Hey, I recognize you, one of the women said. And I recognized that voice. It was the same smoky-voiced woman who'd told me I was walking on the wrong side of the road. You're the one who shot off Lager's finger, she said, a smile in her tone. The other women laughed. Lager, the bald man. I filed that name away. It was well-deserved, I'm sure, the woman said. The man's a twat but I'm not so sure it's good that you're here. He's out for blood. Then answer my question and I'll leave. The silence stretched and I could feel the women studying me, hear the swish and sigh of their dresses. They were probably beautiful, the dresses and the women. Well, I guess it depends on which girl you're looking for, the smoky lady said. Jade and her brother Lee. Jade has black hair, 15, and Lee has a disability. Really sweet, both of them. I think they were... sold. My voice gave out and it took some effort to push out the rest. Sold to work here. We don't do that kind of selling here, she said. I remember this Jade and her brother, though. Lager tried to push them off on me, but I don't buy my girls and guys. My employees come to me of their own free will. But you've seen them. Where are they? Gone. My heart splintered. Gone where? Lager took them to Faust. And another of his men took them somewhere where there would be more buyers. I couldn't tell you where. My stomach hit rock bottom and then plummeted through that too. They weren't here. They could be anywhere, but with winter coming tomorrow, they wouldn't have gone far. When did they leave? I asked, the words shaky. Two days ago. Two days? Two days from here? But I had no time left to find them. They were here, though. I fisted my hands on top of the bar, the smooth wood at odds with my cracked hope. 
They're kids and you didn't try to help them? The two other women scoffed as if I'd just said the dumbest thing ever. One of them picked up the bottle off the bar and splashed more alcohol into her glass before setting the bottle down again, in front of the smoky woman. I don't interfere with Lager or Faust or any of those men's business, just like I don't let them interfere with mine. We're all trying to survive, aren't we? It wasn't a question her tone as cold and harsh as outside. I'm damn tired of trying to survive, I said, tears prickling my eyes. She gave a heavy sigh. Aren't we all? What was I supposed to do now? I couldn't just pretend Jade and Lee weren't slaves and go on about my life such as it was. But it looked like I would have to with winter coming. The thought churned in my gut and I thought I might be sick. I could offer you a job here, you know, the woman said and put her hand on my knee. I jerked back, both from her and the idea. I'm not a whore. It's good money, especially for you with your long, silky hair and your exotic face and your, she clicked her tongue, disability. The men would pay well for you. Hell, the women would too. What else would a girl like you do? I'm not for sale. At one time, I'd half considered it, but now I would rather fling myself into the roughest, most arctic weather than be a whore, no matter how much it paid. Doing nothing but lying there for sex seemed like a lateral move into only surviving. I was through with only surviving. Well, maybe you'll see the light and change your mind. She laughed at my expense. I fucking did not join her. And maybe you won't. Well, maybe the fire will burn this place down. I swiped up the bottle next to her and stood. And maybe it won't. I walked out of there with my chin held high like I damn well deserved to leave here with a free, almost full bottle of booze. She hadn't taken anything from me. Nothing that I hadn't already lost, anyway. But anyone who felt the need to tease the fact that I was blind and who'd implied I couldn't do anything else deserved to be brought down a notch. She didn't try to stop me, either. Might have had to do with the bow and arrow slung over my shoulder and that I'd shot Logger's finger off. Just a guess. On my way out, my walking stick hit a chair and when I shoved it out of my way, my fingers grazed fur. A long, luxurious coat, I realized. Yeah, that was now mine too. Outside, I shrugged into the coat and wrapped it around my old one. The fire down the street raged, growling like a murderous beast as it licked up into the sky. I could hear it there, looming over the shouts below it. The smoke siphoned into my lungs and stuck there like stinging barbs. Had Archer found Ronan yet? Why hadn't Grady come back like he was supposed to so I could hand off Sasha to him before heading into town myself to find Jade and Lee? That had been our plan. Maybe they were at the rendezvous point out of their minds with worry that Sasha and I weren't there. I started in that direction, leaving the fiery heat for the frigid temperature of slip-joint forest. Sasha wriggled, and I knew she had to be uncomfortable from being cooped up for so long. Just a little longer, I whispered, speeding my pace. I hoped. But when I crested the hill and peered through Sasha's eyes that no one was there at the bottom by our sleigh, panic clawed up my throat. Why was no one where they were supposed to be, damn it? Archer? Grady? I hissed, just in case they were hidden in the shadows. If they were here, they would have seen me. Something terrible had happened. I just knew it, or they would have been back by now. But if they were headed here now, I knew what they would want me to do. Stay here. But if they needed help... I had to go back. Sasha, I whispered. Just a bit longer, okay? I'm sorry, girl. I'm so sorry. 
I pushed her little head back down into my two coats and buttoned them both, my eyes stinging, my heart clamped tight in a vice. Pushing my lips together so I wouldn't cry, I set the bottle of booze on the sleigh, gathered what little courage I had left, and went back down the hill toward town. I hated doing this. I hated putting Sasha in danger yet again. But something must have really been wrong if they hadn't come back yet. Skirting away from the main road where the fire was, I aimed my walking stick toward the first building on my right. A butcher. From the smell of pig's blood and the chime of empty hooks clinking against the outside. I swept around the side of it and then to the back to follow the line of buildings toward Faust's tavern. I might just have to climb in through the window with Sasha, unless I found another way in. I imagined it was empty for the most part, since it sounded like many men were battling the fire. Logger, too, I shivered. I hoped with everything inside me that tonight wasn't our reunion. Once I hit the edge of buildings on the far side of town, I quickly doubled back before I could be seen. I'd been a tad panicked and bleeding on my way out of here last time, so it took me a minute to find the window again. Open. This had to be how Archer had come in to get Ronin since that had been our plan. No sounds came from inside. I patted the lump in my coat. I need to borrow your eyes again, sweet girl. Just for a second. That was a terrible idea. If someone happened by the little room and saw a wolf pup peering in the window, I had to risk it. I leaned my walking stick against the wall and dropped my quiver and bow to the ground. Then I unbuttoned my coats and hefted her up and then instantly back down again. Fast enough for me to see the room was empty, the door open. Okay, we're going in. I untied the harness's knots from around me but not from around her and gently sat her in the snow. Not a peep from you when we do, understand? She seemed to get it, since I was likely feeding every ounce of my urgency into her. She could smell trouble probably better than I could. And right now, it smothered us in smoky fumes. After lifting her again, I looped one hand around one of the long leather straps connected to her, then lifted her toward the window and lowered her down inside. The effort strained my ribs and shoulder and all my other annoying aches, but I ignored them. When she landed inside, her gaze locked on the open door, and her little nose twitched so much I could see it in her periphery. Could she smell Ronin and Archer? After dropping my bow and quiver through next, I pulled myself into the window head first, many of my healing wounds stretching and grinding and ripping. Honestly, I was done with windows after this. No more. I landed in a haphazard pile next to Sasha, who still stared at the door. She hardly noticed as I stuffed her back inside my coats with her head poking out so I could use her eyes. Here, in this place again, I needed all the help I could get. If I saw or heard someone I didn't want to, I'd button her back up again. Before we left the room, I closed my eyes so I could listen better. Nothing but eerie silence. What if Archer wasn't even here? Or what if I found him but couldn't find Grady? This whole plan was garbage. Something was definitely wrong if they weren't at our rendezvous, which was why I had to make sure. We left the windowed room and entered the hallway. I knew my way to the front door, but beyond that, I didn't have a clue. So, this should go well. My heartbeat stormed louder into Sasha's body with every step I took. The tavern looked exactly like I thought it would, with long crossbeams of sanded wood lining the walls and a sawdust floor. Flames danced shadows over the walls from inside glass lanterns hung on the walls every few feet. We came to an intersection, and to the left was the front exit not the one I'd originally entered through, and the right led toward a mystery. And the sound of something heavy crashing to the floor. Not sure I wanted to head toward that, either. Toward the left, the door opened. Shit, I couldn't be seen. I skirted right, using Sasha to guide me around the corner and into the large tavern area. 
all empty. Swift footsteps thudded toward me. I sped between the chairs and tables with cards and half-filled glasses strewn about them. None of them were tipped over like the sound I'd heard. Ahead, a set of stairs climbed up to the second level. A long bar stretched along the side wall with mirrored shelves, sporting all kinds of liquor. The footsteps headed right toward me. I needed to hide, so I made a split decision. I aimed for the stairs since they were closer and made a sharp right turn out of sight a few steps up. As soon as I made the turn, I realized I'd made the wrong fucking decision. The footsteps followed. I made mine as light as possible, imagining myself filled with nothing but air and feathers, and then darted across the hall to the first open doorway. It was dark inside and empty. The footsteps thudded past and entered another room. For fuck's sake, that was too close. I counted to five and then poked my head into the hall. It was either go past the room he was in or go back downstairs. I drifted out into the hallway again to go down when the footsteps rushed out into the hallway too. My heart lurched into my throat. I dove back into the dark room I'd just come from but not before I saw the wall lanterns reflect across the back of a bald head. Not before I saw a hand wrapped in gauze that had turned red. It was him. It was Lager. I slapped my hand across my mouth to contain my breaths as I sank back into the dark room. Goosebumps dashed down my back as my whole body turned to icy stone. Where? He shouted. I just about leaped out of my skin. He was looking for something, just like me. Another voice answered him from far away, but on this floor somewhere. Feminine, I thought. Lager thudded back down the hallway toward this room. Shit, no time to grab an arrow and kill the bastard. Just time enough to duck down behind a desk. The only thing in here. The thing he was probably coming in here to search. Shit. I should have killed him when I had the chance in the hallway, but I hadn't expected to see him. I'd panicked. His footsteps stopped in the doorway and a lantern on the wall grew brighter. I stopped breathing and screwed my eyes closed so my other senses would kick in. He crossed toward the desk and my ears homed in on which side he was angling toward. The right. I went left. Still crouched, I matched his speed, my hands seeking the wooden desk my feet silent even to my own ears. When he stepped behind the desk, I was already pressed against the front of it, smelling a faint waft of his too sweet honey smell. He opened a drawer, fished around in it and slammed it closed. I jumped at the sound and cursed myself. Then he crossed back to the door and I circled behind the desk so he couldn't see me. Before he made it to the door, I already had an arrow knocked. When I started to pull the string of my bow back, the bullet wound in my shoulder ripped itself open. Slowly. Pain rioted along every nerve. Colors spotted the backs of my eyelids with bursts of agony. I lowered the bow, realizing he'd already gone. I'd missed my chance. If I wanted out of here, I'd have to ignore the pain, damn it. A wolf's howl erupted through the entire tavern. Loud and pained, a replica of what I wanted to scream. Sasha squirmed violently and I dropped into a crouch again to get her to calm down. Had that been Archer or Grady? But no, they wouldn't be that dumb to announce their presence, their exact location like that in this town. Unless something was very, very wrong. And it would only get so much worse if the other pack had heard them over the raging fire outside. We had to get out of here, right now. While I made my way to the doorway, I pressed half a dozen kisses to Sasha's head to help calm her, none of which worked. Slowly, I poked both our heads into the hallway to see which way Lager went. If we ran into each other again, I would put an arrow through his eye. My shoulder beat damned. He wouldn't hesitate to do the same. I kept my arrow knocked yet loose as we went right my eyes open, even though Sasha bounced her gaze every which way down the hallway. Vertigo turned my stomach on its side, but I tried to ignore it. The hallway turned left ahead, 
past the room Lager had first gone in. The light was still on inside, so I pressed my back to the wall outside of it and listened for any sounds. My heart tripping at the back of my throat, I turned and used Sasha to see inside, quick as a flash. A worn couch, another desk, and not much else. I tiptoed toward the bend in the hallway and stopped again. Loud voices came from below on the first floor, a whole flurry of them, and somewhere on this floor I thought I heard a woman shouting. After two quick, steadying breaths, I whirled to face Sasha around to the next hallway. Empty, except for more doors all the way down, all open and some lit. The sound of the woman grew louder. The sounds of the voices below drew closer. My bow and arrow shook in my hands as I strode forward, my pulse crashing wildly between my ears. Sasha and I checked all the rooms before we passed them, and I closed the doors as we did, oh so gently. That way I'd hear them opening. Whoever's voices I'd heard down below now stomped up the stairs as a herd. I was about to have company. A lot of it. The shouting woman's voice came from the last room at the end of the hallway. I'll drop it down as soon as I'm done, she yelled, and then softer, she said. Thanks, Lager. I stiffened against the wall next to the room, clenching my bow and arrow in my hand so tightly I was afraid it would snap. Heavy footsteps sounded within the room. More steps came down one of the hallways. Any second they'd turn the next one and see me. Now or never. Quiet as I could, I raised my bow and rounded into the room. Sasha's gaze landed on several things right after the other. Lager was stepping through another doorway off the side of the room, his back turned. The woman faced the open window on the far wall, her arms moving frantically with something she held, her long red hair swaying down her back and tucked into the far corner sat a wire cage with a wolf inside it. Grady. I knew from his almond smell, even in wolf form, and from my vision shifting back and forth between him and Sasha. My heart stalled at the sight of him. He was hurt, lying on his side while blood gushed from a wound in his back leg. His red glare widened when he saw us. Sasha wriggled fiercely underneath my two coats. The outer one I now saw was red with lush white fur trim. The world spun crazily while my vision dashed between the two wolves, so I focused with all of my might on just seeing through Sasha. It mostly worked. I can't get it open, the woman yelled out the window. A pop like something had uncorked came from in front of her and the smell blasted into me. A smell like moonshine. Poison. Oh, never mind, I got it. I snapped into action, silencing my questions, my fears. The door Lager disappeared through was shutting, and I spun to shut the door behind me at the same time. Then, after a fruitless pat to Sasha's head to calm her, I silently jammed my arrow below the door to jam it shut. On silent feet, I crossed the room, lodged another arrow underneath Lager's door, and knocked another. With my lungs screaming for a breath I didn't dare allow, I tiptoed up behind the woman. My shoulder protested loudly as I drew the string backward, but I gritted my teeth and pressed the arrow to the back of the woman's head. Tell me where the wolf pup is, I demanded, my voice low and tinged with dark warning. She stiffened. Fuck you. Do you know what will happen if I shoot you with my arrow? I dug the tip into the back of her skull. Right here? You'll drop completely defenseless, but you won't die right away. You'll bleed out slowly and feel every last drop of it. I had no idea if that was true or not, but even I believed it. Because of the smell of the poison, the deadly chill in my voice, Combined, those things strangled my hold on reality for a split second and transported me back in time. I sounded just like my Amma, and I'd always believed her threats. Always. 
The knob of the door Logger had disappeared through jiggled and he pounded against the wood. Hey! A tremor shook through the woman's shoulders. I'll scream. My husband's right outside this window. I tipped her head forward with the force of my arrow, leaned in close so she could feel my threat on her skin. See how that works out for you. She shivered again, a long, violent one that slid to the tips of her fiery hair. It's not here. The pup. One of my husband's men took it to another town in the Crimson Forest. Out of the corner of Sasha's eyes, Grady jerked like the news had physically hurt him more than his wound. Lager pounded on the door harder. Louisa! Which town? I demanded. I, I don't know. Why did they go there? To look for the ruby caves. In winter. Yes, for spring. Spring is mating season. If we can't find the caves, then we go another year without pups of our own. Don't you see? No, I don't. I turned Sasha slightly to look at the door Lager was now flinging himself against. What's in the door to the left of us? The bathroom? I pivoted, putting my body between the bathroom door, Sasha, and the woman, my arrow now aimed at the side of her face. She was pretty, maybe in her late twenties. To the cage you go. Gunshots boomed from the bathroom in quick succession, Logger shooting himself out. Wh what The woman, Louisa, asked. Now. I hissed and scratched the arrow tip across her cheek. Scarlet welled and she whimpered as she crossed toward the cage. Grady rose slowly to his feet, his red eyes zeroed in on every movement the woman made. Open it and get inside, I ordered. She unlatched it, her hands shaking. Grady loped out, limping heavily like he did in human form. And as soon as he was clear of the door, he shifted back fully clothed bloodied and sporting fresh bruises all over his face. He looked like he could hardly stand. But then he swung around, snatched the poison jar out of her hands, and shoved her into the cage. She shifted into a snowy white wolf immediately, like the cage itself forced the change. As soon as the door clanged shut on her, she snarled and lunged, her fangs and claws reaching for us. The cage held, though. It's you, Logger shouted. I spun around and he was glaring with murderous intensity out of a hole he'd shot from the door. The power of his hatred wrapped around my spine and shook it. Grady handed me the poison like it was about to explode all over him, which I corked and pocketed. We need to, Archer, now. Panting, he pointed toward another closed door opposite the bathroom and then leaned heavily against me like the effort had done him in. Get back here, you little bitch! Logger shouted, his hand wriggling through the hole in the door. I'll kill you! I'll kill you, you fucking cunt! Is Archer in trouble? I held to Grady to prop him up and practically dragged him across the room toward a door on the right wall. Grady leaned harder against me. Yes, he ground out. Faust caught him first while we set the fire, so I came after him. Logger's continued fury needled into my back, and I knew he'd carry out every single promise he was making. But he was still trapped for now, hopefully with no more bullets to shoot his way out. And we had to get to Archer. Panic sealed up my chest. Is Archer in there? I asked, though it sounded more like begging. No, he said between pants, but maps of the Crimson Forest are. I wasn't sure why we needed a map, but I saved my breath and didn't ask. I was losing steam anyway from having to support Grady's weight. The next room was empty except a chair piled high with stinky blankets and a large map on the wall. I shut the door behind me and we crossed over so Grady could tear the map off the wall. It has writing on it, he explained through labored breaths. Drawings, but I'm not sure what they mean. I nodded as we started toward the hallway door, but what sounded like the bathroom door in the first room 
crashed open with a deafening bang. Go, Grady whispered. We dashed into the hall as fast as possible, which wasn't fast at all. We shut the door behind us as Lager barreled into the room we'd just left. Grady shoved me diagonally across the hallway toward another room. Heavy footsteps thudded toward us from the other hallway, just seconds from turning into this one. Faust. Barely a whisper from Grady. He snicked the door shut seconds before Lager burst from the opposite room and Faust turned the corner. They're here, Lager cried. That blind bitch and the Crimson Forest Pack locked one of your wives up in the cage. Where? Faust snapped, his voice so loud it cracked against the door. I shriveled in on myself, wishing I could disappear. Grady tightened his grip around me and leaned in, his lips on my ear. I'll cause a distraction. When it's clear, take Sasha and run. I shook my head hard. He was already hurt. If they caught him, who knew what they would do? What else they would do? Here, Lager answered. They were just here. For once in your life, don't argue with me, Grady whispered, his breath feathering my cheek. Shit, Faust growled. No one went past me. Find them, I already have one downstairs. He already had one. Archer. Dread sank to the bottom of my gut. He was probably coming up here to get the poison since his wife had never dropped it down. It would be stupid to assume it was the only batch he still had. Grady shoved me toward the door. When the coast is clear, get to Archer before Faust does. Hurry. Faust strode past our door toward the end of the hallway where his wife was. Lager pushed into another room, the one next to us from what it sounded like. I had seconds, if that, to make a break and run. I hurled myself out of the room on tiptoe and ran as fast as I could down the hallway. Moments later, glass shattered from the room I'd just been in. The window? But Grady was still in there. Had Faust or Lager thrown him out? Unless, had he thrown himself out the window as a distraction? Panic stormed through my veins and crashed between my ears. How the hell were we going to get out of Old Man's Den in one piece? Footsteps came hard toward the direction of the window, just as I rounded the first corner into the final stretch toward the stairs. Faust said he had Archer down there, but where? I pounded down the first set of stairs and then the second. I crossed the tavern area at top speed, accidentally knocking into a few chairs and scraping them across the ground. Too loud. I was being way too loud. Feet pounded toward me down the stairs. Someone was following me when they should have been investigating the broken window. Shit. A quick glance threw Sasha behind us just before I turned the corner revealed Lager. My stomach dove sideways. I passed a lantern hanging on the wall and then quickly doubled back. Lager had never shifted when he'd chased me out of town and through the forest. Maybe like me, he was human. If that was the case, he needed to see. But I didn't. I'd lived most of my life in darkness and did pretty well. Time to see how he did. If I was wrong, I wasn't wrong. I unhooked the lantern and moved as fast as my legs would carry me toward the next one, taking as many as I could carry. Careful not to clank them together, I set them down in one of the rooms and closed the door. Darkness crowded into Sasha's eyes, but as a wolf, she could see through it. I closed my eyes so I could hear through it. As I stood with my back pressed up against a wall, my ears burned as they dissected each individual sound. What happened to the lights? I can't see a goddamned thing! Lager shouted. He was close, almost right to me. With my bow and arrow still in one hand, I buttoned my coat over Sasha's eyes in case they gave off a preternatural glow in the dark. Another pair of footsteps thudded from the direction of the stairs. Faust, maybe. If I could somehow get behind him, he would lead me right to Archer, and then I could put an arrow through him before he did any harm to my wolf. Keep looking, Faust ordered. Fast, confident steps plowed down the hallway perpendicular to mine. 
Unsure, stumbling ones stepped down this one. I slipped closer to Lager and bit down hard on my lip until I tasted blood. I wanted him dead. I wanted him to suffer. But I wanted to find Archer more, and Faust was leading me directly to him. So I snuck past Lager while he cursed and stomped around blindly. I'd deal with him later, face to face, with plenty of light and a whole lot of time. When my hand curled around the corner of the wall, I swept left toward Faust. I could still hear his steps, the faint splash of another jar of poison hitting the glass sides. I unbuttoned my coat and then readied my bow and arrow, Sasha's vision focusing just as he neared the front door. It swung open then, bringing with it a shimmery blast of heat and smoke from outside. And two men, one of them badly injured and leaning heavily on the other. You said you had something for this guy? The upright one asked. Faust tossed the jar of poison up in the air and the uninjured guy caught it. Give him the whole bottle, Faust said, slapping him on the back, and then he slipped out into the fiery night. I stopped and took in the two men, who stared right back at the woman with a wolf in her coats and aiming an arrow right at them. The uninjured guy I didn't know. The other. Oh, God. My whole being shattered just looking at my wolf shifter's face. Archer, covered in blood and both eyes almost completely swollen shut. The man with the poison frowned. What? Behind him, the door swung open and a cannonball barreled into him. He went sprawling to the floor in a tangle of limbs with Grady on his back all the way down. Grady just as bloodied as Archer. The poison bottle flew from the man's hands and smashed to the ground. Some of it must have splashed up because the man flinched away from it and screamed. Grady cut him off, though, already rolling him onto his back, his fists flying at the man's face. Archer, without anyone to prop him up, teetered wildly on his feet. I dodged to his side and Sasha whimpered as we drew closer and the smell of blood on him thickened the air with copper. What happened? I asked him, my hand splayed across his chest. His heart beat a crazy rhythm into my palm. Ronan, he rasped. Where's Ronan? It was as if the name had grown strings and puppeted Grady off the man. His fists were bloody and the man on the ground didn't move. Grady stared at Archer his face ashy behind the blood and bruises, and a look of pure torture creased his features. And then I knew why. Archer didn't know Ronan wasn't here, had already been taken into the Crimson Forest, and telling him might destroy him all over again. Found the lanterns, but no bitch. Footsteps sounded behind us. Logger. Grady and I didn't hesitate. He took Archer's other side and we helped drag each other out of the tavern. Smoke and fire choked the air, making breathing almost impossible. The flames had spread to the two buildings neighboring the jail, and the jail itself was completely engulfed. People scrambled about to refill buckets and others stood in assembly lines passing up buckets to slosh on the fire. It didn't look like it was doing any good. We darted as fast as we could away from the chaos toward the right, along the side of the tavern. We averted our faces, but the smoke billowed so thickly, I didn't see how anyone would recognize us anyway. When we reached the rear of the tavern, Archer stumbled out of my grip and crossed into Grady's path. Ronan, tell me! He had to shout to be heard over the roaring fire, and the effort made his shoulders heave, made his legs almost give out. I went to reach for him, but he held up his hand for me to stay. The orange glow in the night cast a horrifying light on the blood all over him. He didn't look like Archer anymore, but something much more dangerous. Tell me, he shouted, his voice agonized. Grady shook his head. We need to get out of- Tell me where Ronan is! His voice cracked and I felt myself splinter in half. Grady hung his head, 
the muscles of his jaw working like he was struggling to find the words. She's not here. One of Faust's guys took her to another town in the Crimson Forest to search for the ruby caves. Archer staggered backward as if Grady had just hit him. Then he sliced his bruised eyes toward me, and what I saw in them through Sasha hollowed me out with an excruciatingly dull edge. There wasn't an accusation there, just defeat, brutal and raw and devastating. I'm so sorry, I tried to say, but my sobs swallowed everything up. No, no, you're wrong. She's in there. He broke toward the tavern again, but Grady lunged in front of him with his forearm pressed to Archer's chest. She's not in there, Grady shouted into his face. We would have found her. You know this, Archer, because you and I tore the tavern up looking for her. She's not there. No, Archer shook his head his eyes going glassy like he couldn't focus on any one thing. No. He backed away several feet from Grady and then stopped. His whole body crumpled as he fell to his knees. A yell ripped from his throat, so full of pain that the sound punctured my heart with a hundred thorns. Sasha joined in with a little howl. And then it began to snow. Chapter 16 Grady patched Archer up the best he could as fast as he could, but he refused when I offered to look at his leg. No time, he told me. He was right. The snow was already coming down in big, wet flakes, and we still had to get to Margin's Row before the whiteout hit. But with Grady hurt and Archer totally out of commission while he lay on the sleigh, and not being able to cut through the crimson forest to get there. The trek was slow. So slow, I feared we wouldn't make it home in time. I sat on the sleigh next to Archer with his hand gripped in mine. Tears tracked down his face, and he kept his eyes squeezed shut, whether in pain or sorrow or both. I didn't blame him at all for not wanting to look at this cruel world at all right now. Sasha lay tucked in his side with her nose on his shoulder, never once tearing her gaze off of him, even though she had to be tired. Every once in a while, Archer would squeeze my hand, which made my throat pull tighter. I almost wished he were mad at me for telling him where Ronan was, for getting his hopes up. Then maybe I could have put this consuming guilt I felt toward that. Instead, it was eating me up slowly. My heavy heart pinched my lungs, making it hard to breathe and harder still with the plunging temperature. I shivered farther into my two coats. The faint scent of smoke still touched the air, even after we'd been going for some time. It must have seeped into our clothes, too, because it was all I smelled, like we were made of fire. After taking my blindfold off, I saw what Grady saw from in front of our sleigh. Huge, fluffy white flakes and tree branches already laden with them. A flat expanse of forest instead of rolling hills. I imagined we were getting closer to Margin's Row. I hadn't been able to ask Lee about Baba. If Lager took both Lee and Jade to sell them, what would he have done with Baba? The second gunshot I'd heard the day I'd left echoed in my mind. Sharp and terrifying. I didn't know whose gun it had been. Didn't know if Baba was still alive or not. Didn't know where Jade and Lee were, and all this not knowing was slowly killing me. To hide from all these worries, I started to tie my scarf back around my eyes, but stopped. Gradually, as if blossoming from a dream, warped, but familiar shapes appeared in the distance through Grady's eyes. Eight of them. Eight similar cabins in a row and a small barn in front of the easternmost one. We came upon them from the rear out of slipjoint forest, and the closer we drew, the more broken the shapes became. Scorched black piles of rubble. Only the stone chimneys remained, 
pointing like accusatory fingers at the early morning sky. Margin's row was no more. My home was gone, burned to the ground. No. The sound slipped out of me, a mix between a gasp and a moan. Sasha raised her head and my vision switched to hers, seeing me and my face stark as the rising snow, the hollowness in my eyes. My hands were outstretched, reaching toward everything that was lost. Aika, Archer swallowed roughly. Who did this? Grady glanced back and I saw myself through him, saw the tears clinging to my lashes and freezing there. He stopped the sleigh, ducked underneath the harness he pulled it with, and limped heavily to my side. I stood and stepped off the sleigh, my limbs frozen and seeming unattached to my body. Grady, it wasn't like this when you came here, was it? The words left me in a rush and jumbled over themselves and then I sucked in a loud breath in anticipation of the answer I already knew. He shook his furry head, his vision of me bouncing back and forth. Oh, God. I screwed my eyes shut and pointed at my cabin. My baba was shot there. Outside. Please. It made no sense what I was asking. If baba was still there, he was most definitely dead. But Grady limped off anyway, seeming to understand my need to know for sure. Who did this? Archer rasped. Was it the bald man? Maybe. Maybe Lager had come back after he'd tried to sell Jade and Lee to destroy the rest of my Baba's business. Or to loot it first and then destroy it so that if I ever came back, I wouldn't be able to compete with him. Grady loped back then and shook his head. My Baba wasn't here. But he'd been shot, so where had he gone? Did Lager take him too? Crushing defeat swept down upon me, and I stumbled to my hands and knees in the snow. I had nothing. Everything I had was taken away from me. My home, my horse, my means to survive, my family. Gone. I screamed the sound a relentless cleaving through the silence, and slammed my hands against the powdery snow. I screamed again and again. That sense of loss, the emptiness where all these things had been pressed in under my ribs and wrapped around my heart. And then, it erupted in flame. Still, I screamed until my throat felt ravaged until I started to choke on my own rage searing through my veins. I would get it all back. All of it. And I would get the Crimson Forest back to my wolves, too, even if I had to burn everything down around it. When I finally stopped, Sasha was whimpering inconsolably. Archer's hand was clasped so tightly in mine that it almost hurt and Grady had wrapped his tail around my shoulders. My wolves. Our war. But to win, we couldn't stay here so I could mourn. After all, I still had the poison Grady had lifted from Faust's wife in my pocket, the weight of it a savage assurance, and Grady had a map of the Crimson Forest with writing all over it. I hauled myself to my feet just as a distant howl sounded from the direction of Margin. Grady immediately shifted into his human form and turned to Archer, Sasha, and me, his shoulders heaving under his coat and his gray eyes rounded. That was Thomas. Their alpha. Maybe everything hadn't been lost. This has been... Winter's Edge, The Crimson Winter Reverse Harem, Book One. Written by Lindsay R. Laux. Narrated by Lori West. Copyright 2019 by Lindsay R. Laux. Production copyright by Lindsay R. Laux.